scheme and the compensation for those with over 10 convictions. OK, we're just going to go very quickly through what everybody's role is. Mr Cheshire? Um, I'm Mark Cheshire. I'm a partner at Adelshaw Goddard. Uh, with a firm, uh, I'm the leader of the team, advising uh, DBT in relation to the GLO compensation scheme. Thank you, Mr Francis. Uh, good morning, I'm Rob Francis from the law firm Dintons. Uh, we've been appointed to be the claims facilitators for the GLO scheme. Thank you. And Sir Ross? Yes, I'm Ross Cranston. I'm the independent reviewer, which essentially means I'm the long stop, as it were, the final arbiter. arbiter. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, in GLO claims, I should say. Mr Cresswell, can you just tell us who in the department is actually making the final decision about GLO claims? It depends upon the nature of the claim, but I head a steering group that oversees the, the claims in the round. In particular, I, with my finance and legal colleagues, look at advice from, from Abishaw Goddard on the complex claims. I don't sign off myself those 75k upfront offer claims that we discussed at the, at the previous committee when I gave evidence. So this, this is a draft offer letter. Uh, it's very long, it's pretty complicated, um, and it basically provides um, two claimants like a, like a box. That's it, that's the summary of their claims. Who signs off the bottom line in these claims? So the actual number you mean at the bottom of the yeah. claim? That is me and my colleagues within the department on the basis of advice, and that is the initial offer that is then sent out by Adishaw Goddard to the claimant's lawyers. And what do you do to satisfy yourself that those claims are fair? So ahead of the claim coming to me, the claimant's lawyers has obviously sought lots of advice if they need it from accountants, medical experts and so on. The post office has also provided a lot of background documents to ensure that the claimant's lawyer is in the best place to make as full a claim as possible. So before the claim comes to me, it has gone through that process and a process of Adelshaw Goddard discussing the claim with that lawyer to ensure that there aren't any gaps. So it comes to me when it is a, a full claim that has been assessed by our external lawyers. I then look at it with advice from my own internal DPT lawyers and finance team and take a view. How long does it take you to sign off one of these claims? Often in the day. Often within a day. It, but how many, how many hours do you have to spend on each claim just checking it's all in good order? Uh, it, it depends upon the complexity, but the standard claim could take me about an hour based upon a conversation with with my colleagues who give me full advice. It depends whether I need to sit down with them and discuss it or whether it's so straightforward that I can just respond by return. There's a balance here, I think, between uh, speed, which we all want to achieve, and scrutiny. And I also put a lot of weight on the advice that we get from Adelshaw Goddard rather than trying to second-guess it with our own lawyers. Of the claims that have been put on your desk then to sign off and send to sub-postmasters, how many have you sent back because they just looked wrong? Um, we have raised questions to Adshaw Goddard on, on probably five or six, I think, myself. Um, I think my team, before they come to me, have probably raised more questions along the way. But you're the SRO. Weekly. You just told us you're the SRO. That's right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But I'm answering for myself yeah. rather than for my whole team. So you've only queried about 10% of the claims that have been signed off on the GLO scheme. I think that's accurate. And one of the reasons for that is that we have a process that includes appeals and an iterative process based upon the design of the scheme which we put together having consulted with the JFSA and Freeths and other claimant lawyers. So the aim is to get prompt offers out to the claimants and then we have the safeguards for claimants to challenge if they are unhappy with the offers that go out so, to them. So hand on heart, speaking personally, you can say that every single one of those that has been sent, in your opinion, is fair. I think that everyone that has gone out is that based upon... That wasn't the question. No, no, that wasn't the question. The question was, in your view, every one of these that you've signed off, have you felt that it was fair? Yes, based upon the legal principles that underpin the scheme. I think that individual postmasters have different expectations about what is fair for them. So it is unfair for me to project my own view about fairness onto an individual postmaster. It is also true that different postmasters have different expectations, as claimants to any compensation scheme would do, about what is a fair outcome for them. We have purposefully designed this in order to give the claimant an opportunity to raise concerns with their lawyers to, if they think that what has come to them it is an unfair but you'll, offer. But you'll know that there is no standard tariff that helps anybody really understand the case law, for example, in calculating distress and inconvenience, for example. So how are you making these fairness decisions yourself? 
So when there's no standard tariff and the case law is all over the place? Well, quite a, quite a lot of the principles for the GLO scheme and indeed for the Horizon Shortfall scheme are underpinned by legal precedent mm. and specific cases. But there's a wide variation, for example, in the amount of compensation that should be due for loss of reputation, for example. Yes, but it's classic within a compensation scheme to have a range of tariffs and principles. So how do you decide which end of the range is fair? So I rely very heavily upon the legal advice that we commission and pay for from Adelshaw Goddard. But you've only challenged 10%. Yes, yes. I, I think the, the counter, if I were to come here and say I challenge 100% of them and I spend hours and hours on each claim, would be that the pace would be much slower than it is. And since I last came to the committee, we've seen a doubling in the number of offers that we have made and a significant increase in the number of claims that we've got in. So of that 478 people within the GLO scheme registered, we have received 106 full claims now. This is the latest data for my team and it's been published. And we've made 104 offers, of which 80 have been accepted. Let's go back over those numbers. Charlotte Nichols. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Crosswell, can you provide an update on how many claims have been submitted? Of course, yes. So we published data at the end of January, and at that point it was 58 full claims had been received, 52 offers had issued, 41 had been accepted, and 28 had been paid. That is what we set out in the memorandum that we sent to your committee prior to today. As of the end of last week, my team gave me the data last night, we have received 106 full claims, we have made 104 offers, and 80 of those have been accepted, and 78 of those have been paid. That changes day to day and is moving quite rapidly. In addition to the 106 full claims, Adelshaw Goddard have received 41 partial claims. So we've got 147 of that 478 are in the system. Say that again, please, Mr. Crosswell. The last part. Yeah. So I was mentioning that we've had 106 full claims that we have received. Yeah. In addition to that, there were 41 partial claims that have been submitted to Adelshaw Goddard. And the definition of a partial claim is where the lawyers look at it and think there are gaps in the evidence that prevent us being able to, to make a, a full and fair offer at this point. So what they will classically do is issue a request for information back to the lawyers representing the claimant to say, do you have this document? And if the answer is no, then they aim to apply the benefit of the doubt. Please continue. Thank you. Mr Cresswell, how many people have taken up the upfront £75,000 offer? So over 70 have taken that up. The government predicted that around one third of GLO claimants would take the upfront £75,000 offer based on take up so far. Was that prediction accurate? To me, it still seems um, on, on the mark. We have had applications uh, that number 95 for the 75K, so 95 out of the 478. I would expect over time more to take the 75, but perhaps not many more. Um, if, if you ask me which side of of it will it be, I would say it's probably going to be below a third, but not, not by much. So it has been a really significant intervention that has allowed us to get money out to claimants much more quickly than we would have done without it. So has the ability to make upfront offers allowed the department to transfer processing resources to other more complex cases that require a full assessment, in your view? Absolutely. However, we are dependent upon the claims being submitted to us. And this is also true of the overturned convictions scheme that is being run by the post office, where people will say, you haven't completed all of the, the payments. And the answer is, unfortunately, unless the claim is submitted, you cannot make the payment. So within that number that I gave you of the 80 accepted, there are some that are complex claims, but there is a much bigger proportion of the claims remaining that will be complex. And so it's been greatly beneficial f for my team and I think for for Adelshaw Goddard as well, to be able to free up that resource to deal with the complex claims that we have both now and incoming. And finally on this section, the government has also said that claimants who previously accepted less than £75,000 will be topped up. Will this affect the speed of processing other claims in your view? No, we've dealt with it already. It took hardly any time at all. We know all the people, we have all the details, the number's very clear. We've topped up 28 claims. That's 28 people who had previously accepted lower than £75,000. They have all been topped up now to that number of, of 75. It's, it's all been dealt with. Thank you. So we still have a situation where we've got 147 claims and partial claims in the system. The number of victims potentially is 472. Uh, 478 are registered. Overall, 492 people are, are eligible, but yeah. only 478 are registered. So we've only got claims from one third of the potential victims. 
Yes, but that's a significant increase, as I say, on the last month. And it's not that we don't know who these people are, where they are. They have previously already submitted claim overview forms. You'll understand, though, that after everything we've been through, two-thirds of victims still haven't put in a claim. That's a concern. Yes, but they are in the process. So if you would like to analyse the process, um, as you were saying, you'd like to get to the bottom of what is happening, I think you need to look at the process overall and say what is happening at each stage. So how many, how many disclosure requests have the Post Office dealt with? They've dealt with, with quite a large number, over 28,000 documents, 55% of the branches within the scheme. You also need to look at how many accountancy and medical reports have been requested. This was part of the process that the claimants' lawyers were keen on. I've personally signed off 326 accountancy expert requests, 300 medical expert requests. The government pays for that to help them strengthen the claim for the claimants. So at this stage, what's your expectation as to what percentage of the potential victims will submit a claim? Will submit a claim? I feel confident that a very large proportion will submit. What is a very large proportion? Well over 95%. Okay. The, the question is one of timing, of course. Yeah, but that's the goal, 95%, or rather that's the expectation. Well, my, my like goal that. is 100%. Yeah. But that is why it was helpful to remove the August <clears throat> deadline through legislation in, uh, in Parliament yeah. earlier in January because of Sir Wynne's, <laughs> Sir Wynne Williams' concern. And have you got a view about when we'll hit that 95%? My view, it, as per my Minister's aim, is that we should do that for August, but that is very dependent upon claims. Well, the Minister's claim is actually to pay them all out by August. I'm just interested in when you think all the claims will be in. Well, I would hope that we would have them in by early July. I don't know whether you would like to add anything to that. I think that, that would be right, early July, in order to give us the 40 days. OK, thank you. Mr Higginbottom. Thank you, <laughs> uh, Mr Creswell, if I can uh, stick with you. I think we're all keen to understand what the final cost of this is going to be and what's been budgeted and paid out so far. I think I'm right in saying that estimates are due this week. So could you update us on the estimated total cost of the Horizon scandal, including how much has been spent so far and how much is budgeted into the future? So overall, the, the provision that's been set aside for us to access from the reserve, Treasury's reserve, is around a billion pound. That's the total cost of compensation. So I'll just check this, because in the letter from Mr. Reid to me, it says 1.2 billion. It, it is slightly over 1 billion. I don't quite recognise 1.2 billion. I can write to you to clarify that difference. But, but broadly speaking, a billion pound is that expectation. Now, of course, that is, that is dependent upon the number of convictions that get overturned. And this is a point that seems sometimes to be misunderstood because people compare the £160 million that has been paid out so far to 2,700 claimants with the £1 billion. There is no way that we could have paid out £1 billion by this point because it is modelled on how many convictions are overturned. The government stepped recently, as discussed in the House yesterday, uh, to overturn lots of convictions through legislation will enable us to do that, and I personally think that we will end up spending more money on compensation overall than that £1 billion figure that was modelled at an earlier stage. How much more? Uh, I, I don't know for sure, and we are discussing that with Treasury. And this is all taxpayers' money? Yes. Every penny of it comes from normal taxpayers. It is not coming out of a separate post office pot of money that they've made. This all falls on normal taxpayers. And so you can understand why there is some nervousness about not knowing the full figure. Yes. So um, one point of clarification within that figure, there is a contribution that the post office made up front for the Horizon shortfall scheme. The government asked it to well, put forward a proposal to sell its telecoms business, which it did, and it used the revenue from selling its telecoms business to cover the costs of the Horizon shortfall scheme. So that part of the costs of the Horizon shortfall scheme, and then government has taken on the cost. So I think within that one billion, part of that came from post office selling its telecoms business. Do you think it's appropriate for the post office to pay bonuses to its executive team whilst the taxpayers foot in that bill? I absolutely think that it is right for the post office to pay bonuses to its executive team. That is a classic part of what you would expect from a public corporation. The question that has been debated quite hotly, including within this committee, has been whether it was right to pay bonuses on the back of uh, a misstatement in the accounts and a view that Sir Wynne had endorsed the executive team's performance uh, in relation to the inquiry. Was that appropriate? No. 
but I'm talking about moving forwards. Do you think? Do you not think that bonuses should be tied to performance on doing justice by the postmasters and the postmasters? So if if the timelines aren't hit, or it goes over budget because the post office haven't properly dug into their records, would it be appropriate to pay bonuses? So I think it would be good to have a mix of different objectives that link to bonuses for companies such as the post office. Obviously there are postmasters around the country delivering services day in, day out. So to skew the target solely towards addressing the past would be a misjudgment in my view. But including that within the basket of indicators that drive bonuses, that seems very sensible to me. If I could just change tra track very briefly. Um, there's been lots of reports that ministers and officials have asked uh, that we go slow on compensation payments. Is that your understanding as the official in charge of post office policy and horizon? You would have thought that someone would have mentioned it to me if that were the, uh, the intent. Not at all. I worked very closely with Sarah Munby. She and I worked with Treasury to secure the funding needed for the schemes that I've mentioned, the overturn conviction scheme, the GLO compensation scheme. Every conversation I had with her, with ministers, with other senior civil servants in other parts of government have all been about how can we pay out this money more quickly. So no, that is completely incorrect, that assertion. So based on your conversation with ministers and other officials, is the approach stick with the current plan, current speed, go faster or go slower? It's definitely go faster and Minister Hollymake was clear about that yesterday. He also announced a couple of specific interventions that are targeted at speeding things up. So one was um, the idea of topping up overturn conviction payments to 450,000 for those people who choose to stay within the, the full assessment process. That is intended to target the incentive to encourage more OC claims to be put forward. And I know you'll be talking to Mr Hudgel later, who's got probably his own perspective on that, but I think that's a useful idea that's come out from claimant lawyers and Sir Gary Hickenbottom. And the other one is the GLO making a, um, a payment of 80% of the offer to the individual claimant. Again, that's an idea that's come from a postmaster who has been talking to my minister about his own experience within the GLO scheme and how we could improve it for them. And that is something that we're looking to do. And I think both of those will help on the incentives. But I think the phrase the minister used yesterday was every day we are looking at ways to speed up the conversation. And, and I'm not sitting here claiming that we are going as fast as we should be. We definitely need to speed things up. And, and I'm pleased that your committee is looking at it and we, we will engage with your recommendations. And finally, if I can just a very brief one. You're in charge of Horizon and post office policy. Were you aware of the letter that the Chief Executive Nick Reid sent to the Justice Secretary in advance? Did you put any pressure on the Chief Executive to send that letter? Not at all. Not at all. Were you aware of it in advance of it being sent? No. No. It appeared in my inbox and I read it. Okay. Thank you. Briefly, Mr. Gillis. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Cresswell, you said to Mr. Higginbottom that you felt it appropriate that uh, bonuses were paid to executives and gave reason. Mr. Reid told this committee that he accepted the post office had not known since 2005 where the shortfalls that were paid by victims of Horizon, the post, sub postmasters and postmistresses who sold all their assets and belongings had gone, had been lost in the accounting of the post office. How has the department addressed that and do you still therefore believe that it's right the taxpayer picks up financially when bonus is potentially being paid with the shortfall funding from sub postmasters and postmistresses themselves? So I was answering a question about should bonuses be paid now and into the future, and I stand by what I said earlier, which is that I think you do need to incentivise executive teams in, in corporations, and the post office is a public corporation. Um, I can't really comment about the past. I don't know whether what you've said is, is accurate about whether shortfall money was used or was not used in relation to, uh, to payment of past bonuses, but the department has set up the independent inquiry run by Sir Wynne Williams, and we await his views on, on all of these issues, which I think will be quite material about what happened and who knew what when. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I want to stick with Mr. Crystal, if I may, and follow uh, points that uh, Mr. Higginbottom was asking about the, the, where the, comp the compensation and where it comes from. My understanding is that the, the, of the two schemes, the, HF, the high horizon, horizon school for scheme, would be paid from the post office's existing resources, but the group litigation order payments would come out of general taxation. Is that right? So that is correct on the GLO scheme. That is, that is absolutely correct. Obviously, the GLO group um, reached an agreement in December 19, and that was funded solely by the post office. But that's, that's separate and historic. The GLO at the moment is coming from general taxation, um, and it is coming from, from the Treasury. The Horizon Shortfall Scheme, as I was mentioning earlier, first of all, the contributions towards that came from within the post office through the sale of its telecoms business and so on. 
but only up to a point. And then I think beyond, beyond a certain figure, then it fell to the government and Treasury to cover the remainder of those compensation costs, and that's what we're still paying now. Can I also mention one other thing, while I'm, just, just for completeness? We are also paying some of the administrative and legal costs to support the post office's work on these schemes to the tune of $150 million in this financial year and next. All right. We've already heard the total budget is something in the order of a billion to $1.2 billion. I think many of our constituents would be astonished uh, to find that they, as taxpayers, are having to contribute this money because of the bad decisions of the management running the post office, maybe the inefficiency in, 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 their, in their dealing with things, or in many cases perhaps even their wrongdoing in carrying. Do, do you think the public understand the implications for them of this uh, bad management of the post office? So I think two things about that. I think the ITV drama and documentary were both excellent, and the documentary gets talked about less than the drama, but the documentary is, is, you know, is, is truly excellent. I think the, the public mood is very much behind the postmasters, rightly. Um, but I, I think that the question about who contributes towards the costs overall, taxpayer or, or someone else, is still very much a live one. And, and you discussed this with Paul Patterson from Fujitsu at the hearing that I attended last month. And I think the idea of Fujitsu contributing towards the costs uh, rather than it solely falling onto the taxpayer is a, a very sensible one and they seem open to that. All right. And how, how are discussions with Fujitsu going in terms of getting them to contribute because of the errors and failures that they uh, created? So I think the principle has been established through your discussions with Fujitsu. Um, we are in contact with Fujitsu, but we are not currently negotiating with them to settle a figure. Um, we are in contact with them, but we are engaging with the Horizon IT inquiry and discussing with the company who have said that they will look to reach an agreement but have not done so now. I, I see you're looking at me in a slightly well, why quizzical fashion. Why have you not started talking money with Fujitsu? Well, we are talking to them about the principle, but we have not sought to try well, to agree. The principle's agreed. What, what about the pound notes? So uh, I think there's a question about when would be the best point to agree a sum. If we were to agree a sum of money now, and then the Horizon IT inquiry were to find something material that could affect that negotiation, I think it would be wrong of us, on behalf of the taxpayer, to reach a, a preemptive agreement when the situation might change because of the inquiry. Do you see what I mean? I do. Yeah, there's a fear that a Fujitsu might decide to leave the UK, for example, in order to avoid any obligation that they, uh, they, they might have uh, created for themselves. Well, that does not seem in tune with the conversations that we and Cabinet Office and others have had with Fujitsu. Well, and I think the Fujitsu HQ comments from there have been very clear that so they regard this as an to address. As you understand it? That, as I understand okay. it, absolutely. Okay, can I also ask you, when Mr. Reid gave evidence to this committee, he told us that the post office, in the absence of the Horizon scandal, was already a difficult business to manage in the face of uh, uh, people moving their banking online and other, other activities online, putting pressure on, uh, on, on the post office it's, uh, itself. How do you think the post office recovers from this? Well, there are two parts, I suppose, to that. Um, do I agree that it was a difficult business to run? Yes, I, I used to be responsible for the retail sector for four years. I think, like many other retailers, the post office has had a difficult time on the high street and consumer behaviours are changing. I think that is true, and um, that's why Mr Reid was appointed to the role, because of his retail experience to help grip some of those, those problems. So I think that's... Um, I think it is accurate to say that there are challenges, but not insurmountable challenges or different from other retailers across the UK. That, you know, that, that I think, is the case. Right. I think as for how the company recovers, the best way, in my mind, is to deal with the legacy of the past as quickly as possible. The brand is still strong, from what I have seen across the country. So I think the you know, post offices are loved, thanks to the work of their postmasters across the country. Um, so I think they need to deal with the past. And then there are questions about the future, which is actually what Sarah Munby, the Permanent Secretary for Bayes, was raising with Henry Staunton when she had that famous conversation. Okay. And does the management time expended on Horizon and the amount of cost that's going into it from the post office's own resources help or hinder the post office from getting on with running an efficient post office business across the country? Well, I think the opposite, the counterfactual, of if you were to take all of this off the post office and absolve them of any responsibility of cleaning up the mess that they caused, would not be fair. The government has put in extra money, 150 million, as I say, to support the company to ensure that it does not erode the core business. But my view has all, always been, and I think you know, as ministers too, that the post office has a responsibility to help deal with the, the legacy of the past. Okay, thank you.
Can we just get the numbers then, uh, Mr. Creswell? So, what, what what is the in the in the current financial year? Uh, what is, what is the budget for redress for the Horizon shortfall scheme? I'm afraid I don't have those statistics to hand. Okay, um, the GLO compensation scheme. Uh, well, that is very dependent upon how much money we pay out. So, so far we have paid out thirty-four million pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and if we so, what, what, what have you said to Treasury about how much you expect to pay out on this scheme? Across the whole of the no, no, just on the GLO compensation scheme. Yes, but I mean, do you mean within this financial year or across the two financial well, we years? We can have both if you like. So, across the two financial years, our estimate is over a hundred million. Over a hundred. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As I say, we've paid thirty-four million. The um, the Treasury does not tie us to very fixed amounts that have to be spent in each financial year because that would be a break on spend. So we have that flexibility because we're drawing from the reserve. So if we could get that 34 million paid out so, so far. You've, you've got end year flexibility basically. Exactly. But, yeah. but end year flexibility in the sense that we can bring forward spend. And overturned convictions, what's the forecast for that? So 35 million pounds has been paid out on that so far. Yeah. Um, and I. I don't have a forecast here for that overall. Right. There was a provision set out in the Bayes accounts that, that totaled 600 million. Okay. The, the, you've got estimates from your department being produced this week, and currently, when we look at public information, it is almost impossible to detect exactly how much budget is being provisioned for which scheme and whose budget line that lives on. Okay. Can you write to us this week to set that out clearly? Very happy to do so. We wrote to you in November via the Minister and that set out quite a lot of these points. Um, hopefully you've seen that letter. But we, we have seen that letter, but I'm afraid it doesn't provide clarity over how much budget is provided for each of these three schemes in which financial year. I'm very happy to do Parliament that this week. Parliament would like that information. Of course. Um, Mr Lavery. Thank you very much. The, the scheme is a 40-year uh, period, 40-year target for, and I think it's already been suggested that 70% uh, have met the target, but obviously 30% haven't met the target. Can you can you say to tell the committee um, why that's the case and what you you do and actually try and achieve 100% of the uh, of the cases within that 40-year period? Of course, and it's a very good question. And um, when I last came to the committee, I said that it was a stretching target, which indeed it proved to be for the end of January, which, as you say, showed an outturn of 70% against that 90% target. We never aimed at 100% because we recognise that some of the claims are more complex. That was the target that, that we set. I asked my team for the most recent data yesterday, and we have now moved to 85% against that 90% that target. So we're still failing, but we are closer to the target now than we were and I think that reflects the fact that early on we were getting some of the processes up and running and some of the early cases, some of them quite high profile ones, I think have legitimate reasons for saying that their claim took too long but we are now speeding up quite significantly. So what, what are you doing to, to improve that? Well we've already taken quite a few steps. The so what, what are the steps? So the £70,000 £70, has been very beneficial I must admit, that has allowed us to get payments out very quickly. We have also been working with Adelshaw Goddard on, on some of our processes to ensure that when, um, when claims come in and there are questions, the partial claims that I mentioned earlier, the RFIs, the requests for information, go back to the claimant's lawyers as quickly as possible because, as I was describing earlier, there, there needs to be throughput throughout the system and we need the full claim before we can then properly process it. Now, you mentioned the complexity of it, those complex cases. Mm. That's basically the reason why you, you, you perhaps aren't meeting um, higher targets. Can you give the committee a bit of a flavour of what a complex mm. case actually is? Of course, of course. And I often get asked, well, why don't you just pay one sum for everyone within a scheme? But the answer to that is that, that all of the compensation schemes that I know have that range of different experiences that we are trying to compensate for. So looking across the cohort of postmasters, there are some who were in prison for 14, 15 months. There were others who had a shortfall that they then managed to pay back and continued to work. There were some who moved on to another job and ended up earning more than they did in a post office, and there were others who never worked again. So that, that's an example of the range of different experience, and that is why we see a, a range of complexity across the different circumstances. 
Um, I don't know, would it be helpful if I bring in yeah. Mark to perhaps give some examples around that complexity without obviously naming any names? Yes, I mean, I can't, yeah, I can't go into detail on, on individual cases, but it's, it's exa exactly that, that um, there are very different experiences, very different issues are, are, are raised. Some um, of these postmasters are were close to retirement, others were um, much, much younger, and, and we're looking at issues of, um, you know, can, can, they, can they work going forward through to retirement some of those those claimants it's that's going to be sort of 20 30 years potentially of, of, of working life that they've still got um, and um, you yeah, know considering you know can they um, and some of these have uh, medical expert reports to support the fact that they can't necessarily do a, a stressful job uh, like the post office uh, was for them uh, but can uh, physically work full time um, and could do another job that will will, will mean that you know, taxpayers aren't funding their um, effectively their, their earnings through till till retirement. Um, but there are others where they, they just cannot work anymore and they need um, we need to calculate a payment that will see them through to retirement. Um, so it's those sorts of issues. Um, I think I would add that um, the, these claims are are complex. Um, I've worked on a number of schemes and, and, and arrangements where uh, we're looking at compensation um, from PIP breast implants uh, where, where that's fairly simple, there's no medical evidence required, no forensic accounting uh, required, right through to some very complex um, pharmaceutical damage claims um, that were, were settled with uh, involvement from the Department of Health where you, you've got a lot of um, uh, medical evidence required, a lot of scientific evidence required, and um, those processes all take time. They start off slowly, they typically last at least two years uh, for, for, say, the breast implants cases, and some last a lot longer, um, up, up to four or five years. And, and I think this is, this is definitely uh, a scheme where we are moving at, at, at pace now. We are trying to uh, find ways to move faster, um, but it's, it's, we're at, at the, at the, the <coughs> effectively we've been at the beginning stage and getting through a lot of um, issues that we are resolving now and have resolved uh, which then stand as in good stead to accelerate through to the end of the process. I'm not sure if that's a really good like, analogy comparing the post office compensation claims to breast implants. I'm not sure if that's really what we should be doing here today to be, to be perfectly honest. The, it's not really about complexity, is it? It's about the the claims that are outstanding, the the thirty percent of the ones that are you know haven't accepted. It's obviously it's because of people who have been impacted the most from um, the, the 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 whole uh, sorry saga. People who have got mental health problems, people who will not get employment in the future, people who cannot manage employment. So it's not about complexity because, as you've mentioned. Mr. Cheshire, you're used to dealing with cases of that nature, you know, like future loss of earnings, uh, pain and suffering, that sort of stuff. You're used to that. So it's not about it being complex. It's actually, basically, I think, run-of-the-mill legal issues. So I'm not sure why, uh, indeed, it's being suggested that these are really complex cases. The fact of the matter is that they're not complex. They're just people who are being impacted uh, worse by uh, you know what's happened to Mr. Bates suggested that um, if there was a fine, for example, imposed of a thousand pound for each day uh, over the the forty day period, um, that might speed things. So what would your view be of, of that, Mr. Cheshire? Um, I think, as as Mr. Cresswell has explained, um, the the main um, issue is, is, and we're all working together collaboratively with the, the claimant's lawyers as well, um, the, the, the speed of, of the overall scheme um, is, is governed um, by how fast um, the, the claimants can, can um, put their claims in. Um, and um, that's what we're, we're trying to, to, to work through to, to make sure that end-to-end -end process is, is as fast as, as possible. Um, I'm not sure um, that there's any added incentive on, on us or on DBT if there was a, a, a fine or, or some sort of penalty levied on 
on anyone in that in that process um, if if um, if the, the the target wasn't met. I, 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 I go back to what Mr. Cresswell said that you know this is it was a stretching target. We're trying to trying to meet it. Um, we have accelerated, um, and um, I think we should be judged at the end of the process as to whether we have achieved that target of, of um, uh, 40 well, days. Well, to be fair, we're making those judgments now. Can you just tell us how many people you've got working on it, please? Um, we've got, uh, at the moment, a team of, of 15. Um, 15? 15, yes. Um, eight qualified lawyers and, um, and seven uh, staff supporting that. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Lever, I interrupted. Thanks. Can I have slide two, please? This is the GLO process map, um, and we've said that there are 478 people who potentially could apply. Um, you've said that you've got 147 claims or partial claims in. Part of the problem that we have been told is that the post office disclosure at step one is too slow. Can you tell us so how many of the 478 individuals covered by the scheme, how many disclosure reports have now been issued? So 55% have been covered with disclosure reports so far. 55%? Yeah. And that covers... Why on earth is it only 55%? Well, the, the amount of disclosure material coming from the post office is coming in more quickly than the number of, of claims that are coming to us, or than some of the other steps, such as medical advice and forensic accountancy reports. So... Um, so, so far, the feedback we've had from claimants' lawyers has been that the start of the process with the post office was not quick enough. The disclosure process... Well, it still isn't quick, quick enough. enough. Well, the, the data I, I believe is coming through, you may want to discuss this obviously with the post office later on. We will. From, from our point of view, we feel that the post office has sped up and is on, is on plan. Well, it must have been going pretty slowly before. Well, they certainly have a lot still to do. When is it going to get from 55% to, for example, 100%? Is that April, June time, do you know? I think that's the time. Yeah. Right, so you're going to get 100%. <laughs> you're inviting us to believe that you're going to get 100% of the disclosure reports issued by April stroke June. You've got eight qualified lawyers working on this, and we're going to get all the claims settled by the middle of August. So I think it's important to be clear who's doing what within the process, which is why I think hopefully this process map gives that sense. All of that work, analysing the disclosure, does not fall to Adashaw Goddard. They process the claims when they have been submitted. The purpose of the disclosure is to allow people such as free... But as you know, sorry to interrupt Mr Cressel, but I mean, as you know, once the disclosure report is issued to a former sub-postmaster or sub-postmaster, they have then got to rally a whole load of further information together and put that evidence to you when they submit that claim in step three. If you haven't even issued them the disclosure reports, there's no way that you're going to get all of these claims in by April, May, June. Well, I've quoted to you the statistics that show the progress that we've made so far. Um, I, I feel confident that the post office is on track to deliver the... Let me put the question a different the way then. Are you now satisfied with the speed with which the post office is issuing the disclosure reports at step one. So I would like every step of this whole process to go more quickly. The question was, are you satisfied with the speed? Yes, I am overall, because this is a chain So you of think step events. one is going fine now? You're happy with it? I personally am, but I'll be interested to hear other people's evidence today. Okay. Mr McDonald. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I'd like to come back to that schedule in a, in a moment, but just... Arising from some of the previous questions, could I just return your attention, Mr. Cresswell, to Fujitsu? We didn't get anything from you in terms of... They came here with mere culpa and lots of uh, expressions of sorrow and commitments. What are you doing to actually nail them down? You won't talk about money. What about the principles? We would have expected, I'm going to tell you, further progress to be made on that discussion, even if it's around ballpark percentages in terms of the ultimate bill to the taxpayer. So where are you with that discussion? Because it's an important matter. Well, as I was saying earlier, I think the, the principle of the moral obligation has been stated. We are in contact with Fujitsu, but I'm afraid we have not, at this point, achieved what well, you have said that you think that we should do. Well, I think you've got to further and better particularise that from this moment onwards. You've got to get something from them that is meaningful. Because at the moment, uh, an apology is, is, is very nice to hear, 
but ultimately in terms of the payout to the taxpayer it's meaningless so please could you uh, from this committee could you could you please go away and get some uh, hard uh, edges on that and just on the similar matter return to the issue of the, the bonuses you talked about bonuses being a proper way to pay matter these postmasters were prosecuted I believe under the theft act um, either I don't know whether it was for obtaining uh, money by way of a false instrument uh, uh, what it may well have been uh, uh, obtaining a pecuniary advantage within the post office's own accounts and the executive the way they conducted themselves they did exactly the same the thing is the difference between the postmasters and the, and the board is that the postmasters were not guilty yet the executive board members were so what are you doing in your position to seek legal advice as to why those people have not faced prosecution thus far so I am not here to be an apologist for the past. I am dependent very much upon the Horizon IT inquiry that's been led by Sir Wynne Williams to look at those issues. He is best placed. He has powers to compel people to give evidence and documents and then produce an assessment about what went wrong and what should be done on the back of his <coughs> recommendations. My focus is because I'm responsible for overseeing the post office now from a policy perspective is on what the targets are now and going forward. Okay, well, so we wait for Sir Wynne Williams. That's the, the answer. Um, what about this, uh, this business? How long should a claimant expect to wait uh, between first offer and the conclusion of the first facilitation phase? The steps, steps four and five. What, how long should they expect to wait? So we have set 40 working days, obviously, between step one and um, the assessment and, and the offer. So once we get the full claim in, up to the stage four. We have not yet taken any claims through the, the Denton's and then panel and then Sir Ross process. I don't know, Rob, whether you would like to come in and get Well, on you. that, before, and please come in, but, but what should the time scale be on that? Uh, and the conclusion of the, of the uh, independent panel, what should the time scale be there? So is it okay if I bring in Mr. Francis? Please do, yeah, yeah. So it will depend on the claim. Uh, obviously there are more complex claims that will require a slightly longer period for negotiations and will assess on a case-by-case -case basis. But broadly speaking, for step four on the slide, I'd estimate about five weeks. Um, and uh, sorry, that's, that's step, yes, step five. Um, but we're reviewing it throughout that five-week period. Um, some cases will be close to the parties agreeing terms. Everyone will be relatively content and we'll be able to settle those quickly. Others, it will become clear they need to go through to the independent panel because the parties are too far apart. So, so, so five weeks there. What about independent panel to independent review? So broadly speaking, I would say for the independent panel, that's likely to take uh, around, well, from, from the start of the, the claim being submitted, you're likely to talk to up to about six months to the end of the first panel. But the intervening steps for that, you have the facilitation, it then will go to the panel for a preliminary view, and that preliminary view will then help the parties see if they can agree. So Mr Francis, did you say six months? Yes. But those stages are the 40-day period for the offer, a facilitation period where we're running sessions, trying to get the parties to agree terms. And I would expect a lot of these claims will settle at each of these stages. We'd then have a preliminary view from the independent panel, again, hoping that we can get the parties to agree settlement terms before a binding decision so, is, is reached. So our 40 days has now gone into six months. So I forgot that, uh, got that right. No, sorry, that, that's not what I'm saying, I'm sorry. Um, what I'm saying is that the 40 days is for the offer. Yeah. Then there are a number of subsequent okay. stages, and we would expect the vast majority of these claims to be settled. But if your question was at what point we get a binding decision from the panel, because we would have all those stages going Well, through. you see, if it is going to drag on, isn't Alan Bates' uh, uh, suggestion a good one mm. uh, in terms of the 40 days to get to first offer? Because it wouldn't have concentrated the minds, wouldn't it, if it was a 1,000 day, uh, pound a day penalty to get through the rest of the phases. Uh, if, if, you, if you were late getting to that point, it would encourage, it would put the principles of incentives into this uh, time scale. Is, has he not got a point? May I come in on, on that? I mean, yeah. I, I don't think there is a problem with the 40 working days target at the moment and our, you know, our performance against that. I would like to take away that point well, about the well, there, there, there is because you, 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 only 70% mm -hmm. are being made, uh, got in an offer. No, that's not what I said. It was 85% yeah, against I, the 90% target. target. Okay. Oh, because, so, so, so we're what's, failing. What's, failing would this work? Is it, is it, would, would that be a sensible thing to do? to int introduce that incentive on opposite the 40-day first offer? Well, I'm not sure about the penalty 
but you could certainly escalate cases if you reach a timeline. I mean, that's in the law, we often have deadlines, limitation periods, and so on. Um, so it could jump up to the next stage. I mean, the difficulty with that is that the case may not be properly considered. But could I just say that from the point of view of the panel, and I spoke to the three leading cases the other evening, and myself, we're ready, willing, and able to deal with cases, but we haven't seen any. And, uh, you know, we'll turn them around quickly once they get to us, if they get to us. But it may be that a lot won't get that far. And, you know, one would hope that they don't because reasonable offers would be made. And I think that's absolutely <coughs> crucial in terms of time. You know, reasonable it's offers have to be made. And it goes back to the Chairman's point, they have to be full and fair. And this, this sort of is, if I could emphasize this principle, Ms. McDonald, that the full and fair is crucial because it's an overarching um, criterion. It's not just legalistic analysis, this. You have to provide a full and fair offer. I get, I get the point, but I, I was a claimant lawyer for 30 years, and I think Mr Cheshire's been looking after defendants uh, for that period. So I'm familiar with, with, the, with the principles of schedules and counter schedules exchanging. Wouldn't that get, get landing on your desk be a damn sight quicker to get to that situation where the parties have produced that sort of exchange with each other and, and, and you could come to a view? Would, would, would that not be a more sensible way to get it to, onto your desk as the independent reviewer? Yeah, possibly. I mean, another approach might be a fast-track approach where you don't have the sort of complex analysis uh, that you'd currently, that's currently been undertaken. Um, you might have a fast-track, and I think Mr. Hartley from Priest is going to talk to you about this, where uh, instead of getting an expert medical report, you simply rely on the medical records and the GP's letter, say, or you don't have a full you know, forensic accounting, you have something else. I mean, there is a, or he, he's got a possibility of putting cases into different categories uh, in terms of uh, monetary compensation. So, oh, oh. you know, there are, there are ways that you can well, think of. I, I I'm just to, to we can argue with, about with, it. With, with a caution <laughs> on fast tracking and medical records being the determinant of what the damage actually is. That's a real worry for me. But on this issue, just finally for me, Chair, on the, this whole business about full and fair settlement, you know, if we've got these, these figures, are we not in danger of settling claims at an undervalue where the, 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 the damage to that person's career, their lives, their family, the loss of home, I mean, certainly on a £600,000 uh, payment, payment out, that would be sufficient uh, possibly to buy the house back that they lost in the first instance. Where in this system is the evidence about exemplary and aggravated damages for the most heinous crimes committed under the auspices of the state through the post office that this country's ever known. Why is that not writ large in this scheme uh, to make sure that you know, we deter people from ever going there ever again by mistreating people in this way and that they are punished because this was born of malice. People deliberately set out to cause this. That's, the, that's the, what's caused the outrage in the country. Where is the reflection of aggravated and exemplary damages in this scheme? Well, I would come back to full and fair, because it's not simply what the calculations will produce in some cases. It's full and fair, and it takes into account all of that. And that sort of approach, I mean, that was the approach um, that I recommended and was adopted with the the uh, Lloyd scandal, the HBOS fraud scandal. It's the sort of approach that um, is adopted with the, uh, the blood inquiry, the contaminated blood. In these sort of cases where people have suffered huge harm over a long period by wrongs, there's something more than simply coming up with the, the calculation, which you would have produced as a claimant lawyer in your schedules. In some cases, full and fair means going beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just want to very quickly check a couple of figures that haven't come out, I don't think, yet. So, Mr. Cresswell, how many claimants have rejected their first offer? Uh, at the moment, we have six claims that are um, rejected. Obviously, previously, there was a number of nine, and then people agreed. To, so it goes up and down. But the latest data I, um, I received from yesterday was six. That compares to 80 who have accepted. 
Right, OK. That doesn't you. mean that all of those will go all the way through to Saros, of course. No, I understand. Thank you. Mr Francis, how many claimants are in the first facilitation phase? At the moment, yes. we have the, um, the figures that were mentioned in the sense of everything that's come through with the first offer. So we have those. Um, I'll come back to you on the exact number for the first facilitation okay, period. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ian Lavery. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. I wonder if Mr Cheshire could explain why there might be a case why uh, an individu individual claimant might think that the offer they've received isn't acceptable. Can you give work a flavour of that? Yeah, I think I can. I think, um, I mean, there's, there's essentially, there's, there's two elements um, that we're, we're, we're looking to compensate. One is the, the sort of financial um, loss, which is relatively straightforward to calculate. It's, it's the, um, you know, the shortfalls they have to repay themselves. It's losses resulting from that. It's, it's losses resulting from any uh, suspension or termination of their employment and any losses that their associated businesses suffered. Um, that's a, a monetary calculation and that's um, relatively straightforward. The, the more difficult element to value is the uh, compensation for personal damage, um, personal injury, loss to reputation, um, uh, harassment and, uh, and, and uh, distress and inconvenience, those sorts of elements where it doesn't necessarily translate um, in, in, any, in any sort of human sense um, to a, a figure, but we have to come up with a figure, the law has to come up with a figure uh, as a proxy for that uh, distress, inconvenience, um, damage. Um, and there we're looking at, at, at case law, um, at things like the uh, Judicial College guidelines on, um, on general damages for personal injury. Um, there's there's a, a wealth of, sort of information out there that, that you can use to comp uh, compare your, your, um, your claim to. Um, and we look where we can for analogous cases, either within the scheme or outside the scheme. Um, and, and I think sitting in a, in a claimant's position, um, I, th there will be times when you, you will be disappointed with what the sort of totality of what you went through is, is given a, a crude number. Um, and and that's, that's unfortunately the nature of, of, of how these, these um, claims work. It's how, how um, claims work going through, through the courts. Um, and it's, it's trying to translate that one thing to, to the other. And it's, it's comparing apples and oranges. In, in well, may I just add something on, on the back of that? Is we have had some feedback from a claimant who was dissatisfied with their offer, that it would be helpful if there's a big difference between claim and offer to spell out the reasons in more depth. So that is something that we are implementing and, and doing because we recognise that just receiving the numbers without proper explanation of that difference can be immensely frustrating for the individuals. So we are looking to, to improve some of those communication points. It, it does seem uh, that as people who have received <coughs> claims, uh, received offers, a lot of people believe that absolutely derives with compared to you know, what they went through, which you've, you've explained, Mr. Cheshire, lots of people kind of work again. Lots of people lost every single thing they had. People lost relations. People lost their husbands, suicides, uh, and and you know to receive the rise we offer at this stage is is, is absolutely un unreal. You cannot imagine how these people must feel, Mister. Um, I think um, anyway. I'll, I'll not get into any individual cases, but there have been high-profile cases where high-profile individuals have uh, been made the offer and believe that the offer is pr approximately 20% of what the thought that should be it, it deserved. Um, so that, that's huge issues are on that. How can they be reconciled? I think it's, I mean, I, I know exactly which case you're referring to and, and so it's very difficult for me to, 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 to comment on that. Um, what I will say is that, that that is the sort of the classic case that, that should go through the, the, the process and um, a, a, a facilitation and ultimately um, it may well fall to... to I mean, what would you say to somebody who you offer 20% of a huge claim to when they just say, hey, you can go and, you can go and stuff it, basically. You, you, this isn't acceptable. Um, after what we have went through, what, what reaction would you, you have to somebody who took that sort of... 
who responded in that way because, hey, listen, these people are hurt, you know. It's destroyed their families, you know. It's destroyed everything they ever had. These are people who worked hard. They, they won't pay the fortune. They invested in the post office and were threat uh, really, really badly. And to think that compensation of the all these years is coming forward and then it, for it to be so derisory is an absolute insult. That's what it is. It's not trying to give them the, the finances which they might need to draw a line on and move forward. Quite the opposite. It's a huge kick in the pants. How will you deal with that? So may I come back in on that? And then you might just briefly, because I'm going to bring in Douglas Chapman. OK. Well, I, I would say I'm, I'm sorry for any impact that we've had on people who feel that the offer through the GLO scheme is divisory. The stats I gave you earlier show that 80% of the offers have been agreed. I think we shouldn't necessarily be judged by the ratio between how much was asked for and how much was offered, because a lot will depend upon the approach taken and how much has been requested by individual claimants. Nevertheless, claimant. I think it would help the committee if you could provide us with a spreadsheet of anonymised data that set out, first, how much was claimed, second, what was the initial offer, and third, what was the final figure agreed where agreement has been reached. Mm. Is that OK? I think that sort of data would help your analysis, so I'm happy to take that away. Yes, obviously, the anonymisation is important for the individuals, it but is. you wouldn't expect to, no, to see exactly. that. I wonder if Sir Ross could answer um, a very simple question. You know, as well as being the reviewer for the GLO scheme, you've told the Compensation Advisory Board about fundamental issues with the, um, the Horizon Shortfall Scheme. Can you tell, tell us about these issues? What they, uh, we discussed, uh, what I discussed with the uh, advisory board was whether the HSS um, award should be reviewed along the lines of the Lloyd's inquiry I did, which was enormous and, uh, uh, enormously uh, complicated and took time and money. I said maybe the best approach is to have an appellate system like the GLO system. And so I recommended that. I mean, I, uh, we haven't got time to go into the details. Um, the, I understand from what the minister said yesterday that the department's giving serious consideration to that. So that would allow HSS people who are unhappy with what they got to go through this sort of process that we've got in GLO. Uh, so you'd have a panel, come to a panel, and then ultimately to a reviewer. Could I just while I, uh, can I just say back to Ms. Mr. McDonald? I should have said that there is a provision for exemplary damages in, where there's a prosecution. I should have mentioned that. So, Ross, could you see as any barriers for claimants, basically in the uh, the scheme's guides and principles, uh, which probably make it extremely difficult for claimants to to claim the compensation which they think they rightly deserve. I, when I was, before I signed on the dotted line, I made various recommendations to change the principles and to give the department credit, um, they did change a, a, a lot of them in terms of full and fair, they put that right up the top. Um, there were uh, other changes in terms of my role, which was expanded. Um, I, w one thing I'm not too sure on uh, whether that, whether it's been taken forward is uh, more transparency. Now, this is where it comes back to you in a way, in terms of providing information to you. I mean, I think that's important. The transparency is very important. Um. I think Mr. Crystal's nodding there, mm. so maybe that's a lesson that you've learned from what uh, Sir Ross has said. Yes, I agree. Yeah, thanks very much. Just on the back of previous question, uh, Sir Ross, um, Jim, you mentioned about the statement that was made yesterday in the House. I just wondered if there was anything within that statement that you thought uh, would help speed up and move things forward in a, a positive way. Uh, and you know, do you think that the minister uh, can actually deliver on some of the promises that were made within the statement as well? well certainly, the um, fix some. Uh, offer and uh, putting that up front is very valuable um, but it all comes back to making um, good offers to start with coupled with uh, possible procedural changes I mean one of the uh, recommendations was that in issues of principle should come to the panel and then to me 
that doesn't seem to have happened. There are issues. I mean, I think uh, Mr. Gullis raised an issue of principle, which might be a general issue of principle, affecting you know, other people, generic cases. So there are a number of procedural changes which can be made. I mean, the, what the minister said was, of course, was welcome, but it was high level. And he said he was taking away a number of things as well. Um, so, you know, we, we, um, we watch and wait for the uh, department to consider it and for the minister to uh, yeah. make another statement. Uh, and more generally, the, the post office uh, has been, um, you know, involved in all these matters right through, the, 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 right through from you know, redress and compensation and so on. Uh, should the post office itself be taken out the whole mix so that, you know, we can actually have a completely independent look at what the uh, you know the, the compensation well, scheme I, I delivers. Know. I mean that's got nothing to do with the GLS scheme because the post office is not involved but of course the advisory board has recommended that um, and they think that that's a way forward. Very brief Mr Carlos. Thank you Chair. Mr Cresswell a lot of obviously speculation has been in the media regarding Henry Staunton. I just want to quickly ask you someone who's in the department were you under the impression that people would resign if Mr Staunton had not been removed from the office? Yes, the yes, I was told that explicitly. By a number of individuals or by just one? By one individual on behalf of two members of the board. So the complaints about Mr Staunton's behaviour came to me and I had a phone call with Mr Tidswell, who's going to give evidence to you later. He is the senior independent director on the post office board and his job is, among other things, to hold the chair to account. So it was he who contacted me, and, and indeed he did say, as, as you have suggested, that the level of anxiety about Mr Staunton's behaviour was such that we might see resignations from the board. Thank you. Thank you. May I just follow up with Mr Cresswell? Have you worked with a lot of chairmen of arms length bodies during your career? I have, yes. My background includes um, helping set up the Competition and Markets Authority, the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education, sponsoring ACAS, Citizens Advice and other bodies. So my, my background is, is, is quite full of that sort of arrangement, yeah. So given your experience, how would you describe Mr Staunton's performance as chairman? So I, um, I have never heard of anything like the allegations that were made to me by Ben Tiswell when he phoned me. And I have never seen anything like the behaviour since that article was published in the Sunday Times by someone who has taken what has happened and has talked about it in the way in which he has. So what signs did you see in your experience that you were not comfortable with? Or were there signs that you felt that he wasn't up to the job? So I was first aware of the investigation into the whistleblowing allegations in November last year. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't been aware that he was being investigated until then. I note that he has said that there was no investigation, but there is, and it's, it's still ongoing. Um, prior to that, concerns had been raised with me by the UKGI shareholder executive about some aspects of the chair's performance in terms of his, his grip on his brief. Um, and his, um, whether he was alert in meetings and so on. So I was aware of those broader concerns, but I regarded them as, as less serious than the allegations that, that then came to me in early January. And as I say, there were two key allegations from my point of view that were influential um, in the Secretary of State's decision for the dismissal. One was around the chair allegedly trying to stop a whistleblowing investigation into his conduct which, given the history of the post office and the Horizon scandal, struck me as particularly serious. The second was around the chair trying to stop a public appointments process to recruit the new senior independent director, because unfortunately, Mr Tidswell is coming to the end of his term and is, and is moving on. Um, and that role is there, as I said earlier, to hold the chair to account. So again, it struck me that trying to bypass the public appointments process that the minister wanted to strengthen the board was a step that seemed inappropriate to me to stop that without consulting the government as shareholder. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Chair. In the light of what Mr Cresswell you just told us, what do you think that says about the recruitment and appointment of Mr Staunton in the first place? Well, as I was saying, I, 
I didn't have um, initial concerns about Mr. Staunton when he joined the board. I think he has a lot of um, background in the, the retail process sector. That put him in the place in the first place, in the position in the first place. Well, I think it's hard for me to judge. I think if any any people who have been close to the Horizon scandal over a number of years will have encountered concerns about whether people like the government, people like UKGI act when concerns are raised with them. And this is a rightly a matter for the Post Office Horizon inquiry. I've been struck by the number of commentators who have queried why the government took this action in relation to the chair. To my mind, this is evidence of the government actually taking a stronger perspective when it hears about things that aren't working. I was more bothered about the, if, a, if in any business, if somebody hasn't performed uh, in the way that was hoped, there are questions about the recruitment process. So my question to you was, what does it say about the recruitment process? I think it's hard for me to draw many conclusions. I think you, you would experience in any, any matter of employment, and this isn't strictly speaking employment, it's an appointment process, if things don't seem to be working, you should correct course. And that is what has happened. Thank you. There are chairs at the front, Minister, if you'd like a ringside seat. Um, that draws this first panel uh, to a conclusion. Thank you very much to uh, all of our witnesses. Um, Mr Creswell, you've told us that you are personally signing off the claims that are made under the scheme. Some of those claims can be signed off in an hour or less. You've told us that you still think that the process needs to be sped up. It's not going fast enough. Um, you haven't been able to tell us the budgets of the different schemes, but you're going to write to us uh, with that information. I'm sorry that you've not been able to table that in front of us. You've been able to tell us that you're still failing against the timescales that you've set. We've only got eight lawyers actually working on processing the claims and 55% of the disclosure reports have been issued and 45% haven't. That implies that there are still 215 disclosure reports that are required to be issued and Mr Francis has just told us that it could take up to six months to process these claims. You're not going to hit the deadline of mid-August for getting all of these claims settled, are you? I would like to go away and work on that six-month date with Denton's because, as Sir Ross was saying, I, I don't see a reason why it should take that long and fast-tracking some of the questions of principle to, to the panel and to Sir Ross should allow us to move forward. So my current assessment is that that we should be able to hit August with a fair wind, but there are a number of factors outside of our control. And you are right to identify the, the pace of disclosure. As you initial. cannot guarantee us, absolutely guarantee us today, that that mid-August deadline will be hit. And that is why the Minister has described it as an aim. And that we also took steps, didn't we, through the legislation to remove that hard deadline. But you cannot guarantee us that mid-August will be the end of this for the GLO applicants. We are doing everything we possibly can That's to hit that question. I, cannot... I know you're doing everything that you can, but you cannot guarantee mid-August. No. Thank you. That concludes uh, this panel. Thank you very much indeed to the witnesses. Order, order. The proceeding is currently suspended.
processes in my case. Mr Downey? Uh, yeah, the exact same. My claim started uh, 16 months ago. Um, I got an offer after eight months, um, nowhere near. Eight months? Eight months, yeah. It took eight months it to took get eight months, um, an offer? Nowhere near what it should have been. Um, my issue now is trying to get the post office to understand that taking £36,000 from me did have an impact on my business and did cause my bankruptcy, mm -hmm. which they say didn't. Tim? Uh, my claim hasn't been submitted yet because I, I have an overturned conviction that, that was quashed in 2021. It, it's taken me the last three years working with Hudrus to build my claim because the amount of detail and information that the post office insists that we put into it. Based on what you've heard this morning, Mr Bates, are you any more comfortable or reassured that the government has now got a grip of this process for providing redress? No, I'm afraid not. It's very disappointing. and This has been going for years, as you well know, and I can't see any end to it. Mr Gillis. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Bates, obviously the government said in November 2023 the 90% of offers within 40 working days. I'm led to believe that yours came in on the 31st of January, which is actually 111 days after your <coughs> claim was originally submitted. Obviously, as you say, you've since rejected. In the House yesterday, there was a lot of talk around this £75,000 upfront offer. Obviously, the Minister was making it clear that the idea is that for those who have got lesser claims, that's just quickens and speeds up the process. But... There was a mood in the House, particularly as well from the right hon. Member for Whitton, who said that she felt, and others across the House, that the 75000 was derisory, does not take into account the loss of a livelihood as well as the loss of earnings and obviously the wider impact on mental health, physical health and family wellbeing. Out of interest, do you know how many of the GLO group have actually taken up that upfront offer to date of 75000 I don't. Um, that might be better put to the solicitors here. And can you take us through the process, or uh, for everyone on the panel as well, we'll start with you, Mr Bates, first, about where you think the main obstacles and bottlenecks are based on now your experience? Well, the, the initial one, obviously, was That's disclosure yes. by post office and the failure uh, of them to disclose. Uh, documentation, because that's... Ha uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, that's hold up, uh, held up the whole thing. I mean, what's frustrating about that is that when the Minister first announced in, I think it was March 2022, about this scheme being put, Post Office already had the names of every single individual that they had to do disclosure on. But they didn't do anything to the best amount. So we could have been a year ahead before they really got to grips with disclosure. In it. And despite the, the numerous early meetings we had with it was Bayes or the department in those days, and um, with Freeth to try and put the scheme together. I mean, both ourselves and um, Freeth, who were present at those meetings, uh, both emphasised the problems that we'd had over the years with disclosure throughout all the court cases. I, I mean, warning after warning was given, but unfortunately, I have a, the impression that the department felt it would be different in this case, and they'd be able to control post office during disclosure. But that's one of the big hold-ups right at the outset. Now, I know we're past that nowadays. Well, we're not. Well, we are we're in not some ways, but we are. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you're only halfway through, and, it's t uh, and my understanding is a lot of this disclosure is, is pretty rubbish that's coming really? through as well. But, I mean, you, you need to ask the lawyers involved in that as well. So the, the merits of it after all that time is I just don't know. Mr Downey, obviously you said eight months until yeah. so you got a decision. What were the obstacles and bottlenecks in your opinion? Um, I'm in the uh, Horizon Shortfall Scheme, so we didn't have any legal assistance. Um, I just had to do the application myself. Mm -hmm. They asked the right questions to me, um, and I gave quite detailed responses, um, which I think they chose to ignore, and they picked certain phrases out. Uh, an example, um, it's fairly obvious why my bankruptcy happened. Um, they told me um, that I chose to pay off a um, £100,000 mortgage rather than mm. pay my £20,000 debts. Well, that's just not the case. I didn't have a £100,000 mortgage. I rented a home um, and my debts were double, nearly 50000 
So where they got the figures from, I have no idea. So quite distressing to one have figures thrown at you that you certainly don't recognise. And second, I really still it continue to treat you as if with suspicion and caution. Absolutely, it's like they admit they admit they they've wronged, but they don't want to pay the compensation. And Mr. Brendel, obviously you've had your conviction overturned, as you said earlier, <clears> and obviously now going through an extensive process. Just again, any obstacles that you're facing? Just the amount of, uh, of detail and evidence that post office are assist, uh, insisting we, we have to provide. Um, if you compare it to perhaps uh, what's been announced recently where the government's going to legislate to overturn the remaining convictions and those people can sign a letter and, and receive £600,000 within days, um, I've been building my claim and having to provide this level of evidence and details for three years and it's taken us this long. Three years? Yeah, since my, my conviction was quashed in 2021. Can I ask what uh, assistance to any legal advice you were able to receive, or have you had to do that all independently of yourself? Uh, it's all been done through Hudgels. And obviously, unacceptable three years, eight months, and in yourself, Mr Bates, with everything you've been through, and obviously made yourself very high profile, rightly so, uh, in taking this forward. The, obviously, the current government's statements about the forthcoming legislation does not propose any measures for members of the GLO group. I was just keen to understand, do you think that's a mistake in your opinion? I don't know what you can do other than, than it, you know, remove the whole scheme away from government itself or say the <coughs> department and try and do it elsewhere. But, I, I mean, <laughs> we keep coming back to this time after time after time. Pay people. There's a lot of distractions, a lot of other things are brought up, thrown up all the time. But just get on and pay people. And it's... It, I mean, we, we've heard figures this morning, given perfect examples of how long it is going to take. Um, there are de people refuse to give deadlines now because they can't meet them. Uh, I mean, that suggestion that I put in, I think, earlier about paying people a £1,000 a, a, a day or them being charged a £1,000, that is actually compensation, and that should go to the actual claimant involved. I mean, everyone keeps referring to the scheme, understandably, as a compensation scheme. But it's not. It's financial redress. This is money these people are actually owed. And they've been owed it for years. Compensation sounds it's like something that benefit at the whim of government and all the rest of it. Uh, I, let's get it right and let's really push forward on, on that aspect. And with the post office, obviously, all three of you have said that, that the evidence are proved still, that they, even though they've acknowledged this is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice that I certainly have ever lived in through in my lifetime, and I think well beyond that. And having admitted, therefore, they need to, to stump up and do better. But yet, still, they're putting obstacles in the way, treating with caution and suspicion, ultimately willing to say the right things to the media, but behind the closed doors when it comes to doing the paperwork, the experience is very different. Is that fair, Mr Bates? Yeah, take them out of the system. Send someone in to do the job for them. Get rid of post office out of any of these schemes. That's the best thing you could do. Mr Downey? Um, I, yeah, I can second that, absolutely. And Mr Brentlock? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Shall I make this? Thank you, Chair. Um, Tony, you referenced earlier around the particulars of your experience. I was wondering if you could describe for the committee the impact the Horizon system has had on you and your family and the process that you've had to go through to claim compensation. Um, yeah, so I, we started our business in 2001, uh, shortfalls from day one. Um, I was suspended, but allowed to uh, have my job back if we went to the bank and got £3,000 to pay into the system. Um, and then I had the threat of um, if I had any more shortfalls, it was my fault and my business would be closed. So then I kept them hidden from the post office and from everybody else. Um, until we ran out of money, we used our credit cards, um, forced to sell the business, declared bankrupt. I had a nervous breakdown. Uh, we left the village, ran away without saying goodbye to our friends, uh, put our daughter in school in another country, um, and never been back to the UK for 15 years, apart from these last few weeks. And I'm, I'm really sorry to hear about your experience. Yeah. In terms of the process for claiming compensation for what is an absolutely hideous experience that I don't think any of us would wish even on our worst enemies, how has the information requested from you, the design of the form and the waiting stage at different stages within the process had an impact? 
The initial application is difficult uh, to, to do on your own. Um, the questions, that, asking for quite a bit of information that obviously it's 20 years ago, it's hard to get. Um, but the problem I found with a, a lot of mine, an example is uh, the deterioration of my health was documented in my medical records, fortunately. So I sent that to, to them, um, which again, they totally ignored. Uh, they said they had nothing to do with my health because um, I had family issues. <laughs> I know, I know. So, I, I, yeah, I, I really don't know. And this is the thing, it's almost like, I think for most of us, we're not believed. It's as though we're making this up. You know, this happened to us, they did this. Um, and they admit it on paper, but when it comes to it, they're not bothered. And in terms of that culture of disbelief, from the post office and their attempts to frustrate your ability to get justice for your experiences. Um, Sir Ross Cranston, the independent reviewer of the GLO scheme, told the Horizon Compensatory Advisory Board last November that the historic shortfall scheme was, quote, tainted by the involvement of the post office, end quote. Do you agree with Sir Ross's assessment? I, I do. There is a difficulty that I've heard from my uh, legal team is that if we if we stop this the time's going to then expand it's going to get longer and longer do we stop it or do we continue with the process but it, there's definitely some culture there that is, is making them do this to us thank you and thank you chair T tony first of all to all of you we're so sorry to hear about the, the losses and the damage that all this has caused you but tony you, you see, you went bankrupt yeah. shortly after you sold your shop yeah. and your post office. Yeah. But the post office has denied causing you bankruptcy. I'm, I heard what you said. I'm, I'm trying to get my head around this. They're saying that you actually chose to pay off a, a mortgage and therefore this was your choice yeah. and your fault. You're saying you didn't have that mortgage. We had a business loan of £60,000, uh, which was paid off normally by our solicitors, uh, but they said I chose to pay a personal mortgage of £100,000. So facts are facts, you know, we hear of alternative facts in this yeah. day and age, but you know, how is it that the post office will not accept your timeline and your um, presentation of information about your own finances? Why is that not accepted? Have you been given an explanation? No, we're still we're still on with it at the moment. Hopefully, Neil, he's on later, will be able to put a bit more detail into that. Um, but we we all have no no understanding why. Yeah. And so, what's then the direct impact upon your compensation uh, um, process and the resolution of that? How does that impact upon? Well, you? It, in effect, if they won't accept like, uh, the causation, um, that could be the end of my claim. Really? Uh, but I, I don't know a way forward. They're, they're, they're not admitting causation, which then um, they, they won't admit my uh, health issues. They're saying it's my, my problem, my fault. Yeah. Okay. But you have been accused of a great personal cost to you Absolutely. in terms of reputation and relationships. Yeah. yeah. And yet there's also a denial that it's caused you in, in, in any way any. Uh, psychological disorder as well. Is that, in, uh, is that being denied to you as well? Yeah, my, my records, in, uh, they, it, it, it's perfect. From, from the day I was suspended, in my health got worse and worse and worse, up to a nervous breakdown. Uh, the doctors um, had put in the, the stress of the post office, um, <coughs> the stress of the, the bankruptcy had caused my illness. Um, the post office chose to ignore all of that and they said that um, I had family problems and there's another thing I, I, I can't remember the other thing. Oh, they referred to a letter of 12 years later uh, to say that I had bipolar tendencies. Well, people do have pre-existing conditions and they have families. Yeah, I had no pre-existing uh, no pre conditions. You didn't have any pre-existing conditions? None at all. That's just, just becoming uh, uh, utterly, utterly... They utterly referred fast. to a letter of 12 years later I'm with you. Right. Okay. So, yeah. I'll just get the point. Um, but just to press the point, because Sir Ross mentioned the issue of um, um, trying to build this, trying to circumvent some of these problems by reference to medical records. Yeah. Yeah. Your medical records are there and they're being ignored. Have you, in addition, produced any 
medical evidence by way of a medical legal report that sets out. I just the just had one just just, just, had one. just last month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So hopefully, you're, is it your hope that that's actually going to be the platform for? I'm, I'm hoping, so. but the thing is, it, it, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't. But they've admitted that they they. Oh, I put this money into the system, and they've admitted they were wrong in their contractual obligations. Uh, they admitted that I wouldn't have resigned were it not for the horizon shortfalls. Uh, that's there in black and white, but they won't admit anything else. And, and just finally, Chair, the, the government statements about the forthcoming legislation don't make any, don't propose any new measures for members of the horizon shortfall scheme. In your view, is that, is that a mistake? I, it's a hard one. I'm trying to go from personal experience, but I, I can't answer that one really. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. The life. Hi, uh, Tim, you, you mentioned already that uh, you were you had your conviction overturned like three years ago yeah. in 2021. Can you give the the committee some sort of idea? Uh, when the problems with uh, the post office with the horizon system began in your case? Well, uh, I took over my post office in Roche in 2005 um, and uh, I was straight into monthly balancing that and the, the post office n never balanced to zero at any point. Uh, initially it was small, small discrepancies where you might be £30 under one month or, 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 or a couple of pounds over another month so so like many <coughs> postmasters uh, I had a, a little pot in the cupboard so if, if you were over you'd take some money out of the post office and keep it aside because the chances are the next month the, the system would be asking for that, that money back. Um, it was a, a few years later when bigger uh, discrepancies appeared um, totalling uh, uh, £1.22,500 and um, which I uh, mistakenly initially tried to, to pay back myself until I was audited, um, and, and the discrepancy at that point was £16,500, uh, which the post office demanded I paid back immediately or I'd be charged with theft. Um, so by selling my car, borrowing money from my parents and the business, um, I paid that money back to, to avoid the theft charge, but they then, they then charged me with false accounting. What, what progress have you made with regard to your claim? I think you mentioned before that it's, it's not like progressing as well, quickly as it might be. And, and what, what, what challenges? Uh, we've heard what both Tony and Alan have seen with regard to the challenges. What challenges are you facing yourself with regards to your, your claim? In fact, I shouldn't say claim. I think Alan was absolutely right before he yeah. said it was like financial redress. And I think that's something which we should all learn that it's not compensation and it should be renamed. It should be financial redress. Yeah, very true. Um, it, it's so complex because uh, the, the business that, that I had was a, a, a village shop with a post office and a small fish and chip shop. Um, uh, I bought it alongside with, with help from my parents and it was supposed to be uh, inheritance for me <laughs> and, and uh, a career going forward for perhaps the next 40 or 50 years. Um, We've had to evidence every kind of loss that we're claiming for since I was prosecuted and removed from that post office. I didn't just lose um, the post office salary at that point. Um, I, I was running the retail business as well, um, but the rumours and, and the, the people I had to deal with locally that were accused of me uh, of being a thief and a fraud meant I couldn't face people, so I, I stood back from the retail business as well. Um, also in a small community, many people stopped using the shop because they, they saw us as, as fraudsters or thieves, so the, the, the business, not just at the post office, the retail and the, the food side of it suffered greatly as well. Um, we haven't got all of the, the documents and information from 15 years ago. Um, we've had to, to have um, uh, forensic accountants go through, through my accounts, through the business accounts, through my parents' accounts. I've had to have me, uh, you know, medical assessments and records and things done. I, I didn't have any kind of um, uh, evidence with my GP because although I've since learned that I suffered greatly, uh, I suffer with anxiety and depression and, and, and things because of this, 
that's only been discovered by having a medical report done recently because I, I kind of kept it to myself and hid myself away from people, didn't go to the GP to seek help. Um, so we've had to build all this. The claim is, is almost ready to go in now, whether it will be responded to quickly or not. I don't know, but it's, it's <coughs> taken me the three years to get to this point. Um, uh, uh, we've always been told that we have to go into this amount of detail because, rightly, it, it's public money that's paying it. But then it's announced a few months ago that I could just sign up and take £600,000 with absolutely no evidence at all. Uh, and anyone going forward now that has the conviction quashed can just sign a piece of paper to say they're innocent and, uh, and walk away with that money. Uh, it just seems... Uh, yes, I've had a, a small interim payment, um, and as recently as last week, the post office have actually returned the money that they demanded that I pay to avoid the theft charge. But that's taken three years for them to decide to do that. Uh, it feels like I get sort of a pick and a crumbs from the table, as it were, and it always seems that before there's a, a, a large event, whether it's the inquiry restarting or a committee like this, that an announcement is made from government or post office to try and uh, placate us or, 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 or offer us something that just seems to continue that cycle of, of waiting. Since 2023, the, those with overturned convictions have been up at £600,000. Yeah. Do you think that um, that, that's to settle full and final? Yeah. Uh, do you think that'll speed up the process in, in, in what might actually speed up the process? Well, for some people, if, 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 if people were very close to retirement or perhaps had, had small losses or, or, or not a huge impact on them, if, if your claim was judged around that or below it, then that would speed that up. But, but for many people, uh, like myself, or other people who suffered perhaps worse, people, people did prison sentences, pe people lost loved ones because of this. £600,000 doesn't come perhaps anywhere near to, to, to compensating or, 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 or redressing them. Uh, they still have to go through this extended, this extended way of doing it and have their, f their claim fully assessed. I don't think this question is being asked at any of the, um, the hearings we've had. Can I ask you a personal question each year? What was your salary when you last worked for the post office? Mine was just under uh, £20,000 a year because it was a small one-counter retail business. Tony? Uh, mine was around about £26,000. Uh, the office remuneration was about £43,000. So basically it's a pittance <coughs> for work for in many ways it could be described as under the, 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 the living wage. Yeah. Absolutely horrendous. Thank you. Just, Just briefly, very, very, very quick one, uh, uh, <coughs> Tim. In, in fairness to the Minister, I think I did hear that you know you, you could avail yourself of an interim settlement up to £450,000 in, in circumstances such as yours, where it may be that the, uh, the, the sum ultimately due to you is significantly more than Six hundred thousand pounds. Has that been explored in your circumstances, or are you aware of people taking up that offer of, of an interim of four hundred fifty thousand? Well, yeah, that that offer is is very recent, um, and that that interim payment should come when you know, when the claim is submitted, and hopefully mine will be submitted very soon. Of course, that four hundred fifty thousand pound is is minus any interim or payments that you've already had. Already had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is welcome. You know, yes. it, it's a, the £600,000 is an awful lot of money to most people, as is the £450,000, and, and that would help me in my situation uh, while the full claim is assessed greatly. But I, I, it, myself, I've got um, a, a baby due with my first partner in, in June this year. I don't want interims or steps. I want to be able to not worry about the post office and not think about it nearly every day. I, I want to put it behind me and, and move on with my life. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Chair. Um, I'd appreciate all of your thoughts on this. Whilst you're not with the post office now, I assume you've got friends and former colleagues who still work with the post office, and you yourself still have a relationship with the post office as you go through this process. In your view, has the culture of the, pros, uh, of the post office changed since you were since you were there? No, no it feels like the, the, they they either think we've somehow got away with something, or or, or they don't believe believe our version of the story. Do you have anything positive about the change or 
No. no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Palsy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my question follows on a little bit from Mr. Uh, uh, um, the, uh, uh, and I want to ask you about the leadership of the post office. So you've been involved for 20, 25 years, in which case there have been various changes in leadership. Um, has at any time the arrival of a new chairman or a chief executive led you to think, ah, there might be somebody new in charge, that may change things? Perhaps Mr Bates, given your uh, experience in the matter. I think you know, over the years I've been dealing with post office, the, the, the culture has always been post office. It hasn't changed, it's been the same for donkey's years. It will not change and you cannot change it. My personal view about post office is it's a dead duck and it has been for years and it's going to be a money pit for the taxpayer for years to come and you should sell it to someone like Amazon for a pound get really good contracts for all the serving sub-postmasters right. and within a few years you'll have one of the best networks okay, that's around. a very there. radical proposal and not one I'm sure that, view, not one I'm sure that many of our <coughs> constituents would be comfortable with but interesting that it, it comes from you. So I'll just ask you about sort of the more recent leadership. I mean did Mr Reed's leadership at any time give you any comfort to think that ah oh, here's a new guy who's got a retail background he's going he's to get stuck into sorting out these problems for us. With, with, with all of us well from my perspective and those I've been involved with I, it's not about words it's about deeds and we've seen no deeds that have changed anything in there. All we hear are these words all the time about yes this has changed, yes we're doing this, yes we're doing that but nothing's changed. In the matter of words we've had this um, claim by the previous uh, chairman that uh, I think have been pretty substantially refuted, but that the government had been had told him to delay payments. Do you, do you, do you think there's any truth in that, that that might have happened? It wouldn't surprise me. I don't know factually one way or the other, but I mean, it does seem to be the way things are going. Right. We'll, we'll have, we've got Mr. Staunton in front of us later sure. on, and we'll have the opportunity to to challenge him on that then, but what, what perhaps I might ask, perhaps Mr Bentle and Mr Downey, when you heard those remarks, what did you think? It, it makes sense, it makes sense that, you know, things are slow, that they seem to be held up, uh, they go into the machine, they sit there for months and months and months, it does seem that way. Okay, Mr Bentle? Um, I, uh, again, I don't know one way or another. Uh, one thing that definitely, uh, for, for people in my position, seems to cause delay is the layers of, uh, of people that we have to deal with. Um, I know from talking to my legal team, perhaps they agree something in principle with, with the post office who we're dealing with directly as overturned convictions. They then have to go uh, and get it agreed with the department, and then once that's agreed, maybe not back. It then has to go to the treasury. So there's there's, there's many layers of of government that we're dealing with to to, to get simple these simple processes across the line. And do you think that's because within the post office and possibly then extending into the department, there's a mistrust of postmasters? The there's definitely, I feel there's definitely a mistrust of, 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 of what we say our version of it, even though you know, we, we've legally been you know, proven right. And Mr Bates, we've got the Minister in the room with us today, who's uh, stood at the dispatch box in two or three occasions now and said that he really wants to get the money out to the postmasters. Do, do you think, do you think do you, A, do you believe him? And B, do you think he's making a difference? What, what will make a difference is seeing the money coming out, and then I'll be able to believe him in that case. But, I mean, the, the, the more it, it... It just... It's unfair on too many people, this. For, and it's been going on for far too long. I don't know what can be done to speed it up. You've got to get rid of the bureaucracy in there. You've got to slim down the, the processes in there. And people are going to have to take other people's words. Interesting, an observation of, you know, from the earlier witnesses um, <clears throat> was the fact of how much time was spent on someone signing off, finally, mm -hmm. an offer, and how, how little time. And one of the big problems I've found with this, or I'm starting to find, is those who are making the decisions about the actual claims, or, or what claims are going to be made, do not meet the victims face to face and discuss it with them. Mm -hmm. It's all done from an ivory tower from someone else and ticking a box and that's it. Their job's done out the way. And does that lead to a lack of understanding of the position I'm, that you and your colleagues face? Yeah, it is. And I, I can explain that perhaps in, in a way, <laughs> hopefully you'll understand. 
I mean, when we were campaigning for all of this over the years, and people were saying, you know, I've, I've tried to take this up with my MP and all the rest of it, and the problems I'm having, I'd say to them, well, look, don't just write them a letter, don't just phone them, make an appointment, go and see them, tell them face to face what's gone on. And I've heard from many people that what was meant to be a 15 or 20 minute surgery session has turned into a couple of hours because they've been so concerned about what they've heard face to face. And I think that, was, that makes a big difference. I'm pretty sure that my colleagues sitting around this horseshoe would agree with that. That yeah. if we hear some, yeah. <coughs> somebody's account uh, on a one to one basis, we've got a much better understanding than, uh, of something than we receive an email. So, just one thing you're suggesting about taking the post office out of the process, but we need information from the post office, don't we? This bit about disclosure, I think we've got some, had some evidence in the previous session that. Perhaps the post office isn't providing that information as fast as it might. But how could, how would the situation exist without without them providing information? They have to be in there, but I take the control of it out of post office. I will put somebody in there or a team in there to actually manage them and drive them forward to do it. And <laughs> the post office premises yes, and to literally to, to, to do that. Uh, inve investigators of some form. of some sort. All right. Give okay. them some real power. Okay. Thanks. Briefly, yeah, for slavery. It's really interesting what, you, what you're seeing there, Alan. I, I, in, in my constituency, there wasn't anybody come forward till after the ITV uh, dramatisation. Not one. And there's a number come forward um, since then. But there's also people who are newer, uh, who I didn't realise had been part of the, uh, the scandal. Uh, they've kept it very quiet because they're very shamed uh, and, and what they were accused of, they paid money back, and I've asked them to come and see us so we can assist them to put claims forward, and they're very, very reluctant. I've been meeting them three times, um, and there's been cancellations, and I just feel as if, you know, on some occasions, people are not under any circumstances, uh, regardless of what happened to them, whether it's the same as what happened to Tim, Tony, or yourself, are just not going to come forward because of the, they want to draw a line uh, uh, under it, get it put behind them, and not resurrect it again, regardless of how badly they were trapped. I think that's a fair assessment, isn't it? It is true. It's happened with many cases, and it's been a real struggle to try and get people to come out of the way. But all we can do is you know, keep sending the message out, come and speak to some of the friendly legal teams that are involved in this, and, and they'll look after you and take you through the process. And do come forward because this is the right time to come forward for anyone. I just want to check a couple of um, common problems that have been flagged with us. So lots of victims have said to us that when they're asked to apply for redress, it's almost like they've got a blindfold on because they haven't got the information. Often the post office has got the information, but they're having to submit a claim form without that information. Is that a common problem? Well... <laughs> Doubt was always meant to be in favour of the claimant. I'm not sure that's happening. Okay. The, the second issue that's come up a lot is that when the, an offer is given, it's, it's a bit of a black box as to how that's been worked out because there's no standard tariffs, for example, calculating reputational damage, and it's really difficult, therefore, to assess whether what's been tabled is in any way fair because there's no explanation for how the offer's been put together. Is that a problem? Um, well, it, the claims fall into two... I mean, the lawyers are better to speak to about this, but, I mean, uh, it, it's the pecuniary and the non-pecuniary, isn't it? The, the items that, where they pay back money or it's, it's lost to the house. It's the other side that causes the problems normally. It's the, the stress, the, the problems that have caused psychologically to people on all that side, where it, it's a lot harder for them to take those, those issues forward. And then we've got this kind of David and Goliath struggle whereby claimants are given maybe £1,200 of legal advice, but you're up against one of the biggest law firms in the country contesting your claims. There's an inequality of arms there when it comes to getting the final claim sorted. I think you're referring to the HSS scheme there mm. in particular. I really haven't had a lot to do with that. I'm just concentrated on the GLO and yeah. the 500. Is that an issue for the GLO scheme as well, though? 
Uh, it's, it's different because there's a different legal fee structure in there as it uh -huh. goes forward. And, and, and in fairness, uh, I think the lawyers are, are dealing with most of the issues along the way. Um, Tony or Tim, <coughs> anything else to comment on those kind of common problems that have come up? Um, no, I, I have to say um, my legal team have, have done way more than £1,200 worth of work and, and they're you know, spot on. Yeah. Um, I did put the application in on my own and I got no legal assistance until I got on offer. Right. Um, but then it, it's, all been, it's all been fine. Okay. Tim? Well, yeah, I can't really comment because my claim hasn't gone in yet. Hasn't I don't know what the reaction to it's going to be. Okay. Um, Mr. Guys, did you want to comment on anything else? It's very briefly again, Mr. Sorry, Brent, though, obviously, you fought, fought fight of your life, essentially, when it came to getting your conviction overturned. The government's obviously talking about having others exonerated. I can understand there may be some emotion where you've had to fight the fight and others will be able to sign a piece of paper, but do you think that is probably the right way forward in order to enable a line to be drawn in the sand for this to be moved on from? Oh, yes, totally, because uh, it, it, it took... Um, from the end of the, the 555 action. It took us two years to get to get the convictions quashed or to start to get quashed. Um, and we're only at 100 people, uh, around 100 people so far. Um, if there's hundreds and hundreds more, it would take years to go through the court. So to legislate it is entirely the right thing to do. Um, my, my point was the fact that um, for, for building my claim, I've had to spend three years building it, whereas people who perhaps aren't at that £600,000 level can simply sign and accept it and, and walk away within days. I think for me, finally, Chair, sorry, it's just obviously in our pack of Appendix 7, which is Mr Reid's letter to the Lord Chancellor and the Secretary of State for Justice, we've heard a lot about the culture of the post office not changing. I'd find this letter quite extraordinary that Mr Reid has written, obviously, to the Lord Chancellor effectively, and I've read it this way, I'm happy to be proven wrong, that the Post Office is slightly nervous about the idea of quashing all convictions because they fear that there are those who they still think should actually be found guilty of their crimes. And to say that uh, the very significant public and parliamentary pressure for some form of acceleration or bypassing of the normal appeals process, I find quite, I think shows sadly that even under new leadership, victims are still being treated with caution and suspicion which is not going to lead to <coughs> others maybe coming forward when they should be entitled to. Yeah, well, that, the, uh, the old ratio is, in, in our law, surely it's better that uh, 10 guilty people go free, isn't it, than one, one innocent person suffers. Totally agree. Just a final question, really, from me. Um, if I was to give you unfettered power to write the laws of the land, what would be some of the things that you would put, Mr. Bates, in that legislation? <laughs> Mention that because I was thinking, well, one of the ways to try. It's just that we've got a bill coming towards us <coughs> quite soon. I'm quite interested uh, to know how you would like us to amend it. Well, I, I, I just slightly step back on that. It's funny, one of the ways I had thought of trying to resolve all this issue, if this carries on much longer, is for all of the, 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 those in the GLO scheme to stand as MPs and then <laughs> in the next election come, then we'll sort it out once and for all. But uh, it would be the priority. But um, I, I don't know. I, I, re I mean, I think so many facts yeah, are Let me give there. you an example, though. Yeah. So we could change the law so that the post office is taken out of the redress scheme. That might be a good idea. Oh, yeah, well, yes. But I, I certainly, I would go back to, I, I, I want to clear up the disclosure issue first. Yeah. I think that's, that's the key thing to all of well, this. Well, we could change the law so that the post office has a legally binding deadline for making the disclosures. Well, that would be a good, good thing that to would do be a good indeed. Idea. Yeah. In, in your letter, you've also suggested some legally binding timetables Oh yes, I, would that be a good idea? I do, and I do think there should be penalties involved where mm. where they're, they're not met, and those penalties should go to the victims, as I mentioned earlier, not to any other person, because that would then be compensation in a, for having to wait and delay. Uh, well, I just I think you've given us three very good okay. Mr. Bates tests for what this new legislation needs to do. That concludes this panel. We are, I'm afraid, shocked and saddened to hear that none of you have seen any acceleration in the speed of delivering your address, and I think we are deeply, deeply disappointed about the evidence that you've given us that suggests that the redress that has been offered to you is inadequate and unfair. 
But thank you for coming and giving us evidence today. That concludes this panel. Order, order. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 Uh, order, order. Welcome to this third panel of the Department for Business and Trade Select Committee inquiry into fair and fast redress for sub postmasters. I'm very grateful, Dr. Neil Hudgell, James Hartley, for joining us today to provide uh, your legal expertise uh, to the committee. We're going to try and move through our questions uh, quite quickly, and I'll be grateful I can start with Julian Marsden. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. So, um, to both of you, could you outline your role in the Horizon compensation process and describe in broad terms the clients? whom you are representing. May I start with Dr. Hudgel, please? Good morning. I, I look after 80 of the uh, overturned conviction clients, in, including Tim. Uh, I look after, well, it's a moving number, but I look after now over 300 uh, clients that are in the um, shortfall scheme, um, including Turney. Um, we are active lawyers <coughs> engaged in the um, statutory inquiry um, and we're also engaged by a number of uh, other clients uh, particularly in relation to the pre-horizon period that's now been commonly called the, the capture days Thank you. Mr. so we free act for 419 postmasters in the GLO scheme, so we are only involved in the GLO scheme, not the other schemes. Um, we were the firm that acted for the 555 in the original High Court uh, proceedings, uh, so we've got to know a lot of these postmasters as we've known them from back in 2015-16. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You to come in here. Uh, yeah. Well, let me start the bowling in that case. We've heard a number of issues about process problems that are slowing the process down and delivering claims, redress offers, which are basically unfair. So we've heard about how people are putting in their application forms, not knowing what information the post office has got. Therefore, they're almost blindfold when they're putting the claim in. Um, when the offers come back, We've heard that you've got a box and it's got numbers in, but there's no real explanation for how those numbers have been arrived at. It's almost a bit of a black box. And then the third problem is you've got this inequality of arms where many people simply don't have access to lawyers like yourselves, but they're up against the post office and some of the biggest lawyers in the country. Can, can you give us a sense as to whether you recognise those problems or whether there are other problems that the committee needs to be concerned about? Dr. Neil Hodgson first. Start, I will, James. start on, yeah. the, on the GLO scheme and, and our experience. Um, I think that uh, there definitely are problems with the process and the timescales, which I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to. And the offers are framed in the way that you've described, with different heads of claims. So X is offered against that head, Y is offered against another head. Um, and um, Usually we can we can understand the basis of the offer that comes in the GLO scheme. We can understand the basis of the offer. Okay. Yeah. However, um, 
that's a very different thing from how the clients perceive and see the offer. And, and I'm not suggesting that we are that the offers are fair, because I think we've got a bigger problem, I'm afraid to say, than, than we think in terms of the complex claims and the sizes of the offers and how it's all going to take. So there's a lot of heads of loss where we are not seeing fair offers. That's a problem. Uh, even more significant, though, is the clients we act for, as we, we've all heard, um, are exhausted with the process, they're traumatised by the process, they see too many parallels with the, this process and this scheme with what actually happened in the enormous battle we had in the High Court. That's not to say that the underlying principles in this scheme are wrong, the legal principles are right. I mean, we've talked about the building blocks, evidential building blocks that are required to formulate claims. However, it's not working for these claimants. So it's not working it's for these not, claimants. It's not working for these claimants. <coughs> why, in the why sense not? that it's too legalistic. Mm. Um, it involves them seeing an offer letter, which, for example, will say, well, we, d we don't offer anything on personal injury. We don't recognise that you've had any kind of condition as a consequence of this. And that's, that's offensive to a lot of postmasters because they know what they've been through. So, so the... Um, there are too many parallels with the original legal scheme. Okay. Would you like to comment on process issues? Yeah, I, I think in keeping with, with Ms. what Mr Hartley says, and some of the comments that's come from the panel this morning, there's too much lawyering going on. I think that everything is over-engineered. Um, I, I equally think that... Um, one of the keys to resolving all this is to, is, to, is to think creatively in the way that the Minister did with the £600,000 proposal. Because at the heart of all this is the victims and what the victims want. And what the victims want is closure, which means something that's, that's fair to them and, and, and doesn't involve a micro-analysis of every item of the claim that's advanced. And I think one of the real problems that, that we have is that we're being asked to prove things that are self-evident. Uh, and I'll give you a tangible example of that. So over the last three years, we have submitted <coughs> into post office 100 medical reports that have a common theme about people being traumatized, damaged, suffering from all sorts of psych psychiatric diagnosis. And it's self-evident that if you've lost your job, lost your home, um, that you will have those losses. Yet we find, particularly in the HSS, that panels say there's a bit of distress and inconvenience, but there's nothing in your medical records, and therefore there's no medical injury. Um, and anyone who knows anything about personal injury knows in about half the cases, people don't go to the GP when they've got some psychiatric diagnosis yeah. and keep it to themselves. So it's an over-simplistic um, analysis of things. And I think the other problem with the HSS, and it, it's not something that can be fixed today, is the damage is done because over 2,000 cases have been settled without legal advice. Um, in many instances where the, the application hasn't captured anything like the heads of loss that these, these people have. Uh, and in many instances where a broad brush approach is adopted to cover financial and capital losses that go in nowhere near uh, the true picture. So um, you know, we, we, we act for probably the biggest cohort of any um, HSS claimants. And I can't find at the minute in that cohort an offer that I can sign off without further investigation and, and interrogation, not one offer. How many? Well, at the minute, we've got 176 offers in play. And you can't sign off? I can't, I'd love to sign off as many as I can and tell people, look, this is, this is a decent outcome, try and get on with the rest of your life. I can't find it. In, in every case, there's something missing. And one of the real, real common issues in the HSS is that there is a mechanism in place where there's a calculation based on what's called a network transformation scheme, where post office offers something of the order of 27 months loss of salary that's supposed to compensate for the entire loss of earnings claim and capital losses on top of that. So there's a real big issue there that's going to carry on playing out, not only in the cases that have been progressed, but in those that have already been settled off. 
do you think these 2,000 cases need to be reopened? Uh, on the analysis of the cases I've got, there are a very significant number of those cases that appear to me to be at least deserving of a proper review. So the cases that we think are closed are not, in fact, closed? Very probably not. Okay. Mr McDonald. Thanks, Chair. That is really quite staggering to think that cases have been settled, and I've been at this for some time about under-settlement, under and we're at risk of doing this at every single stage of it. But just one thing from me, on the, the self-evident point, I'd just like to explore with you what representations you've made uh, within the context of the schemes about that very point because everybody here and everybody watching at home knows that if you've been accused of something if your, your, your reputation has been damaged the loss that will, that will cause you will be immense you're standing within your own family within your own community will be separate. it may not be recorded in a, in a medical record but surely to goodness that the powers that be can recognise that that is a proper uh, head of claim that ought to be addressed. Have you, how far have you got with trying to make that point to people and get the post office to yeah. recognise it and the compensation systems to reflect it? I think the, I think the, the, the issue is, isn't necessarily in this room. I mean, I listened to, 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 to Carl Creswell earlier, we listened to, to Simon McCaldin shortly, and we have positive collegiate dialogue to try and revise things as we go along. Um, I think the process stymies any form of change, fundamental change. So on individual cases, uh, we can establish, <coughs> where we can establish acute need, the, the, the system accelerates. So uh, I, I had a person who had um, thoughts of self-harm um, and we expedited a medical report that enabled him to receive a six-figure interim payment. That, that's a, that's a sort of extreme example where, you know, there is a, there is compassion within people within the, the, the organisation, post office and government. But the, the bigger the bigger problem is trying to unlock the process as a whole because you know as as Tim pointed out and, and, and Alan as well is you know the GLO with the trailblazers here that got the judgment that enabled the convictions to be overturned. The irony is that the GLO, the clients, that haven't approved to the fine, the last penny, each aspect of the case, and the same with the overturned conviction cases. So, it, it, and the other thing as well, and there's so much to go at, but the other thing that we heard this morning, we commented on in the back there, is that we're not sure where the resource is to do this. You know, the numbers of lawyers that were being quoted to us seem very light. I've got cases, individual cases, in the... Um, HSS. I've been waiting for one to come back from panel since last July. Last July. Last July. And the problem with the scheme is when you sign up to a scheme, you sign up to the rules of the scheme that have no deadlines that are established within that scheme. So once you're in it, you're in it and you're stuck with it. So Tony, Tony actually, his case is, is much longer than he, he set out this morning because Tony tried to apply in 2020. Um, was told that the scheme was in fact closed, but then it was reopened. But I've other clients that were in Tony's position that wait two and a half years for an offer, and these were people with bankruptcy that were um, at the most complex end of things and probably in the in the greatest uh, need, uh, greatest need. So, is it your view then that you know, a scheme, however well constructed? especially for those early participants and those who are not represented, runs the very severe risk of people undersettling the true value of their claim because of developing knowledge and increased uh, competencies as the, as the schemes progress. And if that's the case, surely all of those need to be looked at again. It's difficult because, of course, we're so far down the line to start to unpick things is going to build into it. It builds further delay into things, and ultimately, um, what these people want is resolution. Absolutely, but full and final settlement, full and fair settlement, is, is, is what we've been told constantly. How is it consistent if people are going to be in receipt of a settlement figure that is far short of what they would are truly entitled to receive? Compensation, as we know, is to put people back in the position that they would have been had the insult not occurred. That's not happening here. 
Well, you know as a lawyer, 30 years, that you, you have, you have uh, schedule loss, counter schedule and discussion. It can happen quickly. It just yeah. doesn't happen quickly here. Mm. Thank you, Chair. Partly, the government has argued that the main constraint on pace for the GLO scheme is the speed at which claimants' lawyers can produce claims. And we've heard in early evidence that it's taken perhaps three years, uh, in some cases, to get to the point of being able to submit a claim. Following Alan Bates' evidence earlier, do you have a view on why the post office waited to start the process of disclosure until such time as claims had been made, given that they knew exactly who the claimants were likely to be? Yeah, absolutely. If I may, just before I ask, answer that question, just to clarify uh, to ensure there's no misunderstanding, I think in the certainly in the GLO scheme, there is no risk under settlement because the, 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 the clients are getting full advice. I think it's the same in uh, the long-term conviction scheme. So I think that point is limited to the HSS scheme, just in case there's any misunderstanding there. On post office disclosure, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not um, in the business of, of, of sort of in the, I'm not in blame game here because that doesn't help our clients. However, it's inescapable that, that, that I think uh, probably degree of incompetence there and uh, inefficiency has been I mean, I mean, deep incompetence and inefficiency I think has been the explanation for delays on the post office side on disclosure. So how long in the cases that you're responsible for are claimants having to wait for those post office disclosure stage obligations to be met? Um, weeks and weeks and by my estimate, I think it would take, or I estimate based on rate of process so far, it would probably take six months or more for post office to disclose records to enable us to finalise claims to put claims in. Therein lies one of the big problems on timing. And so from your point of view, would it be beneficial if the post office wasn't waiting for the claims to come forward to then start that process of disclosure, which as you could said could take weeks and weeks or months potentially, so that this can be sped up? It, it will be beneficial for us to have no contact, contact at all with post office, beneficial for the clients, because that, that's the first point, because they, they've had enough contact with post office. But the, the, the other point is that to take post office disclosure as far as we can out of the equation, I think is part of what I think needs to happen going forward in the GLO scheme. So, so that's one we, of the things I think we need to take out of the equation. So how do you think in practice that would happen in terms of the recommendations that we'll be making as a committee? Is it that the post office is required to make all the obligations to a third party of disclosures <laughs> ahead of time and then that's the body that then the claimants would speak I, to? How, how would that function in practice, removing the post office? I think the solution to unlocking the delay in the GLO scheme goes deeper than the post office issue. I'm not suggesting the GLO scheme needs ripping up and starting again. Um, what we've proposed to DBT, and um, we discussed it with the advisory board, what we fleets have proposed now is a, an accelerated process which involves um, us the lawyers for assessing carefully each claim as we do already, collating the evidence that we've already got, including the original mini witness statements done by the 555 and the GLO, using the documentation we have already got, using the recollections of the postmasters, the mistresses, bringing all that together in the detailed claim form that goes into the GLO scheme. Um, managing the client's expectations as well by giving them advice on what we think is recoverable legally, what's full and fair and what isn't. We've got to manage the client's expectations as well. We, we, if we were then able to submit that claim without having to obtain accountants' input on many cases, in some cases without having to obtain medical reports, if we think that the, what's been experienced by the postmaster is <coughs> self-evident, We've already then taken out potentially post office disclosure out of the, out of the process, potentially obtaining accountants' reports, in many cases, not all, not all cases, and potentially medical reports as well. 
for that to work, it would need a change in mindset on DBT side, whereby their starting point is not, right, let's have a look at all of the different evidential building blocks that traditionally need to be put together, which take is going to take months and months and months and months, if not years, and we'll come back to the August deadline, which is not achievable. Um, uh, so the starting point for DBT would, would be, let's take a step back and look at what this person has been through. Let's look at what Freeths are saying in terms of what the actual quantification in their view and the client's view should be, and let's use that as our starting point to decide what we think is, is full and fair, which is a very different approach to the traditional forensic legal analysis. That's not to suggest the traditional legal building blocks evidential approach is wrong, it, that is the right way to do it from a legal perspective, but this is a very different situation. Now, the, the government has said that there isn't a cap on this budget. They've allocated just over a billion, but there isn't a hard cap on this budget. That's the promise that's been made to the House. Presumably, the kind of process that you suggest, therefore, could be afforded inside the spending commitments that ministers have made. Yeah, and the, and the, and it's not to be, and it's not to say that that approach would actually cost the taxpayer more money. It might do in some cases, but in other cases, a client may say, "Well, no, you know, I I, I accept for it that you you think my claim is valued at X, which is what we'd be valuing it at in the old mainstream approach. So it might not cost more. I, I think it would be important to say though that this approach." wouldn't necessarily work for all cases, so there will be some exceptionally complex cases where there's very significant property losses, loss of earnings, bankruptcy, we, where we do need input from, a, from an accountant. And indeed, we, will give, we would give the clients the option, if they want to stay on the main track and have all of that traditional evidential building block work done, then that absolutely should be their right. They, it will take longer, yeah. but that would be their right. Okay. Douglas. Um, Dr. Hudgel, uh, you've talked before about the ongoing trauma uh, for victims caught up in the between the sort of political infighting and the crossfire, um, and you know the, the the pace of or the snail's pace of compensation that's been offered to some of your clients. Um, given the, the pain and sacrifice that many postmasters have experienced, what difference does the the ministerial statement that was made yesterday, what, what, what confidence can that give you in terms of there's maybe a, a, a change of direction, is it a change of direction, and also in the last month or so there have been a huge number of column mm. inches written about this very crisis, this, this, uh, this situation. So given we've had all that, are you seeing any serious changes in the and the way that things are being handled, and you know, is there any confidence that you can pass on to your clients, uh, with, with Mr. Hartley as well, in terms of yeah, we can we can see light at the end of this tunnel, or is it just a you know a, a, a continued process of wait and see and uh, delay and complication? I think the um, the announcement yesterday was welcome. Uh, it essentially followed discussion with claimant lawyers, so the Minister listens, um, and uh, interim payments will help, but, but you heard Tim, and Tim's having a, a baby in June, and wants closure, so all these things help to mitigate the bigger problem, and the bigger pro problem is around the over-engineering, um, layers of bureaucracy, and lack of resource. To, to, to tackle this. I think just to just to touch on one other issue that um, certainly in the overturned conviction cases the, the speed of that is, is way too slow um, uh, but post office have indicated an inability to deal with bigger numbers at this stage um, and again for me to be able to, to crack these nuts we need a combination of some more creative thinking some self-certification um, and some more resource applied to that before we get that next tranche of uh, acquittals that, that come over the hill in a few months' time. And from our perspective from the GLO scheme, again, well, we welcome um, 
the interim payment announcement, albeit there is some detail in there that we want the opportunity to discuss with DBT, not least the timing of interim payments, because that <coughs> announcement is for interim payments to be triggered upon offer, which is for many of our clients a long way down the line, a long way down the line. And paradoxically, we're talking about you know, GLO claimants who in many cases have, are, are, I mean, all the cases are serious, but these are the, the most acute cases, and they're going to have to wait and wait and wait until the evidence building blocks are together before the claim's gone in, before they get an offer. Months and months and months. So welcome, but, but, but too slow. And I think the other point I would make is that um, there is a need for something radical in the GLO scheme along the lines I've described for us to make a difference here. Yeah, because, because the timing through the process complexity is going to get worse because the statistics we were, talk we were hearing about in evidence earlier on around um, the number of claims that have been settled, which is just over 100, 107, they include the £75,000 acceptances, which are the more straightforward ones. And, and I'm, you know, it's, I'm, I'm quite sad to have to say that the more complex claims, we only have um, two that have settled from the offers, from the 12 offers that we have had. So the timing, and again, that, I stress that's not a criticism of all those involved in this scheme, including DBT. It is a function of the process. And, 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 I, and again, I stress it is going to get worse, which is why we need a radical change of approach. So you, you, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So I was just going to ask you, what, what would create an approach or a radical approach would like? What, what, what steps can the government take to speak things along? So, I come back to the, the suggestion that I was outlining earlier on in, in terms of the, um, uh, I wouldn't quite put it as self-certification, but that's, that's the point, i.e. Um, the evidential benefit of the doubt given by DBT to claimants when the claim is, uh, is put in, so they're not coming back and say, right, you need an accountant's report, you need a medical report, you need this, you need, you know, you, you need to trawl back postmaster and get all the documents, so, so moving away from that. Resource isn't the issue from our perspective. We've got, 23, we've got 23 lawyers working on this. Resource isn't the issue. So, it sounds like you've got three times more lawyers than <laughs> the government. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mr. Labour. It's, um, just briefly, Mr. Hall, you, you mentioned again complex cases. Being mentioned by virtually everybody this morning, complex cases. Generally speaking, is a complex case or a complex application for compensation, is it a higher value case rather than the complex case? It tends to be, but as you quite rightly said earlier on, a complex case is where the impact has been the most severe, financial, personal, etc. But yes, the most complex ones do tend to be the higher value ones because it's got a broader range of impact factors. Thanks. There we, we heard from uh, Tim Brentnell with regard to the fact that he, his um, conviction was overturned in 2021, three years ago. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's, he did say, by the way, his application was ready to be submitted, so I understand that that might not be the same as, as, as the rest. But for the overturned convictions process, how long do you think clients should be expected to to wait at each stage in the process before they can get compensation? Well, or, or at least get an offer of compensation? I think that if you were following a normal litigation path of disclosure, medical evidence, accountancy evidence, negotiation, at most two years, possibly 18 months, I mean, there's quite a bit of leading time to, to front load the work that's needed. Um, and here, we, we had an agreement with post office to run a number of trial cases that would then input into a set of principles that would then be rolled out to the rest of the claimant group with a view to making the process much simpler. But it's been a very painful journey to get from April 2001 to February 2024. What's, what's the blockages, uh, Mr Hodgell? What's the main blockages from just simply getting compensation into the pockets of the bank accounts of the so postmortem. Well, it's been on the drip drip. So there's initial interim payment, and then the non-pecuniary losses are, are, are typically sorted 
um, following a early neutral evaluation with, with Lord Dyson. So most people have had two or three interim payments, but the, re the, real, the real blocker is the amount of time it takes to nudge any significant progress along the line, so correspondence routinely takes a number of months to elicit a reply. Uh, and ultimately the claimants re uh, retain the sort of nuclear button of issuing High Court proceedings, but these are people that want to issue High Court proceedings for very obvious reasons. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it's like this morning, some of the things that, that we've heard this morning, I, th I think Tim, Tony and other people in the room will be a little bit annoyed and a little bit enraged and all those wounds and scars that haven't yet healed reopen more and more and so it, it's, it all makes the process incredibly difficult and a, one that we have to try and sensitively manage to, to get to the end. Um, and so three years is sounds like an inordinate length of time and it is and it's unacceptable um, but it is it, it's a product of a system that is bureaucratic and uber slow. And are there uh, people who you represent who have actually received compensation uh, and accepted the, the final settlement of uh, financial redress? Um, are, are the majority of them happy with that? Well, I think you've got to look at it in the context of that these are sort of badly scarred people and that uh, nothing is ever enough. Um, but. Um, Adopting established legal principles for some six hundred thousand pounds is more is worth more than the, 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 the sort of amount that they would get if they went through uh, a court process. And for some, it is closure. You know, it's and this is where we get to this whole idea about sort of trying to suck the last penny out against what actually what is that number for somebody to be able to walk away and get on with their lives. So. You know, the sooner we get an offer on the table for the people that are still waiting in the overturn convictions scheme, um, the sooner we can start to bring closure to some of those people. How do you, how do you compensate for a family member who's <coughs> taken their own life to commit a suicide? Um, how, 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 how do you start trying to even compensate for that? It's horrific. It's horrific to hear it, um, and we hear it uh, so many times because those people are, are as proximate to what's gone on as the sub-postmaster um, in some instances and every every case is unique I, I had a, a chap who went to prison and said oh actually I had it a bit easier because my wife had to go out in the community and face the tittle tattle and the problem with that of course is at the minute there is no mechanism for family members to be compensated. The, 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 the nearest you can get to it is, in, in effect, the psychiatric effect of their suffering and how it impacts on the sub-postmaster, but there's a, there's, there's a whole cohort of claimants. In the same way, the, the pre, this is something else that will, will no doubt um, come under the torture scrutiny at some point. And there are other victims from pre-2000, what's classed as the, the capture period that will um, that would need to be looked at, at at some point, but there are very many other victims that sit outside those that are currently compensatable that perhaps in due course ought, ought to come within focus. Just a final final question. Now, there's a whole number, I bet there's hundreds of, of individuals who weren't employed by the post office, weren't employed by the sub postmasters but they were employed, for example, by the news agent where the post office was situated. But the contract uh, with the, the, for example, the news agent stated that any shortfall in the uh, the, 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 the account procedures with Horizon was to be met by themselves. Yeah. And I've met a number of people who were in that, that, that position. What compensation scheme, if any, actually covers these people? Well, I have a tangible example of that myself. That I've, I have someone that was um, employed on that basis, obligated to pay the shortfalls, um, and the, uh, the scheme has turned down the application, even though it's supported by an authority signed by the sub postmaster. So, again, another subclass of um, victims that have no redress. If I may just add on the family member's point very briefly, because we've got the same challenge in the GLA scheme, and I think we, it's absolute lack of clarity over how family members... Um, but that's a perfect example of something that 
uh, we think needs to be approached with a different starting point, not a legalistic starting point where we've got to scrabble around finding case law to justify a third party claim, but actually from a fairness and common sense starting point, which is where <laughs> you were on that. I mean, it's a huge anomaly. Yeah. And it, you would think the government and on all the ministers in, in the room this one at the time who have done a fair and decent job on this uh, will be aware of cases like that's got to be put right hasn't it? And, fun and, and fundamentally though it's not just a monetary issue because the clients need to see an acknowledgement and recognition of that in the, in the way an offer is formulated rather than oh sorry there's no legal basis for that yeah. last question then just on current pace how long do you think it's going to take to see full and final redress for the victims? Um, uh, unacceptab unacceptably long for us and our clients and for everybody else. Give us a bump I up. would say between one and two years. One and two years? Yeah. Okay, Dr Hudshaw. I'm not going to disagree with my learned friend. I'm the same problem. One and two which years. Is, which is wholly unacceptable. Right, so when the bill comes to the House, we're going to have to amend it in order to make sure that there are some hard, legally binding deadlines for redress. Yes, but also the step change, radical change that <coughs> of the type I was referring to before, to make it because the current process, how many deadlines are yeah. put in place, it won't be achievable because of the process. Anything to add? No, just the, just the, just around the fundamental rethinking of it as well. It's it's fine to put a fining system in place, but if it's if all that does is generate offers on time, but those offers are not good enough, yeah. it doesn't create it doesn't solve the problem. Well, look, you, you you've told us that there is a strong case that many of the uh, cases that have actually been settled may need to be reopened. You've told us that many of the claims that you're working on are so problematic you can't accept them. Uh, you've told us that there are significant process delays, that you appear to be employing three times more lawyers uh, than the government on some of these schemes, and that it's going to take one to two years at the current pace to finally bring justice. Thank you very much indeed for laying that out with such clarity. That concludes this panel. Order, order. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 The proceed order, order. Welcome to this panel of the Department of Business and Trade Select Committee inquiry into how we accelerate redress in a way that is faster and fairer for the victims of the biggest miscarriage of justice in British legal history. Um, as the witnesses have been informed in advance, we have a procedure in Parliament by which witnesses take the oath, which we do not use in ordinary circumstances. But given the context for this oral evidence session, we have decided that we will require 
the witnesses on this panel to take the oath today. I remind witnesses that they are obliged to tell the whole truth to this committee and that any failure to do so will be considered as a contempt of Parliament and as a potential perjury. Will the clerk to the committee please administer the oath? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Thank you. I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Reid, have you been dragging your feet in paying redress to the victims of this injustice? No, I don't think we have. I think we've had um, some success in terms of the speed with which we've paid, particularly the HSS scheme. Um, and I know I've heard today um, many comments about the HSS scheme. But in, from our perspective, certainly, we believe we've completed the first tranche, which was the 2,417 of the original applicants to the HSS scheme. Um, and we have made offers to them all, and uh, we have thinks in the region of 62% have already been settled. Um, with the OC, I agree that it's slower than we would want it to be. There's no question about that. Uh, but I'll ask Mr. Rakaldin perhaps to, uh, to bring a bit more colour to that. But it's certainly slower than we would hope. In a moment, I think. The former chairman of the post office has made allegations in public that he received either direct instructions or by a nod and a wink uh, orders in effect to try and slow the process down so that, quote, the Tories could limp into the next election, unquote, minimising financial liabilities. Do you believe that your chairman did receive such a message? I don't believe that to be the case, and I can categorically say that nobody in my team or myself has received any instruction from the government about slowing down compensation. Do you believe the former chairman is lying? Well, I don't believe it's true. Uh, I, I don't believe that that is the case. I think he's misinterpreted or perhaps misunderstood the conversation he had with, with, uh, with Mrs. Mumby. If I look at the data that I provided to him before he had that briefing, uh, at no stage mentioned compensation. It was absolutely a conversation about the long-term future and funding of the post office. And I don't believe that it had anything to do with compensation. He may have been mistaken. Is it possible that the former chairman came away from that conversation, as you've just said, having misinterpreted what was said to I, I don't believe it is. We've had no conversations at all about the mixing of funding between the compensation schemes and the overall funding of the post office, per se. And I don't think that in any way comes through in his notes. I, I have the email from Mr Staunton to you, dated the 6th of January 2023 when he reported to you that um, Ms Mumby had said to him there was no appetite to quote rip off the band-aid, now was not the time for dealing with long-term issues and we needed a plan to quote hobble up to the election. Mr Staunton goes on to say I said the funding issues revolved around poor decisions made many years ago with Horizon and related legal issues. So let me ask again is it possible that the former chairman misinterpreted what the Permanent Secretary told him? It's possible. I mean, you'll have to ask Mr Staunton whether he misinterpreted. I don't believe that to be the case. I, we've been very, very consistent that compensation, as I said, was not mentioned in the briefing that he received uh, before he went to see Ms Mumby. And I think in the, uh, uh, the notes that he has suggested, there's no mention of compensation. So I don't believe that to be the case at all. Did the former chairman relay anything else, either verbally or in any other way, to you following that conversation? Not that I recall. Not that you recall. Do you think there may be? No, I don't. I don't. I, I, I understand where you're, you're, you're going with, with this. In well, I'm looking the for the whole truth. No, no, I understand, completely understand that. And I don't believe, and, I, and I've been quite categoric, that uh, that is the case. So you believe that this email that Mr Staunton sent to you 
is the only communication, the only readout that you had from Mr. Staunton about that I believe conversation. That is the case, yes. Okay. In the um, Secretary of State's letter to me late last week, she points out that she took four months to issue a priorities letter to Mr. Staunton that was dated on the 29th of June, uh, 2023. And in that letter, the Secretary of State says that she told Mr. Staunton to, quote, inject pace into delivering compensation for overturned convictions. Have you had any other instructions to, quote, inject pace into the delivery of the other redress schemes? Instructions. I think we're all acutely conscious that the schemes are not as quick as they need to be and the balance between fairness, redress and managing public money and the level of bureaucracy is not where we'd want it so to be. So how did this letter that was sent to the chairman with these instructions, how did that show up on your desk? How was that translated into targets for you? The, cha the chairman's letter, it, it, it fulfills sort of Oh, well, it's a very specific purpose. We have a quarterly shareholder meeting, which uh, is attended by colleagues from the department and colleagues from UKGI, as well as the chairman myself. And on a quarterly basis, we review, and the start point for that conversation is the priorities letter that the chairman receives on a yearly basis. So it is part of that process. So there was a board level discussion about this priorities letter? As I say, the letter itself is is on a quarterly basis discussed, and so that would have been shared, I'm sure, with, and I can't specifically say, but I'm sure it would have been shared with his board colleagues. I'm sure he would have forwarded to his board colleagues. He certainly sent a copy to me. So there should be four discussions about this. Over four discussions the year. Um, for, at a yearly basis with the shareholder, with UKGI, uh, with myself and the management team, and he and I would attend that shareholder meeting. So the very striking thing about this letter is what it doesn't say. So this letter does not say that the post office is to, quote, inject pace into any of the redress schemes other than the scheme for overturned convictions. So I'm trying to understand where is the written paper trail from a Secretary of State to a Minister to the board of the post office that basically says, speed up. I don't think it's a paper trail per se, but those are conversations that obviously I have on a quarterly basis at the shareholder meeting. They will be conversations that I have uh, on a regular basis with the minister. Where I meet him on a monthly basis and we talk about um, the issues that are going on in the post office. The speeding up of compensation is a conversation that we would have uh, on a monthly basis. So I can't see in the board minutes that you've released to us any discussion about a ministerial instruction to speed up the pace in redress schemes. So I come back to the question, have you had written instructions from the department to speed up the processing of redress schemes? I don't, as I said at the very start, I don't think I've got written instruction, but these are conversations that clearly we would have with the department on a regular basis. I think the committee's pretty surprised that you've not had written instructions to speed up the resolution of redress in one of the biggest miscarriages of justice in British history. <coughs> I think it's, a, it's an absolute given that that is what we are trying to do. We're all acutely conscious. I've said it here in this room uh, with, with, uh, with the department over the, with the uh, well, select committee. Well, you say you're acutely conscious that it's what we're trying to do, but I'm looking at the budget for overall redress of just over a billion, which you set out in your letter to me. Yes. Only 20% of that money has been paid out. 80% of the money hasn't been paid out. So I'm trying to understand how acutely conscious you are of the need to get the money out the door. Very is the, is the short answer. But you've that. had no written ministerial instructions to that effect? Correct. <laughs> Have you had a conversation with the Secretary of State about the need to accelerate redress schemes? No, I haven't. Have you had a conversation with the Minister about yes, the need? Yes, the Minister and I meet on a monthly basis and we discuss this as part of our agenda. So if we are looking for a paper trail of instructions from the Department to you about speeding up the process, would we be able to find that? I think, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think that's going to be that easy to articulate very specifically so it's where it is. It's unlikely. What about the UKGI rep on your board? Has the UKGI rep on your board ever underlined 
the importance of speeding up the redress system? Yes, I, mean, I think she's very clear that the primary objective of the organisation must be to address the underlying issues of compensation, um, as well as supporting the, the inquiry, as well as driving cultural and operational change. I think we're all consistently clear that those are the core drivers of the business. But that's different to an explicit instruction, an explicit pressure on you to speed up what you're doing to pay out redress. Addressing the underlying issues, we all understand, understood. is management speak. What I'm talking about is an explicit instruction. I haven't had an explicit instruction. Right. So the Secretary of State's not had an explicit conversation with you, and nor is the UKGI rep Correct. on the board, but the Minister, thank God, has. Yep. Okay. Are you happy with the pace of the redress schemes to date? No, I'm not. No, and, I, and I've said that on many occasions when I've been here, which is we're very clear that the postmasters who've been in this appalling scandal need closure quickly. And I'm also very clear that in order to modernise and move the post office forward, we need to ensure that redress is completed. And I've said in this forum as well, we can't do that until such time as compensation and redress have been settled for those involved in the scandal. Are, are there any management bonuses that are tied to no. the speed of redress? No, they're not. Are there any incentives on you? No, they're not. So there's no instruction, written instruction to deliver, there's no bonuses, there's no incentives, there is just a general urging of goodwill from the Minister by the sound of it. That's correct. Nodded, for the record. Um, we've heard today from the lawyers that have given us evidence that it may take one to two years to complete the process of providing redress. Do you share that assessment of the timetable? Well, I might ask Mr. Ricaldin to be specific about that. Um, I think you might have a, a view on how long it's going to take. If I may ask Mr. Thank Ricaldin you. to speak to Mr. Ricaldin. Um, thank you, and thank you, Chair. The, um, I, I want to start, if I may, I'm, I'm just very, very conscious that I'm probably quoting a lot of numbers. This is my job. My job in post office is to, to deliver compensation as speedily as possible. Uh, I like numbers. Thank you. Um, I'm grateful. Um, and um, I'm, but what I'm also much more conscious of, behind every number I quote, is a person. And that person has suffered significantly, and not only for the original scandal, but in terms of the journey that we have made them go through to receive their compensation. And, and also the way that journey has been managed. And um, I want to apologise for that. That's my opening statement, if I may. This, this journey of, to get compensation is not good, and it's too bureaucratic, and, it, and we are listening because it needs to be faster. And it, and, 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 and it will be. Thank you. And you're going to tell us what your estimate is of how long it's going to take to complete the process of providing returns. I would also like to, and it is, it is part of the answer to the question, if I, if I may, I would like to um, actually um, talk about Mr Creswell's evidence around the GLO disclosure, if, if I may, because I think he might be doing himself a bit of a disservice, and therefore this might be better news um, for, for the committee. Because, Why don't um, you start with your estimate for how long it's going to take to provide redress, and I then think, we'll unpack it? Because I, I think this, this will we, we improve, that, improve that evidence. But I have, in terms of um, my estimate of, of, of the, I have two, two schemes, the HSS um, scheme. Now, the, of course, the closure of that date was, was potentially looming until, until the excellent ITV series, when we've had over 1,000 new claims in, which I think is fantastic, by the way because my job is to pay out fair, fair compensation. So for you to now to ask me to put a time scale on that is going to be challenging because I, I'd already dealt with 2,500 claims and I've made the offers in 2,500 claims and we we're going through the process of resolving any disputes in that. And therefore I, I had a trajectory for those towards the end of this year um, and, and uh, March next year to close all those down. Now, with another 1,000 cases in there, I have to reassess that plan. I'm sure you understand that in terms of how I deliver those. In terms of late applications in the HSS scheme, which were received by the end of September, I'll deliver 95% of those offers by the end of March next year. Okay, but then I've got the new claims coming in, and I think it's very reasonable and sensible for, for bodies like this to challenge me and put a time scale on those. And I believe that we, we will put in a target on those of how, we, how quickly we'll turn those around. And I see no reason why we can't replicate what they've got in the GLO scheme. On so those. the initial time frame for the HSS scheme was March next year, but now it's going to take a bit longer because you've just got a load of new claims. Correct. Okay. What about the GLO scheme? 
The GAO scheme, my only responsibility is disclosure. Okay, but what's your guess? Okay. I mean, I'm, we've, I'm, just, we've just heard the... Okay, let me put the question this way. I'm not going to guess. We've just heard 45% of the disclosures have not been made. When will those disclosures be made? And, and that's what I tried to start to answer, um, Chairman. The, um, because of the excellent idea of putting £75,000 um, as a minimum payment in the GLO scheme, the knock-on effect of that is less disclosure has to be made. So in my work stack of disclosure, I can now take some of those out, which makes that 55% more. And what we'll find, and, and I'm happy to share this when we've actually done the numbers, um, not when I get back to the office, I'm happy to share that with, with the select You haven't brought those numbers here. That, well, because 55% was last week, and now, now uh, Fries and um, DBT have supplied us. In your work stack, Mr. Rakeldin, we don't need disclosure on these cases. Mm -hmm. So I can now discount those, and I believe I believe now that that 55% is actually nearer 64%. 64. Which 64%, which will hopefully help in in terms of the minister's ambition to deliver this uh, office out by the 7th of August. Okay. So for the remaining cases, any view about how long it will take so to issue disclosures? Be, because we've now reduced the numbers of disclosures required. Mm -hmm. My original plan that was set for July to complete disclosures right, will now move to the left. Mm -hmm. I don't know by how long because I'm redoing that plan as we speak. It's live because we've only just been told how many of that cohort will be taken out by the excellent idea about £75,000. Are we likely to have the GLO scheme concluded then by early August? In terms of disclosure? No, in terms of all done and done. You'll have to ask the, the government and, 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 and Well, Chris. I did and they were unclear. I am responsible for disclosure. I'll absolutely provide disclosure in a timely fashion as, as I've laid out. Okay. Mr. Pawson. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Reid, you appeared before the committee on the 20th of June and you were challenged at that time by the, the Chairman about the overpayment of bonuses to board members. Um, can we take it that that matter has been entirely dealt with now? It has. It has. Okay. Uh, and in your evidence then, you mentioned on many occasions about that uh, you were unable to move on as a post office until such time as we have addressed the issues of the past. So Correct. the chairman has challenged you about written instructions yep. from the ministers or from the department, but as a management team, yes. you've got your own imperative uh, to get this business sorted, and yet we still hear there are two years to do that. Why, why is it taking so long? It's immensely frustrating, and I agree with you, and it's um, stressful and distressing for those victims as well. Um, clearly, it's extraordinarily complex. I think Mr. Ricardo has just, just pointed out we've had 3,560 uh, claimants who've come forward, applicants, and now we've had an additional um, tranche that have come forward as a consequence of the as a consequence of the uh, of the drama. So it is difficult. There's no question about that. There are multiple schemes. There's no question that is complicated. And I'm very, very acutely aware that there is an issue of trust associated with the post office. And we have to inject into the schemes some independence to give people some confidence that actually this process is independent and independently managed so that this level of trust can in some way be mitigated. That's the reason it's taking occurred so long. Since you gave evidence. Say again, sorry. Eight months have occurred since you gave evidence yes. to the committee. And as far as we can see, not a great deal has happened apart from a TV documentary. Well, I, I would challenge that. I think we finished the HSS scheme. We've obviously started the ACC. I think the Secretary of State introduction uh, in the autumn of the £600,000 um, option for overtime convictions, as well as today. I think there are there is movement. and. <laughs> Um, I, would, uh, I would challenge your view that nothing has happened right. since then. And addressing the issues of the past is also about the relationship between uh, the post office and postmasters. Existing you, postmasters or...? Well, existing and, and former postmasters. Right. But we heard evidence, uh, and you were in the room at the time, uh, where there still remains what I would describe as a, a toxic culture, uh, a, a complete lack of trust, institutional mistrust between the organisation and postmasters. What are you doing to address that? Um, I was disappointed to hear that, no, 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 no question about that. And I think I would probably point to a data point, which would be we do an annual survey in the autumn with our postmasters. And 
The scores around support and rebuilding the relationship have improved markedly as a consequence uh, of the work that we've been doing uh, in the organisation itself. Um, examples of the type of activity that we have done, we've obviously introduced new field teams to support postmasters, we've introduced new schemes to support existing postmasters who are uh, who are going through difficulties in their branches. We have new engagement and communication processes with our postmasters. We've got two postmasters on the board, as you're aware. We have a new uh, postmaster director. And indeed, in terms of culturally, in terms of my central teams, um, every single senior leader has an area that they go out to now on a quarterly basis. We have uh, a situation where uh, we have a week in the life of a postmaster that every single employee must go through training to understand. We're about to introduce more training around the inquiry and around compensation. So we are working hard to change internally uh, perceptions, and certainly perceptions that have, uh, have been in this room today, uh, that turn to try and change that perception. And are you satisfied that the postmasters who have suffered harm are going to be uh, uh, appropriately compensated for the, for the harm they've gone through. We heard some pretty harrowing, harrowing experiences uh, just now. Um, are you confident that that's going to be dealt with? I, be, I believe it will, and we're very, very clear, certainly within the administration of the schemes, which Mr Ocaldin looks after, and uh, Mr Tiswell oversees as well, uh, we're very clear that we need to inject independence to give people trust and belief that actually they are getting a fair deal. Now, the reality is that always people are going to be frustrated um, and that's something that we are deeply concerned about and therefore the evidential bar we believe that we are continuing to try and lower so that people can and will do um, put their claims in and, uh, and ensure that they get the like, right the level of compensation. The things that we heard from the former postmasters is that many of them simply want closure, they want rid uh, of, of this horrible period Agreed. of their lives. Do you accept that many have accepted less than they're entitled to in order to just make this problem go away? It must be possible. Uh, I, I agree with you, Mr Pawsey. I've met with many of the victims. Uh, myself and Mr Ocaldin do this regularly and have done, and it's very harrowing. We understand the trauma that people are experiencing. We do understand uh, the difficulties that many, many of our victims have gone through, and that is very, very challenging. And how might those people be more accurately compensated, Mr Reid? What, those who have well, those who have accepted less than they're entitled. To. We're very keen and have had this conversation with government around an appeals process. We are we recognise that that is that certainly when we initiated the scheme at the very start, there may well have been uh, bureaucratic delays and problems with the scheme, and so we do want to have an appeals process. We do think that is the right way to go through, to go for. Thanks, Jim. I'm just looking at some of the statistics, and please correct me if I've got these wrong. I think in your letter to me of the 5th of February, you said the budget for the HSS scheme is 233 million. The public stats are that about 98 million has been paid out. That's only just over 40% of the budget. This is the historical shortfall scheme? Yeah. Yeah, just about 100 million has been paid out. Um, on the, uh, the GLO scheme, I don't think we know what the budget is. It's certainly not disclosed. Uh, about 127 million has been paid out. On the overturned conviction scheme, 35 million has been paid out. That's 4% of the 780 million budget. If we put these numbers together and we compare it to the 1.2 billion that you wrote to me about earlier in the year, the best case scenario is that perhaps 40% of the budget for redress has been paid out. Correct. You can't be satisfied not, with that level. No, I'm not satisfied with that. And, and I think uh, that the, the core driver is the number of uh, overturned conviction victims who ha are, have not come forward, who we anticipated would come forward, but have not come forward. And that is at the root of the stats that you've just described. And what is the position on the pre-horizon cases, the capture cases? Are you anticipating further claims to come from problems with the capture system? Um, I'll let Mr Cowden go into the detail of this. We're very thankful for um, Kevin James coming forward with his um, eight particular victims of the capture system. We've obviously spent the last five weeks working hard on it, but I think Mr Ricalden will give you some detail and some numbers behind what we think we've discovered that occurred between 1992 and the launch of the Horizon system. 
um, and the number of individuals who may well have been involved in capture. It's still it's still a work in progress, but we will give you a very clear uh, breakdown of those numbers, and it's it, it's in excess of a thousand. Thank you, Chair. Um, I uh, concur with um, um, uh, Nick Reed's um, commentary about Kevin Jones. I'd like to put on record my, my thanks, our thanks to Kevin Jones for bringing this matter to our, our attention. Um, this, um, there are eight cases that we have been brought to our attention that um, are, are alleged, alleged um, issues with this capture system. Um, and more concerning in there is there is evidence from, from the individuals that four of those eight actually included convictions. Now that helps us in our investigations because we can go to those courts and try and find some, some ev evidence around it. This is stuff that happened 30 years ago okay, and the records are very, very, very thin. So we are doing that. We've mandated our lawyers, our criminal lawyers, in order to go and find some evidence and some, some, some dis disclosure on these cases. We know from our records that, we th that the capture system, it was a floppy disk effectively. It wasn't networked, so it wasn't connected or anything. It was a glorified spreadsheet. That, that helped postmasters settle every, every week, um, and, it, and it did that job. We also recognised that there were there were issues with it because we've seen correspondence. Again, thankfully grateful to, to Kevin Jones MP for the supply of this. There's evidence the post office wrote out to postmasters who used it to say, by the way, we got that coding a bit wrong, um, so and, and therefore there, there might be an issue. Please reboot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are errors in the system. We so, so there may that. be further cases that emerge. There may be. So we, this is where we're in the investigatory stage, and it's important that we know the facts uh, around this, and, and we're, we're, we're well into that, and we will conclude. So we haven't concluded yet whether there's any detriment, but obviously yeah. if any detriment has occurred as a result of capture, then obviously we need to do the And right you're thing. happy to update the committee with your Absolutely. discoveries. Okay, thank you. Um, when people apply to the um, uh, Horizon Shortfall Scheme, they obviously don't know what information you know. So in a sense, they're applying blindfold. Do you think that is a problem? Do I think that's a problem? Um, our evidential bar is deliberately very, very low on this. So what that means is basically, if the postmaster says something happened, it, it happened. Now, do we look for evidence? Yes, we do look for evidence. But if we can't find evidence, we take the evidence as their statement. That's pretty, that's pretty clear in terms of our principles. Okay. Um, and you ask people to fill in this 14-page form, which I've read, which is very complicated. You've read this form? Yes. Do you think it is simple enough? No. What are you planning to do to simplify it? So, and this is very much part of our proposal um, that we pulled together. I think there are a number of issues, if I may, um, with, with the ACE. I think, firstly, is the, is the clumsiness and the bureaucratic and the legalese in, in that ap application form, and in particular at the time it was issued. And, and if you think about the age profile of the people it was also issued to as, as well, I think there are some challenges around that. People had to print things off and sign things and rescan them and send them back. I think that process can be challenged. I think it should be challenged. I think there is, um, Mr. Hudgel has, has, has already put this very, very well around the fact that um, legal representation um, is, is only offered at the point of offer as opposed to, to help fill in, that, fill in that form. What does that mean in terms of fair compensation? Don't know, don't know what that means. And, and Sir Wynne has picked up, and the inquiry has picked that up as well. I th also think there's an issue potentially around the issue of consequential loss um, guidance um, after the issuance of the scheme. So a number of things that it's right to look at and challenge. And at the end of the 2,417 originally cohort, it's right to assure what you've done. And that's exactly what post office have done. I mean, that's quite a self-critique. When did these revelations dawn on you? So these so, so because we're listening. We are listening to people like you. We are listening to the advisory board. We're listening to the minister. We're listening to the postmasters. And, and therefore, based on those issues, they, we, are, we are recommending back that there should be an appeals process around this, and, and the advisory board are supportive of that. This is uh, an example of, a, of an offer letter, and it's got a, a box on page two uh, that sets out a, quite a simple table, which are the different heads of loss. If somebody is presented with these numbers, I don't think there's any real explanation of how those numbers were arrived at. Do you think that's fair? 
Um, well, I think they, uh, if they receive an offer letter, then they're absolutely entitled to uh, appropriate legal advice. And by the way, it's not limited to £1,200. It's, it's reasonable legal fees, by the way. Um, and I think they're absolutely right. What's to the cap on reasonable legal fees? There is, there is, whatever is reasonable. It's, it's not £1,200. It's not £1,200. It was £1,200, and because we're listening, that changed. When did that change, Mr? Um, forgive me, I can't recall, but I'm happy to provide that. Was but it, it has changed. this year, last year? Uh, certainly since I've, since, since I've been at the post office, which was from 2022. Mr McDonald, did you want well, to just it, interrogate that? that? Point, I mean, you know, let's get this right, because we've had evidence that it was £1,200. That was the piece. You know, we need to be, have clarity here. We can't, we can't, we can't have it say so, so it, it was £1,200. £1, and we made it very clear that we changed it to reasonable fees. And, it's, and, it, and we've put it on the website and we've communicated but, that. But on the issue of the low bar, if I may, Chair, Please. The, 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 yes. that, you've introduced that as a, as a concept. We've heard evidence from witness after witness to say that there's anything other than a low bar. You had one of our postmasters who was a, 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 allegedly had used monies to pay off a mortgage that the post office had quite invented. Yeah. Uh, how is that a, t a chain in the law bar? Or to provide, that we heard from Ms. Uh, Dr. Hudgel, that there are self evident issues. If this has happened to you, your reputation is down the toilet. You, know, you don't need to have that bottomed Stigma. out. You Stigma. know that that's happened. Yeah. How is that consistent with you yeah. telling this committee that there is a low bar? Yeah. And I'm very, very sorry to hear that fe feedback. And, and we, we are listening. What I would say, and this is not defensive, this is, please do not take this as defensive. It's not meant to be. It's a process. And the, and the, and the, and the process might be wrong. But all these decisions in HSS have been made by an independent panel so the point around causation of bankruptcy, that is not a post office decision. That decision has been made by an independent panel of KCs looking at what they have been presented. And I encourage Mr Hudgel to, to, to bring whatever he can, including witness statements, for panel to reconsider that position. This well, is an independent you, panel would, made would the call. You, would, would you mind at your convenience letting the committee know when this cap on legal aid was taken off? Because of course. I haven't heard any sub postmasters uh, that are aware of it. What I have heard is sub postmasters tell me that they're fighting against Herbert Smith Greenhill, one of the biggest law firms in the country, in an inequality of arms that they are unlikely to win. Now, this raises the question that um, if we look at claims that were settled between 2020 and 2022, yeah. I think at that stage it wasn't clear that people could take 80% of the offer and continue to... That, that, is, correct, yeah. that is does, correct, That is correct. Does that mean that claims settled between 2020 and 2022 need to be re-examined? Well, if, if they're settled, then they... If, well, because they settled, because yes. often they couldn't afford to fight on. Oh, Obviously, I see, I see. since then, I see, I they see. were able to take 80% of the claim in order to That's put food on the very table. Good, very good reason why there should be an appeals process, correct. Right, so we may need to relook at these claims. Correct. If they feel they have an effect, because they have settled, if they feel, some of them with legal advisors, most of them without, if they feel they have not had a fair outcome, absolutely, our recommendation, which the, which the advisory board have made to the minister, um, and the minister recognised that in the House the other day, then uh, it's uh, for an appeals process. At the moment, there's no standard tariff for calculating things like reputational damage or distress and inconvenience. This makes it very difficult yeah. for sub postmasters to put a claim together. Yeah. How are we going to resolve that? Are you able to publish some kind of standard tariff or a guide to how yeah. people can actually construct the right and, number to apply for? And, and, and we, we rely on the expertise because this is principle based. That we, we actually, the, it's, all, it's all built on principles. And actually the people who make these calls are people who do make these decisions all the time. These are eminent KCs but on the, the people independent panel. Applying are not eminent KCs, correct, and therefore they need a standard tariff to understand what they should be applying for. Um, I, I, I would. That's fine, and I understand that. What we don't want is a, ta a tariff to be restrictive, in any way. No, but a tariff, nonetheless, would help people get their claim numbers in the right place, would it not? Correct. And did you say it would? So yes, 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 it would. Okay. It would. So if it would, will you undertake to produce one? I can. Thank you very much indeed. Have you been told at any stage by anybody 
to try and bear down on the value of claims? Never. Thank you. Mr Gulls. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Mr Reid, do you believe you've changed the culture of the post office since taking on, since taking on the role? I think we've made a lot of progress, and there's plenty still to do. Because you'd have heard from the witnesses earlier that the post office is still the post office. It wasn't said in a flattery term. No, it wasn't. And the chair actually in the House yesterday quoted from board minutes of March 2023, which said, board members lamented that the board was tired and constantly distracted by historical issues and short-term crises. It doesn't really sound like the board's learned the lessons of the past, does it? I think... The specific point that was being uh, referenced there in that in that minute was the board were keen to get the right balance between the strategic direction of the business and compensation as well. We had 64 board meetings in 2022, which is why the business, I think perhaps the comment around tiredness might well have come in. With the greatest respect, Mr. 64 board meetings doesn't make up for people who spent seven months in prison, doesn't make up for of years it, where one of our previous, uh, previous uh, Mr. Downey, I think I've got his surname correctly, yeah. has literally had to flee the country in order to protect his family as well as himself, has then come back to seek a claim to then have some bogus, as Mr. McDonald's pointed out, £100,000 mortgage payment, which means Someone must have got that figure from somewhere, so is the post office investigating someone who's now putting in a claim? That's a question I would have. And if so, where's this figure and idea come from? It seems either mythical, made up, or someone's trying to dig up something on dirt, on people that ultimately have already been victims of this process. This does not scream, saying you're tired. I don't care if it's 64 board meetings. I suspect it would have been 364 board meetings in a year. Maybe give yourself Christmas Day off as a treat in order to actually come up to getting answers to these people who have suffered more than they should have and are still waiting, as the chair's pointed out, for some form of redress, which is absolutely, by the way, what we should all be calling it for now and no longer compensation, as Mr Bates rightly pointed out. Henry Staunton, obviously the former post office chair, said that the management culture of the post office, these are his words, mess, toxic and mistrustful of sub-postmasters. Were his remarks accurate in that regard? No, I don't believe they are. And why do you disagree with him on this point? Because I think we've made a lot of progress, in the, in, certainly since 2019, um, to try and change the culture of the organisation. Uh, don't get me wrong, this is a scandal that's gone on for 25 years. There was an enormous amount to change, and it won't be changed overnight. But we've made progress, and we've made progress because postmasters have told us we've made progress, existing postmasters in the network today. Um, and I think we've made progress, as can be seen from the performance of the network and our postmasters during the crisis um, of, of COVID. And Indeed, as we've come out of that as well, I think there's no question about the post office and its role in the infrastructure of our country. No question at all. On mistrust, you were advised by an external legal advisor, Nick Vamos, that the vast majority of convicted people are, among other things, quote, guilty as charged and were, quote again, safely convicted. Why did he write this letter to you? Why did he write this letter yeah. to you? We did, a, we did a number of things 18 months ago when we realised that, and it's important that I set the record straight here, 18 months ago we were struggling to understand why postmasters weren't coming forward. We had a trace system, we'd, we'd involved the CCRC, we'd written out to postmasters, we'd expressed a real desire for people to come forward. And 18 months ago we asked Peters and Peters and two eminent KCs to do a desktop exercise and say, is there any way that we can proactively and preemptively go out to, to victims and say, do you know what, we're not going to stand in your way, we're going to ensure that your conviction is overturned, we do not need to stand in the way. I think you'd appreciate, the, Mr Reid, that the reason the, people mistrust the post office is because they've been privately convicted, they've had obviously spurious claims made against them of where money's gone. They themselves have funded the shortfalls in many cases, leading them to bankruptcy. And then the post office themselves have then admitted to losing the money, as you confessed the last time you were before us, since 2005. We don't know where that money's gone. Could well have gone towards bonuses of board executives. And then, on top of that, the, the idea that people are having to spend years fighting to get convictions overturned, and then years to get the paperwork in process, as the chair's pointed out, through some of these forms. I don't blame people for not coming forward. Because when I read letters like this, where Nick Vamos is writing to you saying, guilty as charged and then let's go to your letter 
to the Secretary of State for Justice, the Lord Chancellor, Alex Chalk, where you've called for, uh, drawing the attention to what you call a significant, that's a direct quote, number of prosecutions that, quote, raises acute political, judicial and communication challenges against bypassing the normal appeals process. It feels like, reading that letter, you're lobbying the government, and I'm happy for you to correct the record wrong, yep. you're lobbying the government to not go through with this uh, not at all. legislation in order to give people, not at all. Uh, give, get rid of convictions, because I can't read that letter any other way. I'd be interested to get Mr McDonald because I'm not a legal expert, I'm sure Mr McDonald's got an opinion on it as well, but why on earth, if that's not your intention, I'm sure you're about to lay out, would you send this letter to the Lord Chancellor? I have an obligation uh, to ensure that when decisions are being made by the government, they're being made with the full information, and that is the full information that we have, the evidence that we have, and the work that we've done. Mr Vamos was very clear, I'm not a lawyer, but I could see that this was of significant note, and it was important that the Ministry of Justice had that information. I was very clear in that letter, and you can read the letter, I was very clear that we are making no value judgments here, and I've been very clear when I've been here. I want people to get through this process, and if mass exoneration is the right thing, then let's make sure that we get the right legislation in place to deliver mass exoneration. And it's no. They just sent it to you off their own back. It did. It was unsolicited. It came it just from, arrived from in the post from, it did. one day. It did. And okay. Mr. Vamos, uh, I know, is quite happy to come and explain that, to write to the department as to why he did that. But as so, I say. But in, your, but in your letter, why did you say we would be bound to oppose an appeal? Because in the Hamilton judgment, we have an obligation to the courts not to concede unless the Hamilton principles are involved in it. Mr. Tiswell is better placed as a lawyer to explain the detail, but I'm, it's very clear that that is an obligation that we have. And when this letter arrived, I'm very, also very clear that it is of significance, and it was important, therefore, that the Ministry of Justice were aware of that. So you wrote. But if I if I go back, if I if I may, Mr. Van, if I if I go back, we shared this information with the advisory board uh, back in July and again in September, and with the department. So this is not sort of new information that's just emerged. No, I think um, people are yeah. surprised by the way you put it. I see. Okay, I understand. But your answer uh, to us today is that you were following a court-sanctioned judgment when you said we are bound to oppose yes. the appeal. Mr. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Tidswell, we heard from Mr. Cresswell earlier on that you had made a phone call to him about Henry Staunton as chair, and that allegedly in that phone conversation, I'll let you clarify the record, you had said that there were board members willing to go if Mr. Staunton remained in place. Is that an accurate representation of the phone call that you had with Mr. Cresswell? Yes, it is. I, I spoke with Mr. Cresswell and I explained to him <coughs> excuse me, concerns uh, that I had heard from board members and from senior executives about Mr uh, Staunton's behaviour and um, uh, I passed that information on to him as, as the senior independent director of the company. And so you'd understand that there would be hard to understand how the post office culture has changed if its chairman <coughs> is engaging in such behaviour that you have felt the need to contact Mr Cresswell to say board members on the verge of quitting if Mr Staunton remains in his position as chair? Well, I think it's the other way around. I think <coughs> I completely disagree with that. I think it's the other way around, which is that um, if somebody, no matter how senior they are, is misbehaving uh, or not behaving in a way that's consistent with their role, then um, that will be dealt with. And the post office is big enough to be able to deal with that. It's highly unfortunate. And, and it causes, I'm sure, um, an enormous amount of concern to all of you and everybody who watches the post office and wants to see it succeed or at least do what it should be doing. So I'm, I'm acutely conscious of that. But there's been no doubt that when there were circumstances in which a very senior individual was doing something they should not have been doing, the system worked and that information was conveyed as it should have been done. Are you able to give details as to what the allegations were against Mr Staunton or is there no, currently some investigation the, 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 No, no. Well, the, well, as you heard from Mr Creswell, there is an investigation underway and I'm not going to comment on that because it is a confidential investigation. But I can tell you what I told Mr Cresswell, which was what he told you. There were uh, a number of concerns, the most significant of which were that um, Mr Staunton was obstructing uh, investigations and particularly the investigation into him, whistleblowing investigation into him, and he had taken steps to circumvent the shareholders position in relation to uh, the appointment of my replacement. And then final question for me, Chair, Mr Reid. 
You said you've been meeting with, alongside Mr. Recalden, a number of victims. Do you have a specific number of how many you've met to date so far? Um, I think it's 33 that I've met. I think Mr. Recalden's met more like 50. 49. 49. 49. And how regularly are those meetings taking place, or how often are you sending out invitations to come meet yourselves? We've been very clear that um, we are open for any victim to come forward and to meet us, and we've done that, and we've said that consistently over the last 18 months. And the number of individuals I've met across... I've been to Scotland, to Ireland, Wales, all over the country to meet individuals. Even in this building, I've met uh, victims as well uh, on a one-to-one -one basis uh, with Mr. Ricaldin. Uh, so it is something that I extend. And I'm very, very keen that my leadership team and members of the board also do that because it's important that people understand the trauma that people have gone through and what have they have experienced because I think that will make us a better business culturally and a better business to understand the postmasters and the trauma. Thank you. Um, you wrote in your letter to me earlier this year that improvements have been made in the culture, but reading the emails that we released yesterday, um, I saw Mr Staunton's email included a view expressed by one of the um, some postmasters on the board uh, that the views expressed by Richard Taylor and previously by management and even members of the board still persisted. Uh, that those postmasters who hadn't come forward to be exonerated were guilty as charged. Quotes, it's a view deep in the culture of the organisation uh, that postmasters are not to be trusted. It doesn't sound like the culture has been improved in quite the way this committee would hope. Um, that's a very disappointing email. There's no question that the release of that documentation was deeply troubling to all of us. We met as a board last week. Wednesday, and uh, the individuals involved in that email refuted the characterization and the way that it was written, uh, which was um, pleasing to hear. Notwithstanding that, we know we've got a lot more to do. We know there's a lot more that we need to do as an organization to, uh, to improve. But one of the things that I'm very clear about is there must be opportunity for members in the board to have disagreements. Uh, that's why we have invited postmaster directors onto the board to challenge us and to make sure that we make the right calls to postmasters, that operationally we're doing the right things, and that can be uncomfortable. And I was very acutely aware that when I suggested to the Secretary of State that we do have postmasters on the board, it would, be it would, it would inject discomfort. And the reason we do that is because clearly we needed to get the board and the business closer to the operation and to what postmasters. But it's prima facie evidence that the culture is not yet in the right place. Well, I, as I say, I think it's work in progress. We've been very clear it's work in progress, and um, it is deeply worrying and distressing that you know we are not making the speed of progress that we would like to. However, as I say, at the board we were united in our purpose last Wednesday. Um, the board members that uh, were on the call, all the board members that were on the call, were very clear. Uh, that we have a direction of travel and we're going in the right direction. So the cultural problem is work in progress, not job done. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mr Lavery. Who was the untouchables, Mr Reid? It's not an expression that I am aware is used in the organisation, not an expression that I recall using. Um, I think there is a misunderstanding in the way that that expression has been used. Um, we would talk, it's referred to as 40 uh, untouchables. I'm very, very, very clear that we have done two pieces of work. One, where we've been through uh, all the past roles in the organization for the last 30 years, and we've identified that there are five individuals who have investigator or investigating manager in their job title. None of those individuals are involved in any activity to do with investigation today. Um, we've also, and I think this is where the 40 number uh, it comes up, is that we have 43 cases that have been uh, opened up as a consequence of the meetings that Mr. Ricaldin and I have done with former postmasters, identifying where there are names that have come up in those private meetings, and also from the human impact evidence that we've heard in the public inquiry. And we are looking into those 43 cases. That's not 43 people, that's 43 cases. So this notion of untouchables is not an expression that is used in our organisation, so I don't know where it comes from. You recognise the term untouchables and recognise where it comes from. Just to explain that, because other people have got a different view. Um, 
They call the untouchables due to the power they wield, due to their aggressive uh, nature, the fact that they act like mafia gangsters. That's not my words, it's words of Sir Postmasters at the Sir Wayne Inquiry. It's been stated that they operate under a dire culture that still considered that the wrongly convicted postmasters were guilty and undertake. You know, to be quite honest, this this reads like a badly scripted gangster movie that you've got a group of investigators turning up at uh, post offices and basically wielding so much power and frightening the wits. Well, let me... Let oh, me hang on, hang on, hang on. Frighten the wits of the individual... Uh, sub postmasters, postmasters, employees, closing them down at a wheel, calling them everything, causing people like we've heard this morning to actually leave the country uh, and leave the place of employment where they've lived um, and not to return. Well, that's not happening today. We've not investigated no, not, or prosecuted not, anybody since 2015. Happen. This may well have happened in the past, and the reason that we are acting on the cases that have come up in the human impact evidence gathering in the inquiry and the names that come to Mr. Acaldin and I when we meet individually with people is that we want to build an evidence to make sure that no one, no one is above the law in the post office, and that's from the top to the bottom, and we will do that. The only way that we can regain any form of trust is to be totally transparent and absolutely clear that no one is above the law, and that is absolutely the case. Do you believe that? At the time that they actually acted in the yes, I've heard those stories, and, and I've heard those narratives, and I've heard very, very traumatic <coughs> descriptions from individuals that we have met, that Mr. Acaldin and I have met, um, harrowing stories. And is there, is there um, any... so I do believe that is the case, and I do believe that where there are individuals, we are investigating them. However, what I also want to be really clear about is. We don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. We don't want to just prejudge people in the way that clearly happened to postmasters historically. And we will go through due process. If there are individuals who have been involved in activity that is either aggressive or that has been unacceptable, then we will, we will explore that. And that's what we're doing with the 43 cases. Are there any original investigators uh, from that time still active in investigating current postmasters? We, we, as I say, we have five individuals who were investigators or had investigation manager in their job titles are still in the organisation. Um, I'm not going to describe what process we are doing, but we are looking into allegations that have been made against those, so there are investigations that are ongoing as a consequence of the 43 casework that I described to you just a second ago. Just for clarity, people who have been categorised by sub postmasters as mafia gangsters um, are in investigation. Are, are, are still, whether they're un, un, under investigation, that's not the point. They're still employed by the post office um, making investigations no. in the current post no. office. No. So that's not no, the case. No, not the case. So none of them's employed? Not in investigative roles at all. So then, what, uh, there so, are five so, people, as I say, there are five just, individuals. Just, just tell me, tell me, instead of me trying to quiz you, are yeah. they working for the post mm -hmm. office? We have five people working for the post office who were involved in who have investigation and investigation well, you know, manager. That for? That's what I'm saying. That's what I just said. It's not funny. You're trying to hide it. Man. Say again. Why are they still employed? Because these are individuals that have come up during the human impact sessions or during meetings that Mr. McCaldin and I have had with victims. And so, to ensure that we have due process we will investigate these individuals and people know that investigations take time. We want to assess the allegations. We've been out to individuals that Simon Rakaldin and I spoke to and have asked them the question. We've followed up and that's what we're doing at the moment and we will go through a due process and I will ensure that people have the right to reply and that is important and I want to make sure that we have a proper process. Okay. Is the Horizon data still being used to support new prosecutions? We're not prosecuting anybody. We've not prosecuted anybody in the, in the post office since 2015. On the, the, the Project Pineapple email exchange, I'm sure you know Yes. That. You understand that. I understand that. Uh, one known executive director talked about so-called path clearing, path clearing efforts in the post office to settle new financial discrepancies, which have, and I to quote uh, him, echoes of the past 
and the responsibility of a man who constantly reinforces the mantra of all poor smashers on the basis that are on the take. You know what this refers to? Path clearing is an exercise that we will need to, uh, or it's colloquially referred to as path clearing, which is when we move off the horizon platform in one, two, three years' time, whenever that moment is, we will have to go branch by branch uh, and post office by post office to ensure that actually we manage to migrate from one system to the other. And the path clearing exercise is how are we going to go into the branches to make sure that they are fit and ready to accept the new horizon system. So I'm not sure what he was aiming at with that comment. It hasn't started. It hasn't even been planned. We don't have a delivery mechanism yet in place. But the colloquial term is that we will need to ensure that everybody is fit for purpose, ready to go, branches ready, and that's what path clearing is. How do we help postmasters? How do we support postmasters to be ready to accept the new system when we migrate away from Horizon? Mr. Reid, Mr. Ricalton, Mr. Oldnell, and Mr. Tiswell, are you untouchable? The answer is, I can speak to that. The answer is absolutely not. If, if people are not complying with their duties, then, then they're accountable. And you see that most clearly with the departed chairman. And, and I certainly um, expect everybody in the organisation to be accountable. And, and at the moment, um, in the absence of a chairman, I suppose I lead the board, but I can absolutely tell you every member of the board believes that as well. I would echo that point. I expect to be held to account in my role by my leadership team, and absolutely. I can echo that, and I can tell you that I am challenged regularly, and I am very touchable. So am I. <laughs> Didn't seem too convinced there, my <laughs> Can I just um, check something, Mr. Reid? So you wrote to me on the 23rd of February to say you do not recognise the 40 investigators' remark, um, but I'm looking at the email from Elliot Jacobs, Wednesday, January 24th, uh, that says... The culture that PMs are guilty and on the take is embedded in this company. And whilst we continue to employ 40 plus people who ensured innocent people were found guilty and who continue to believe that mantra, this will never change. I'm trying to understand why you it's don't inaccurate. recognize it's inaccurate. the 40, but Elliot Jacobs, who sits on your board or did sit on your board, he did. does. It's inaccurate. It's not true. Elliot Jacobs is wrong. Yeah, he's wrong. He was wrong. He was wrong. But you said you don't recognise that remark, but it's clearly common currency amongst board directors. Well, but between Mr Jacobs and Mr Staunton, clearly it is. But that's not current currency in our business. In our business common currency would be people would be talking about it. It's not common currency. Okay. Mr McDonald. Yeah, just, you know, just wind back a little bit to <coughs> the um, Nick Vamos. Yes. Just, just for the record, uh, Mr. Reed, um, did you take it upon yourself to write to the Lord Chancellor? Yes. Um, and did you challenge that view that he expressed, that Nick Vamos had expressed in that letter? Did you subject it to any challenging uh, challenge process? No, I didn't challenge his process. I, I, I recognised that it was a letter of significance. Um, I'm not a lawyer, as I say. I, I spoke with my corporate affairs team, and they felt that it was something that we needed to uh, release, and that is what we did. Um, but as I say, I'm under no illusions um, that... You, you, so you talked to your corporate affairs team. Did, did you talk to the board? Did you mention No, to I the didn't board? mention to the board. I don't mention everything, all the decisions that I make to, goodness, to the board. That's a pretty significant uh, intervention, not to mention to the board. I mean, it's a matter of judgment, and clearly as the group chief executive, I didn't believe it was the case that I, I needed to do that. Something I wasn't I wasn't drawing any conclusions as a consequence of this. I've been very clear that we were releasing this information because we had done to the advisory board, we had done to the government back in September. This is not new news. Uh, it's not news. Mm. It, it's a bomb's gone off, and you're not talking to your board about it. We that. have an obligation, and that obligation from, from a legal perspective is why it was important for us to release that information. We're making made judgments about it, no valid judgments about it. Thank you, Chair. Julie Martin. Oh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to go back to Mr Tidswell. In the first session, I had an exchange with Mr Cresswell, and I just wanted to uh, make sure you've had an opportunity to comment on that. Um, Mr Cresswell said to me that he'd never heard anything like the allegations made to me by Ben Tidswell about the Chairman. Now, they included, as you've mentioned to my colleague, Mr Gullis, 
about silencing a whistleblower, um, bypassing potentially a board appointment process. Um, Mr Cresswell also mentioned something that I think may be relevant for our next session as well in terms of interpreting the meanings of various memos and conversations that, that the chairman, the former chairman had. Mr Cresswell said some aspects of the chair's performance in terms of his grip on his brief and whether he was alert at meetings, that was also a concern that had been passed to him. Is that a concern that you raised and that you could expand on? It's not, that is not a concern I raised in the conversation I had with Mr. Cresswell. Um, I think I can say that um, there was a distinct change in, the, in Mr. Staunton's behaviour once that I perceived, once he became aware of the investigation into him. Um, and I know that because I was the person who was asked to convey to him that he was going to be investigated as the senior independent director. And that was in about November last year. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that um, his behaviour changed in a way that was somewhat erratic from that point and became more erratic as we got into, into January. And so um, I, I, think, I think if I'm answering your question correctly, I did have some concerns about Mr Staunton's behaviour from about November. Prior to that, I don't think, I, Mr. Saunton has his own style, um, and um, that was um, the way in which he ran meetings and dealt with people. And um, I didn't have a problem with that. Um, it's not the way necessarily I would have done it, but I didn't have a problem with it. Um, I certainly don't recall him falling asleep in meetings or anything like that. Okay, that's, that's useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Ricaldon, if I could come to you. When you make settlement office offers to sub-postmasters, did you mark them as without prejudice and then go on to say that this made them confidential? Yes. Why? We did it because we got legal advice to, to do it, and, and when it was set up, um, that's what we agreed to do. And, and, by, and, and by the way, that is standard practice, but we've listened and we've changed. So we are not having without, with, without prejudice now being withdrawn because we've listened and, and we understand what the message that sends about secrecy and we don't want it disclosed, et cetera, et cetera. But who gave you that legal advice? Because I've got here a warning notice from the Solicitor's Regulation Authority yep. from the 28th of November 2022 yep. that makes very clear that you shouldn't do that in those circumstances. So the original legal advice was from our legal, legal advisors, which, which were Her Herbert Smith at the time, and, and to go through this process to make sure we are safe in terms of withdrawing without prejudice, we saw other legal advice, and, and the view is that actually it's, it, it, it's, it's a call that you can make if you want to. The recommendation, by the way, is to keep it on, but actually we get the optics. We understand the optics and the message it's sending. So on that basis, we have in the HSS, we are taking without prejudice off those. And retrospectively as well. So was there a conversation when this warning notice was issued about whether it was right to keep them on the settlement notice? Um, After the 28th of November 2022, was there a conversation that this had been issued and you needed to review them? So th this conversation we, uh, about having uh, is an ongoing one for some time. I can't remember when it first started, but it, was, it has been an ongoing because of the feedback we've been having around the optics of what that looks like, hiding behind corporate secrecy, etc. Et I mean, it's not just optics. This is a solicitor's regulation authority Correct. warning notice. I assume you employ a general counsel. You did back in 2022. You would expect your general counsel to keep up to date with warning notices issued by the SRA. So is it your belief that the General Counsel was negligent and just didn't pay attention to documents coming from a, you know, the regulatory body for solicitors? It is not my belief at all, and I have to be careful here because obviously, as you know, this has been referred to the SRA, and we await we await their outcome. So I can't I can't I can't comment on that. But um, I don't th the, the the group legal counsel has been absolutely involved in all of these all of these decisions. Okay, um, Mr. Reid. Last time you were before this committee, we had a, an exchange about non-disclosures agreement. I specifically said, does the post office still use non-disclosure agreements in reaching settlements with sub-postmasters? And you said, not to my knowledge. I said, uh, so non-disclosure agreements, uh, so no non-disclosures have been requested or signed since you took over as chief executive. You said, not to my knowledge. 
and then said you check. I appreciate yep. you haven't had checked. I have checked and written to, to that effect, yes. Is it not the kind of thing that you would expect your general counsel to keep you updated on, given there was a warning notice by the regulatory body? Yes, I mean, it's a fair, that's a fair challenge. Okay. Um, Mr. Tidwell, if I can come to you on a separate matter. In the disclosures we've had of various email exchanges, um, it's clear there was some um, dispute about the process to follow to uh, secure your replacement, whether that was an internal process or an external process. I think the former chairman, Mr. Staunton, suggested it was external, but a majority of the board voted instead to make it an internal. What's your recollection of how that process was working? I think, as I said, that's not quite right. It's the other way round. Okay. In fact, it was not even necessarily the other way round. If I can just explain, the the original position, um, which I think was uh, towards the end of last year, um, was an agreement among the board that um, it would be an external appointment to get better, ex more experience. And yes, I, I I think it was felt particularly that there was an opportunity to bring on the board somebody with different experience, particularly Whitehall-facing experience, yes. who could help us a little bit more in understanding how to navigate um, government and, and policy. Um, and, and just to be very clear, this is not a decision the board can take. It's a decision for the shareholder. Yeah. And so all we did at that stage was recommend to the shareholder. The shareholder agreed with that. And of course, it wasn't something that we said without consultation. Mm -hmm. It was a position that had been foreshadowed. And we understood that to be the department's view as well. So we agreed that, and we started the process. What happened in January, um, very shortly before the decision was taken by the Secretary of State in relation to Mr. Staunton, was that um, a series of discussions were convened by Mr. Staunton in which he sought to reverse that decision and indeed gave instructions to the company secretary to stop the search in circumstances where there had not been a proper board meeting to discuss it. So and he made that decision without consulting the board? Well, he, he discussed, yes, he discussed it with some board members. But, but not at a formal board meeting. Not a formal board meeting. And most importantly, he hadn't consulted the shareholder. Sure. And, and um, I think it was always plain, should have been plain to him, but certainly was plain, I think, to me, that there was no prospect of the shareholder changing his view on that. I think the shareholder had a firm preference for an external appointment. And so I think that was the, I think the second thing that Mr. Cresswell referred to this morning, and it was certainly a point that um, was key in my discussion with him in January, um, which, was, which took place two days after Mr. Stolton sent an email about that. And you've probably seen the email in which he says, to the company secretary, please stop the search. Yeah. And, um, and that, I think probably you could say that was um, somewhat the, core, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. In the, at that stage, I think it became apparent that something needed to be done, some discussion needed to take place about whether he was the right person to be the chairman. And would you characterise the way that process worked, the, re the way Mr. Staunton undertook that uh, as pretty standard character for how we would approach governance more broadly? The discussion, the second bit of the discussion, did yeah. you? No, absolutely not. On the contrary, I think it was not how you would approach governance. And, and it seemed to me, and indeed to other board members who were involved, that it was very odd and it wasn't consistent with what you do at all. Um, you've sat on other boards before, presumably. I've sat. I have sat on. Um, I, I don't. I, I'm not on the post office board because I'm a governance specialist. Yeah. I, I'm, as you know, a lawyer, and I'm there uh, primarily to help Mr. McCordon. Um, yeah. Having joined the board, and I joined the board in July 2021 in order to try and push forward all the things we've been talking about today, and and in terms of oversight. And so Mr. McCordon and I work very, very closely together on that. I'm not a governance specialist. I have chaired a board of a professional partnership with independent directors on it, and I've also had a career in which I've dealt with governance issues like um, the collapse of bearings, um, the collapse of RBS, where I acted for the non-executive director. So I've got a long um, history and experience of understanding how you do this. And of course, um, there's a lot of guidance about this, which is published about corporate governance. Mr. Reid, if I can come to you finally on an unrelated uh, note to that, one of our roles in this place is to represent people across the country and I'm sure we've all been contacted by postmasters and sub-postmasters um, certainly since the last evidence session. Now I've been contacted by quite a few. Um, they all share broadly the same perspective which is the culture of the post office hasn't changed. That as postmasters and sub-postmasters they feel undervalued, 
under-remunerated and they don't feel like they've got the ear of the executive team. What would your message to all of those be? I'm, I'm deeply worried that that's how people feel. Um, I would want to reassure them that we have Postmasters at the centre of everything we are trying to do, both from a remuneration perspective, from an engagement perspective, uh, from a communication perspective and a support perspective. We put in places where we are making ourselves available to them. We have a series of um, meetings, regional meetings with postmasters starting in March and April. I'm going to be available. I'm always available to, uh, to speak with postmasters, as we did yesterday with the voice of the postmaster, with the CWU postmasters. I am available to do that, as is my leadership team. But you did hear earlier, you know, in an earlier panel, we were talking about remuneration and the level of pay that yep. sub postmasters receive. You know, we heard under £20,000, just over £20,000. I mean, you can't be happy with that. Of course Surely I'm not. when you look at remuneration when you do your next review of how you compensate your postmasters and sub-postmasters, that's we, got to rise dramatically. We, we have um, a yearly meeting, which is in April, when we discuss the uh, remuneration rates, and that's something that we'll be in discussion with the NFSP and talking to them about how we are going to move remuneration forward. We've done it relatively uh, succinctly over the last sort of 18 months or so. We had an excellent Christmas this year where remuneration was up by 11.5% over the two months of Christmas. Uh, so we are making progress. We're migrating the business away from some of the core activities of just simple uh, mail and parcel distribution by bringing in new carriers, by bringing in new business, by building out the banking framework, which will be more remunerative for, for postmasters as well. So it's all about trying to make sure that we can secure the commercial sustainability. But could you make a commitment, for example, that your intention is that every postmaster and sub-postmaster gets paid you know, X percent above the real living wage, as a bare minimum? Um, and, if, and if their calculations are that they're not doing, you'll make sure there's an appropriate profit. Well, we're going to... Well, as I say, we have um, we have hardship funds. We have <coughs> different ways of trying to make sure that postmasters are. But we will we will be working this year when we go through the remuneration um, improvements that we do to make sure that we continue to make sure that the proportion of revenue that goes to postmasters increases year on year. Okay. Briefly, Mr. Gillis. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Mr. Reid, when you and I last met in January, yes. I asked whether any public relations companies had been hired by the post office after the drama had aired. Correct. And whether or not the post office, uh, what the price of that was. An article in the Telegraph today suggests that there is a firm called TB Cardu at a rate of £15,000 a month. Can I first of all ask, when was that contract agreed with uh, them? TB Cardu uh, started working for the business in 2019. And then again, in 2022, we had the, uh, the the renewal of that contract. Can I also then ask, have you had obviously any training for them to appear for the select committee? Have today? I had any select committee training, as they might call it in public affairs, to prepare yourself for today? I've obviously prepared for this. It's an extremely important meeting, and of course I would prepare for it. And yes. they put a briefing pack together of biographies of members, as well as suggested uh, questions yes. that might be asked. Yes. That you're using today. Okay. Have, very quickly then, TB Card, you obviously have been the company that's been used. Mm -hmm you understand that there'll be concerns that £15,000 a month is an extortion amount of money, that the contrition being shown by the post office might not be taken as seriously if this is effectively being paid to spin your way out of a crisis. Uh, I don't follow the logic of that <clears throat> at all. We, we're a business generating a billion pounds worth of income uh, in, a, in a year. We have commercial arrangements with the likes of every DPD, with banks. We need a PR organisation to work with us to make sure that we promote today's business, both from a social perspective and from a commercial perspective. So, so I don't, I'm afraid, Mr. Gullis, believe that that is. And so, how much of the time has been, and how much of their time has been spent specifically then, percentage terms, on Very little. what's happened? Very little. Very little. But in terms of, if, if, if the point you're trying to make is the preparation for today, most of the colleagues on this uh, on this panel would have done work themselves and we would have had a practice as well, which of course you would expect us to do because we want to take this seriously. I just want to make sure postmasters and sub-postmasters and mistresses actually feel that the contrition that you've shown on yes. the panel today is genuine and is real. Absolutely. And it's not something that's been rehearsed and prepared for like no. a good actor. No, it's not. Thank you, Chair. Super quick. And Super quick. Uh, a billion pounds generating income and we hear about hardship funds for postmasters. Well, I, the juxtaposition of those comments is just 
unbelievable. Are, are you going to sort this out by recognising a proper trade union to represent postmasters? Uh, because that's been s sadly absent from this process is needed. So I'd like but you'll, to you'll, be, you'll, you'll be aware that we have a long-term contract with the NFSP, um, and what? clearly that's something that we we've, we are trying to work with them it, to create the right environment. It, clearly, the, the, the protections weren't afforded to these postmasters. And just finally, on the remuneration committee, Mr. Mr. Tidswell, you serve on the remuneration, remuneration <coughs> committee. Yes. Um, you know, is that issue closed out in terms of the bonuses that were paid? The, mat the metric that was calculated opposite the, the funding of information to Sir Wynne Williams yes. fraudulently, falsely put into those accounts to award people bonuses, which would ordinarily lead to a prosecution under the Theft Act. Yes, is I, that done? Yes, it was very clumsy, and I do apologise to everybody for that. Clumsy? It, You've it, had postmasters who were prosecuted under the Theft Act I, and, and, and for false instruments and false accounting. And yet that happened at the, at the senior level at the, of the post office. Well, well, I'm sure you've seen the reports, two reports under this from yeah. Amanda Burton and Simmons and Simmons. Um, I absolutely accept the findings that they made and the issue is closed out. Yes, it is. Hardship funds. Sorry. Hardship funds in the post office. This fantastic brand, the post office. You've got hardship funds for employees. I'm not sure what that really shows with regard to your leadership. I, I believe and understand that you received somewhere in the region of £400,000 bonus uh, in the last couple of years. £400,000. Two of the individuals that sat the other day um, were receiving wages of less than £20,000. Nearly uh, less than the, the national minimum wage. Your, your bonuses, on top of your hundreds of thousands of pounds in wages, was 20 times more than their annual salary. Does that not just really show how the post office is rotten to the core? I'm not going to answer that question in that sense. Clearly, I'm why, well paid. Why would you not I'm clearly well, that I am clearly well paid, and I'm clearly... In, in a position where I'm trying to make sure that the commercial sustainability of the post office uh, is going to be for the next generation as well. Let me just check on this, uh, just close off Mr Higginbottom's question because I think in your letter to me earlier this year you said the offer letters that were made to postmasters and mistresses, the offer letters are marked without prejudice so that they are confidential, um, but in fact when you mark something without prejudice, it just means the contents are not admissible in court. It's not a confidentiality agreement. So I think the letter that you sent to us wasn't a perfect reflection of the facts. I will have to check that. I'll come back. Okay, Sean Nichols. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Reid, you just referred there to the post office's relationship with the Federation of Sub-Postmasters. This is not an independent trade union and is something that has been brought up by Alan Bates in front of this committee in previous evidence sessions as being an organisation that are actually complicit in the perpetuation of the Horizon scandal. Do you think that it is time for the post office to recognise an independent trade union who, as in evidence that Alan Bates has previously given before this committee, might have actually supported sub-postmasters rather than throwing them to the wolves as the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters did. We're talking to all postmasters and postmaster groups. As I said yesterday, we spoke to the CWU, uh, who represents some 275 to 300 postmasters, and the voice of the postmaster group, who, who represent over a, a thousand people. So I'm not closing down any conversations with any specific. I'm, I'm keen to speak to all groups of postmasters to understand how we can move the post, the post office forward. Thank you. Mr. Reid, in your earlier evidence today, you said if mass exonerations are the right course, to be crystal clear, do you or do you not believe that this is the right course? To be crystal clear, we support anything that is going to accelerate justice for wronged postmasters. And I'm absolutely clear that that's what the government wants to do. We will support it. But again, do you believe that there are sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses who are, quote, guilty as charged, as advised by Nick Vamos, and raised as a concern by you in your letter to the Justice Secretary for all of the answers that you've given about mass exonerations to be very 
if this is something the government wants to do, if this is the right course, do you believe that there are people who are guilty who will be exonerated under this? And if not, what is your opposition to this? I have no opposition. I have no opposition. So you do not believe that there is anyone who is guilty who will be exonerated under this mass exonerations proposal? There may well be people, but it's the least worst option. We've, dis we've heard the Minister say that. This is, these are exceptional circumstances, and if one or two, or whatever that number is, and I don't know what that number is, then fine. But this is the best way to get the right level of justice for the people who've been wronged. So you still believe that there are potentially guilty people, despite all of the evidence that we have heard up to this point? I'm not sure what you mean, what you mean specifically by your question. Guilty, what do you mean, guilty people? I, I don't understand that. You, because you still believe there are people whose conviction is not, in fact, wrongful among the numbers of people who will be exonerated under the mass exoneration proposals put forward by the government and supported by this committee and by the House? Well, I think, as everybody has, has mentioned, there may well be. I don't know. Thank you. Moving on, I don't think anyone watching today's evidence session could be fail to be moved by Tony, Tim and Alan's testimony and the impacts that it's had on them and the harm it's caused to them and their families. Taking up a point raised by Alan Bates in his evidence earlier today, Mr Rickeldin, why did the post office wait to start the process of disclosure given that they knew the names of everyone eligible to claim instead of waiting for the claim and therefore causing even greater delay? Because we needed to agree, and we did agree, the the disclosure process with the with the legal with free, with free the legal team, i.e., what they needed in disclosure. So ab absolutely, because um, at the same time we got a, a load of DSARs in as well, which take longer and from a regulatory perspective have to take priority. So we had to ensure that those DSARs were downsized, and then we agreed what Freed wanted in terms of the disclosure. It did take time. It did take too long. But we're, up, we're on it and we are producing, and as I said earlier, we're at 64% of that, that target and now slightly ahead of target thanks to the Minister's intervention and the £75,000 minimum payment in GLO, which is excellent news because it means I can get resource more into that space to speed up the GLO disclosure even more. Thank you. And finally, Mr Reid, we've seen delays, lies and buck passing from the post office while hundreds of victims are still left without a path to redress under flawed schemes. Why should you continue to be trusted to oversee the delivery of financial redress to victims? Um, we're very clear that, that whatever the government decides and determines is the right course of action, we will follow it. And if people believe, and if the government believes that the right level of trust is not in the post office and there is a better mechanism, we will fully support that, whatever that looks like. I'm not precious about this. I'm acutely conscious that we want to get the best mechanism. That's with us or without us. I don't mind. Thank you. Chair. Thank you very much indeed. That draws this evidence session um, to a close. Mr Reid, I'm grateful for your evidence, but you've been in post now since September 2019. You've told the committee today that only £1 in five of the budget has been paid out in redress. You yourself have said that that isn't good enough, it's much too slow. You've said that the toxic culture at the post office is not sorted yet, it's still a work in progress, it's not job done. There have been problems with the evidence about PR advisors, but also the use of confidentiality agreements. Tell the committee today why we should have confidence in you continuing in, in your post. Because we're delivering great things for the post office in terms of the way that we are performing. Our trading is excellent, the post office itself is making profit. Um, postmasters have improved in terms of the relationship they have with the centre and their trust in our organisation. That's um, something that we can measure and we have measured. Uh, we're making progress and we're listening to postmasters so that we can get the schemes that we've discussed today for the last uh, couple of hours, that we can get them right. And we're very happy to do that and we're very flexible to do that. And we will continue to work hard to ensure that justice is served for postmasters. Have you ever tried to resign as Chief Executive of the Post Office? No. Why do you say that? Well, because we've got a redress scheme that's in the wrong place, culture that's in the wrong place, problems with the information given to this committee. I'd like to know whether you are planning to stay in post to deliver the redress schemes that I we have just heard are not performing in the way that they should. I want to make sure that we get justice for our postmasters, and that is what I will say to do. 
Thank you very much indeed. That concludes this panel. Order, order. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 The proceeding Order, order. Welcome to the final panel of the Department for Business and Trade Select Committee hearings into redress for sub-postmasters. I'd be very grateful uh, if the clerk to the committee would please administer the oath. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Staunton. I'll come straight to the heart of the questions, which is, were you told by anybody serving in His Majesty's Government that you should in any way, shape or form slow down or minimise payments or redress to sub-postmasters? Yeah, let me just uh, answer that question uh, by, uh, so I think you used the phrase, nod and a wink. So let me say exactly what, what took place. Uh, I met Ms. 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 Mumby for an introductory meeting in January of last year. Uh, I went through the many challenges uh, that we face, a dysfunctional government, governance, uh, 
unreliable systems, uh, inadequate controls, uh, loss a hugely loss-making business, all the issues around uh, remediation and a, and a poor culture. Uh, and I said this is a three to five year turnaround situation at the post office. Uh, and I had in mind it was probably the, the latter rather, rather than the, the, the former. Uh, she said in response to that, this, there's, this is no time for long term planning. Uh, she said money is tight at the Treasury uh, and you need to really understand that. And I said, well, in terms of trying to hold back, there are only three levers of big cash outflows that we can pull. One is the inquiry costs, which are significant. One is compensation, and one is the replacement to Horizon, which, which is which is the, the biggest late lever. Uh, and I said, um, you know, that's. And I, and I said, actually, in, in detail, I said, the inquiry, the costs will have to be what they have, what they will be. Surely, the in respect of uh, compensation, uh, we need to be. Uh, uh, to do the right thing by postmasters in, in taking this money, uh, and uh, we're in dire need of a new, of a, of a new system. Uh, and, and she said, again, repeated again, money is very tight, this is no time to, to rip off the, the Band-Aid, uh, and I was left in no doubt that uh, uh, this, was, this was not a time to rip off the Band-Aid, and I'll have to look at those three levers. So. Uh, and I went back to, I sent the note. It was such an unusual conversation that I did a full note of it, actually putting in quotation marks what, what, what I was told. Um, and so I went, and of course, I was accused of being a liar until thankfully I found this note uh, just, just a few days ago. Uh, and since then, I think uh, the, the focus has changed from nobody said that to what did it mean? And I just explained what it meant. Uh, I went to see Nick Reed and I said, uh, what, what do you make of this? And he said, they live in a different world. And uh, he, he said to me, what do you want me to do about this? And, and, I, uh, and I said, well, I think there's nothing we can do about the inquiry. The costs will be what they have to be, although we should just look at the legal costs. They're clearly just out of control. Uh, we should do... Uh, uh, on, on compensation, actually, we, we should accelerate. We, this, this is just the morally right thing to do. We should accelerate on compensation. But of the biggest element, which was the horizon system, I said, look, we've been put on notice. Money is very tight. There's no room for a begging bowl. There's no room for mistakes. We need to be absolutely sure on, on the spend. So I didn't say s slow down to meet the Treasury. I just said we just need to be... I'd like to take a double take myself on what this is all about in terms of how we proceed. Because we, because there's no begging bowl, we've only got one chance of, of investing in the horizon replacement system and, and getting it right. So that, that is the full story mm. of, of what took place. So I think... Can I just be really so, clear? So the nod, your nod and a wink phrase was, 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 was... I thought, well, that just about sums it up. So you came away from the meeting with Sarah Mumby fairly clear that you had been asked to Absolutely. minimise cost, including the costs of compensation. Yeah, those are the three levers of which compensation was, was but one. Now, the Secretary of State, in her letter to me um, last Friday, uh, says that these claims are completely fictitious and you have changed your story. Is that true? I haven't at all. I think, of course, at the time, she said that they were lies because... Uh, of course, I couldn't find the file, though, so she said it was sort of a lie and it couldn't have been said. The, the, uh, since then, the tone of what she was saying about me has changed because, of course, I found the file note, th th thankfully. So um, I can only rest by the file note and, and the story which I've told you, which is the best, my best recollection. But the Secretary of State also says that your, your email, dated um, 6th of January 2023, um, does not mention specifically compensation, uh, and she is praying that in aid as evidence in her accusations against you. Well, I think it's important that file note was not, was not a verbatim comment of everything that took place. I mean, I was just 
it was the particular phrases she used which I thought set the tone of, of what, I, what I was being asked. If it had been a verbatim file note of all the things I've talked about, it would have been a three-page file note, but that's not what I set out to do. Uh, I set out to just say that this is the thrust uh, of the conversation, and uh, that's what I went through with, with, with Nick Reed afterwards. So the Secretary of State and um, Sarah Mumby have set out in subsequent correspondence <coughs> that the budget for compensation is ring-fenced and provided by the government. Now, actually, Mr. Reid said to us earlier that there is a post office contribution to the compensation <coughs> fund, but... It, 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 you're right. It, it is mainly ring-fenced and held within the Treasury, but how the ring-fencing... If the provision... Uh, say we have exoneration uh, and much more money is paid out, the amount that you ring-fence becomes larger. Similarly, if we, went, uh, if we were tough on compensation and became small, smaller, that would release the money that, that, that we've re ring fenced. So that's how ring fencing works. And in respect of ring fencing, it's really important, if you read the post office accounts, you'll see on page 65 where we talk about um, a going concern, etc. In, in particular, when we say it, it's very specific, there is no financial guarantee this letter of comfort very specifically says there's no financial guarantee. So clearly, from the point of the fact that it's ring fence, it sounds as if it's done and dusted, but actually it's, it's not. It's not a hard ring fence. It's not, it, they specifically say in the accounts this is not a guarantee. So, Well, it's, that's interesting because the Secretary of State points out that the government has got no incentive to delay because there is a ring fenced compensation fund. Do you well, buy that argument? Uh, the answer is, uh, I've been uh, I, I, the only route. The, the, the big numbers are in respect of overturned convictions, mm. and I think somebody referred to four percent that's been paid, paid out. out. So you know, this, this is yeah. the fact is it was going nowhere uh, in terms of uh, the exoneration uh, costs, and the whole thing opened up subsequent to the Mr. Bates TV program. And until that point, no headway was being, was being, was, was being made. So uh, uh, I think that's worth understanding. In um, her letter and file notes, Sarah Mumby says this. Uh, this is dated 21st of February. She says, we discussed the post office operational funding, not compensation funding. She goes on to say, I'm able to give you, the Secretary of State, the strongest reassurance that I did not at any point suggest to Mr Staunton or to imply to him in any way whatsoever that there should be a delayed compensation payments for postmasters. I do not believe they should be delayed and no minister has ever asked me to make delays. Does that assertion by Sarah Mumby undermine your assertions? Uh, well, it, it does. If you, it, Her file note is written a year and a day, a, a year and a month after after my file note, mm. so it's it's not a contemporary contemporaneous file note by any means. It's written with the purpose of answering this this point. So I'm, I'm not casting any aspersions uh, on, on Miss Mumby, but that's that's worth fully un, uh, understanding. Do you think so, Sarah Mumby may have misremembered? There's These a lot, there, there are a lot of issues going around about. Uh, misremembering, lying, etc., and uh, that's not what I want to get into. I'm just explaining what I know. I'm not. I'm not here to guess. Uh, but, uh, but, about but on the else. face of it, then, it appears that Sarah Mumby may have walked away from your conversation with a different interpretation to you. That I, would be a, perhaps I, I, a general. I think the fact is, when you talk about three levers, it's, it's, this is not uh, a PhD in, in accounting. This is three very simple mm. issues that we're talking about. Well, on so this, I don't think there's much room for. The misinterpretation. But Sarah Mumby does say in her file note, 21 February 2024, that there is, quote, complete firewall between the two budgets for compensation and operations. But you're telling the committee this afternoon that it's not as simple as that. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, it's, as I say, the, if uh, now, now that we've made all these issues on, on, on exoneration, the fact is the amount of money held in Treasury as, uh, within this firewall ought to have been increased significantly because of the exoneration payments. So, so it's not a, m a number that's fixed. And equally, as I say, if it goes down, more money is available for whatever, NHS tax cuts or whatever it is. The Secretary of State goes on to say um, she 
goes on to present her appointment letter or her priorities letter to you dated 29th of June last year and that says that you are to provide fair compensation to those affected by the historic failures and in particular to inject pace into the delivery of compensation for those with overturned convictions. That instruction sounds like it's at odds with the impression you walked away with from the conversation with Sarah Mumby. Absolutely. Because, because Ms Bumby was talking about the financing issues within Treasury uh, and uh, I got the very clear message that, uh, well, I think I put in the file that money, money is tight. I mean, it was, all I was doing was representing what I was told. I mean, of course, I just thought I'd done this file note. It would never hmm. see the light of the day other than talking to, to, to Nick about it and, having, and I said we're going to proceed with compensation and I will take the consequences. So, um, so the signal. So the signal. It wasn't. What other reason would I have done it? It's not. It wasn't done for trying to have a discussion in a year's time with the Secretary of State. It was just done as a matter of routine because the words were so odd. So, but the signals that you received were different to the letter of what the Secretary of State laid out. Correct. So there was an ambiguity. Yes, I think, uh, as you said, the, the, you use the phrase not in a wink. I, I was left with the, with the issue that uh, if I could pull any levers, I should. And actually, I felt it was not an unreasonable lever to pull in respect of um, the horizon replacement, but it was, I was not going to go anywhere near uh, a morally wrong decision not to, not to pay our postmasters and not to do anything that impacted the statutory inquiry. Nick Reed, in his letter to me um, last mm. week, says, I've personally never been instructed to delay on compensation nor have any of my leadership team, to my knowledge. It, it sounds like he can write that because of the conversation that you had with him after your conversation with Sarah Mumbo. He can write that because I said to him, we're not going to, we're, we're, no, we're not going to do anything that's not the morally right decision of, of, of continuing to pay compensation. And I did say to him, and if anything, we should accelerate it. So you stand by absolutely what do. you've said in public about the message you received from a senior civil servant that compensation payments should be slowed down to minimise the financial liability. Yes, I do. Mr Lady. Um, yeah, yeah, by uh, Mr Stoughton, you were previously chairman of WH Smith, the Phoenix Group, and Ashdead Group, vice chairman of Legal in General, and uh, also served on the boards of IDA, NB, Sky B, Ladbrokes and Standard Bank. How do you feel about the attack on your honesty, attack on your character, your credibility, basically trashing Indeed. your career? I mean, basically, even in this session we've had today, you've been classified unequivocally as a liar. Indeed. How do you feel about that? Well, I think, uh, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I've been the chairman of four big public companies. I've been the deputy chairman of Legal and General, which is big, the biggest insurance company in, in, the, in the UK. Uh, I've been an executive director of uh, both Granada and, and ITV, uh, and a non-executive, say, at B Sky B. So I do have, and I was a partner in Price Waterhouse before I did those jobs. So in terms of governance, uh, I've had experience going back since till the age of 32 in terms of what it was the right thing to do in governance. So I, I feel as if I have some experience in this whole area. And, well, I, and, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't have been considered a successful chairman if I'd not been considered a successful chairman. I wouldn't have been appointed to Smiths and a couple of counties. How do you intend to tackle these accusations from senior politicians and uh, senior executives at the post office? It's not good. I mean, what I, what I have done is... Uh, stand up for the postmasters. In fact, if you don't mind, uh, the, post, the, the post office have had a chance to make a number of representations to you, which I hadn't realised that, that I had the opportunity to do. So I haven't made a representation. I, so I wouldn't mind reading out for a minute my views to make a representation to you compared to all the representations the post office have made, if you don't Chair. mind, Mr Chair. Right, well, my statement is... What happened to these poor postmasters and their families is a tragedy and a scandal. They have been failed time and time again by a whole host of British institutions who are supposed to be there to protect the citizen 
and ensure fair play. We all know that there was, we all know that there was inaction all round by the judicial system, the government, Whitehall and particularly inside the post office until the ITV drama, Mr Bates versus the post office and there was a rocket then put under things. The Secretary of State, senior civil servants and post office officials are asking us to believe that everything was going swimmingly all along when it damn well wasn't. We all know, we all know that things were moving far too slowly and you've heard from three postmasters today who said it even more eloquently than, than I could. And the reason why people have latched on to what I said in the Sunday Times was that finally someone was being honest about how deep-seated the problems were and why nothing was being done. I still think that more could be done, at least to make compensation more generous and the process of getting justice less bureaucratic. But I will at least have achieved something if the sunlight of disinfectant, which the Secretary of State so approves of, means that government now lives up to its promises. What the public wants to know is why was everything so slow, and we've talked about the 4%, and why does everything remain so slow? I've spoken up on matters of genuine public concern have been fired and now subject to a smear campaign. So you're quite right. And I'm just giving you the background for why we have it. No, I'm fine. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Staunton, um, can you characterise the department's oversight um, of the. It's okay, just a background noise there, yeah. The uh, Department's oversight uh, with the Post Office when it comes to the redress scheme, how, how much were they? Sorry, the, the Department, office, was, was terribly it, sorry, the post Was the Department hands-on or was it seen as being at a distance? I'm terribly sorry, the Post Office it being hands-on in respect of which what? Yeah, in, in terms of the, that relationship between the Department and the, the Post Office, did you feel that they were hands-on in terms of uh, that, that you know that, that discussion that you might have had out with some of the, the are you talking teachers? about compensation in particular yes, yeah. uh, well the truth is that uh, we decide I, mean, I said to Nick we were going to carry on and I'll take the consequences we just continued with that and I think Simon Ricaldron talked about the processes and I don't dispute anything he said in terms of uh, how, how all that was managed but but did that include um Discussions with the, the Secretary of State and with ministers, uh, you know, how, how, how did all that happen? Uh, no, over that I think it was all, no, to, to be fair, I think all of that was done at, at a lower level in terms of the minutiae of the compensation. It was, um, I never talked to the, the, minister, the, the Postal Minister at all about right. having any concerns at, at, at that operating type level. My, my, my main concern, well, there, there are two schemes, there are three issues with regard to postmasters, we'll come on to the last one which is current postmasters and how they're viewed within the organisation which you've had a very good airing of my file notes. Uh, but, the, but the first two schemes relate firstly to overturned convictions and uh, the issue there is that it was going uh, t terribly slowly, exoneration was not uh, on the agenda despite the fact that one could no other way was was this going to be dealt with because all the file notes I saw was that uh, there is there are all these comments about postmasters being guilty as charged whether it's Richard Taylor or Nick Reed in his letter to the Lord Chancellor or even the postmasters uh, saying it that the, the, the guilty as charged I just don't accept because the file notes I see is the vast majority of postmasters who have not come forward uh, to this issue is because they do not want to be tried all over again. They just don't trust the system. Uh, and uh, that's the first issue. The second issue is, I think Mr. Holling, Minister Hollingrate did a terrific thing to put the £600,000 uh, offer down there in, in September in terms of uh, overturned conviction. But actually there was a very low take-up. And, and I had said to Nick Reed, we must get the message across to him. It's got to be, it's got to be seen to be generous, i.e. a million pounds. And I know that sounds a lot of money, but actually, I said I wasn't sure that the, the, the British public would, would have such an issue with that. As far, they would far prefer to be generosity than to be 
tight-fisted and, and, and anxious. So, and then the second issue was related to other postmasters. We mustn't forget that on overturned convictions, the progress has been lamentable. But in terms of the other claims, postmasters uh, have got uh, uh, problems in the, the it, I think you've, you've touched on them all actually, which is the, the, the forms are, are impossible to understand. I'm an accountant and I, you know, I, I struggle with it with, without le legal advice, without all the information uh, that, that you need. The, the, if you read the far notes, the attitude of the legal people, Herbert Smith, talking to our postmasters about aggressive, hostile questioning, it's it's, it, it's, it's, it's been a massive issue, and uh, it's largely behind us. But as a result of that, one can see from all the uh, uh, comments that actually many postmasters, because of that hostile attitude, have settled for far less than they think is reasonable. And Mr. Bates was a perfect example. He's obviously not one to be uh, adversely cowered by hostility, and he stuck out but the offer, as he said, was a fraction of what she thinks is reasonable. So whether it's the overturned convictions, which we can all focus on going forward, there has been a massive problem. And I think what we need to do is not only to have uh, a speeding up of overturned convictions and a, and a bigger number than 600,000, I think someone touched on from the committee, shouldn't we reopen all these uh, issues around the other postmaster schemes because postmasters have... Um, settle for what far less than they think is reasonable for all the issues. I think I'd be repeating it if, if, if I uh, dealt with it again. You, you mentioned about the pace of the payments that were, were made and the compensation payments and so on, but you were chairman and yeah, I'm just wondering in terms of that, I mean, Mr Lavery has read out your, your CV in terms of the amount of experience that you've had in various other companies. Surely it looks like in the post office the shit was hitting the fan. And you know the the board just seemed to be you know just allowing things to happen. No, no, that's Did you that's feel not, that there was sufficient grasp of how important this was in terms of the the, the board meetings you did have? Absolutely. Well, of course, I don't sit on. It's chaired by Mr. Tiswell, the, the compensation uh, committee. But after about two or three of them, I went to say to Nick, "Look, this situation seems bureaucratic, pedantic, and most of all." unsympathetic and we've got to do something about it and he said well look that's a management issue you should leave that with me we'll progress it so the answer is I didn't just ignore it I actually had a word with the chief executive that this needs to be uh, dealt with and as you and I've been a chairman of many companies and the answer is it's not just a popularity contest you have to say things if you're not happy and ask for things to be changed and, uh, and, I, and I said that's to the chief executive Right. And maybe just one final please. question, yes, please. just on the position of the post office as a whole. Do, do you think they should have been or, and still be part of the, the process, or should they be withdrawn and removed from that completely? They should be removed completely. It's, it's, it's pretty obvious. I, I think people talked about the, the, the culture. Well, you saw the notes from the uh, postmaster directors, and I think it was said that I somehow invented it. They rang me on a Sunday and said, look, uh, they'd, they'd mentioned it to me about six weeks before. They were clearly highly disturbed on the matter. And I said, look, the problem is that you're both being investigated uh, by, the, by the post office. If, if, if you come out now, it's going to look as if you know, you're, you're conflicted. Sure. So uh, should we just not get this behind us before we really pick it up? And in mid-January, they, they, they'd had enough. So they rang me on a Sunday and said, this has got to be tackled, Henry. Uh, I said, what I will do is I will prepare a file note of all your comments tonight. I will send it to you. I want you to agree every single word in this file note before I send it off. And they both came back. Now, unfortunately, it's on my post office email account. But if, if you asked, you would see that that correspondence took place. So this is not something that uh, anyone can say... I invented and it was not agreed. I'm a, I'm a stickler in that regard. So they agreed every single word in that. I sent it through to Nick Reed and I said I want to discuss this at the next board meeting. And the problem was that Nick Reed sent a copy of it. I don't know if you've seen the correspondence. Sent a copy of it to the to the legal director, particularly whom the two postmaster directors were saying had way too much power and was using it as an instrument. 
can't remember what the phrase was. It wasn't an instrument of terror, but it was an instrument of some way of control. And um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it was an appalling thing to do. And, of course, the two postmaster directors were absolutely appalled in terms of governance that that was sent to the people that were being critical of. And that's why one of the postmasters, Saf Elliott, sent that absolutely stinging note to Nick Reed. If you thought my note of what they said to me was harsh, all the, all the phrases that were made, the note to, uh, from, from Elliot to uh, Reed was, uh, was an absolute zinger. So, um, you know, it was, ba- it was bad governance and it was really, we really badly <coughs> let down the postmaster directors. And I would say, actually, they've been very brave, these postmaster directors coming out to say what they did, because actually, it could, I did say to them, this could impact your business. People will, c- could, you could lose post office. You, you, you. But they felt they ought to represent the views of the postmasters in, in the organization, and they were prepared to do it. And I thought, I thought that was pretty brave. And I thought, therefore, for me to duck and not take on their cause would have been cowardice when they would taken such a brave decision. So that's why. And I knew. I guess it might end up almost certainly in me being fired, but I thought the, th- the important thing to do is to do the right thing, and that and that's why I did it, uh, because uh, I didn't want to feel that I would act in a different way and show less bravery than the two men involved. I have to say they were still braver because, of course, they they were going to lose money, business. They could lose money or business from it, which of course doesn't doesn't apply to me. Mr. Okay. Gus. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Staunton, Mr. Lavery touched on it earlier that some very serious allegations have been made both by Mr. Cresswell and by Mr. Tidwell related to your conduct and that an investigation is currently underway of which you were informed in November. Can I just check, first of all, that you share those recollections that in November you were informed that you were being investigated for your behaviour and conduct? Yes, there is an investigation. What, what there is, actually... Is, uh, Mr. Reed fell out with his HR director and she produced a, spec- a speak up document which was 80 pages thick uh, and within that was one paragraph there about comments that I allegedly made so this was an investigation not into me this was an investigation made into the chief executive Nick Reed. there's that one paragraph and you could, you could say actually it was about politically incorrect comments that are attributed to me, which I strenuously deny. This was not an investigation into me. This was an investigation based on the 80-page document prepared by uh, the HR director. So, okay, so you're, you're obviously accepting... Oh, sorry. Obviously, you've made it clear that you uh, disagree with the allegations and you're obviously currently going through the investigation. Of course, I wouldn't expect you to comment on a live investigation into yourself. Can I just ask... Have you been interviewed at this stage? Yes, I have. Yeah. About and, only last, and only last week I wrote to uh, the barrister giving her further comments. So the fact that somehow I've not cooperated with this investigation uh, is totally wrong. The point of the call with uh, the SID was that this 80-page document was actually taking a terrible toll on Nick Reed. He said, I'm not being supported by the board, uh, and this is, this is just bad news for me and my family, I'm going to resign tomorrow. I've just had enough. Because I was about to say, the chair did ask the question earlier, Mr Reid, had he ever considered resigning? He said no. You're saying in a conversation, verbal conversation, he had got to a point where he felt that maybe he was going to have to say The 80-page report, of course, uh, alleges from the HR director, not my words, that uh, Nick had had was going to resign because he was unhappy with his pay. She's put that in this in this document. Really? <laughs> sure. I'm absolutely positive. Because you'll understand that the concern so, here is that we've had your obviously your comment, which I will come to initially yeah. about obviously this the, the, or your interpretation of yeah. your meeting with Miss Mumby. That has led to obviously communication between well, via the newspapers between yourself and the Secretary of State for Business and Trade, essentially about your dismissal. We're now adding Mr. Reed into this story. You'll accept that for sub-postmasters and postmistresses across the country, this is starting to look like a complete 
and shambles. utter shambles. Absolutely. To be perfectly frank, it's probably the place where I've been able to. People be shocked I was that polite, but like an utter shambles in how this is looking. And now we've got another name in the ring here, and so this only produces more mud, more grey area. When actually, as again, what the point of this session is, and I appreciate your contrition in what you said earlier about the situation regarding sub postmasters and postmistresses, that it, this will only add further delay, further lack of attention to the victims of this massive injustice in our, in our uh, criminal and civil sector of law. And so do you regret now that we're in this situation where we're having trial by media and an HR dispute by media, which seems also utterly new to me, when actually it's drawing attention away from the Mr Bases and others? I couldn't who have come agree forward. with you more. This, this, this should all be about the postmasters and their families and how their lives have been wrecked. That's what all of this should be about and, no, and nothing else. The rest is just flim flam. I know we can talk about these issues, I don't want to play them down, but that's what this is all about, is, is the postmasters. So I don't disagree with you one bit. And can I just can quickly I just... clarify one further thing? So obviously you're currently under investigation for allegations that you said you, cl you claim is a paragraph, an 80-page document. Yeah, paragraph two Is your understanding that Mr Reid is also under an investigation? Indeed. Yes. He's yes. in his investigation for this. This investigation is primarily into Nick Reid and the 80 page dossier. Okay, so well, at the moment now we've got yourself as the former chairman, who was the current chairman at the time, being investigated. We've now got the CEO allegedly now under investigation as well. That's blown my I was not expecting that answer. Okay, so, <laughs> I, I, okay, so we've got. Wasn't, we've wasn't, got wasn't that made plain to you, that this investigation? That's the, the first thing I've heard of Mr. Reid's alleged, and I will use that word, alleged investigation. But obviously, you're claiming that, and I'll probably let the chair come back on that one because he'll have. He's, he's been here longer than me to make sure I didn't cross the line. Uh, what I say. That, that, that doesn't mean I'm less shocked. Less shocked, good, good. Okay. Uh, well, can Going I back to very quickly the yes, meeting sure, sure. with. Ms Mumby, I suppose the question I have is, if you have taken the nod and the wink that you are to, um, sorry, to slow down compensation to sub postmasters and postmistresses to limp it into an election, if that is how you felt you were instructed, my question is two part. A, why not speak up about it until after you've been released from office? And B, surely, you would have felt the need to resign if you felt that the system was indeed working against you in this way to take a stand and to call out what you thought was malpractice by those in Whitehall towards making sure that compensation was received. You'd understand that the fact this has come out after you've been dismissed would lead, just leads to thinking this is a bit of he said, she said. Well, and that, of course, is there's quite a lot of element to that. The, the, the point that uh, I would make is that uh, I said to Nick, we should not do anything to pull the lever on the inquiry, and because we couldn't, that would be against the law, and neither should we pull the lever in respect of uh, compensation, and indeed I said we should increase it. But there was the lever for the biggest amount, which related to the Horizon uh, investment, which I, was, I felt put under Notice that actually we needed to just be doubly sure, triply sure that we were getting it right in respect of uh, that investment. And Mr Staunton, obviously we've heard again from witnesses earlier that one of the things that you're being investigated related to is you trying to shut down a whistleblowing investigation yes. into yourself. Do you deny those accusations? Yeah, let me just explain what happened. As I said, uh, it, was, it was not the first time that Nick had threatened to resign, but I could clearly see... Yes. He was uh, under, and, and you'll see it's in, it's in this 80-page re report, which is not, not my report, um, but he had said to me s the same things in terms of his salary, so, but it's there in, in, in the document. But, but the key point was that I could see he, he was in a very pressurised position. This, this, is, this is a tougher job being CEO of the post office, I have to say, than all the other companies that I've chaired, just because of the my myriad of problems that it has. So on top of this, he was being, being investigated on, on an 80-page dossier. And it was, he was really quite upset about it. And I felt, I felt it was affecting his, his, his emotional and mental state. It was that serious. So 
he was not supported by the board, so I said to him, look, I will go and talk to the SID. I'm conflicted, but I will go and talk to the SID to see if we can, this myriad charge sheet, if we can just, we'll, Nick, you've got to face up to the big ones, but, but you know, he said, as he said, be, I'll be wiped out from the business for four weeks if we go on like that. So we'll just focus on the big ones, but, but that's a matter for Ben, our SID, to give us a view on. So I rang Ben, I said, look, this is a, uh, a chief executive that, that I'm very worried about. This is uh, uh, some way of dealing with him. We've got to show him some support if we can actually, it's, because to, to extent, I thought the HR director was negotiate a bit, negotiating a better exit package. I mean, that's, that, that was my assessment when I looked at some of the things that she was talking about. So, and I said that to Ben, so I said we should reduce the, the charge sheet on Nick to start with. We can come back to the others we feel is relevant, but this man just hasn't got the time or the inclination <coughs> to deal with the full charge sheet. So can you just look at it? It, it, it needs to be, you're conflicted, Henry. I, I want the, condi uh, the four lines on me. I'm very happy to, to talk about. I, I, I've completely rejected them. Uh, so this, as I say, this wasn't a big investigation into me. This was a big investigation into Nick, and I didn't realise you weren't aware of that. Oh, you've certainly made news today, <laughs> Mr. Thornton. I'm sure you've that. Mr. Tidswell informed us that I think in response to Mr. Higginbottom, apologies if I got the wrong individual, maybe Miss Master, that that he felt once you he had personally informed you of the investigation of getting into you in November that your behaviour had changed and effectively, I can't quote him perfectly, but had become more erratic and... Yeah, I saw that. Say, do you think that's a fair characterisation no, or do you dispute no, that from society? No, I, I, well? I completely dispute it. And I think that um, what happened was, as you'll see from the documentation, it was actually the whole thing did go uh, get a bit difficult once the postmasters got hold of me and I wasn't prepared to duck it, but I did a farm there and said, we've got to tackle this. At this point... Uh, Things did get very difficult, and with, within 10 days, uh, uh, I'd, I'd left the company. So I think that was a far bigger issue. But I'm, I'm not an erratic, uh, ch you know, if, if I'd been an erratic individual when it comes to business, uh, I wouldn't have been the chairman or deputy chairman or main board director uh, of all these companies. That's, that's just so, not how I am. Mr. Staunton, I feel like there may be another drama, Mr. Reed and Mrs. Staunton versus the post office coming down the track <laughs> at some stage in the future, because... Well, I don't I'm think not going to say, but what I would say is, my, my honestly, I'm blown away. Um, what I suppose I'm trying to get to the bottom two of here is, is it right, really, in this myriad of mess? Should the politics and the politicians who have been embroiled in this or dragged into this, isn't it right that we really put these individuals to one side? Absolutely. And that they are no longer part of this discussion, and we can move on. And I mean, the Secretary of State for Business and Trade, and just say that she's you're not interested in firing in her direction. No. And now this is about your fight with the post office to clear your name and reputation, for clarity to be brought around Mr. Reid now and what his current situation is with the post office, and whether or not he is under investigation or not, and whether he is wanting to resign, bearing in mind he also took the oath and said, he, he goes, sorry, sorry, Chair. Isn't the, isn't the point here now that Mr. Bates has got a point that maybe the post office needs to be buried and actually sold off because he said it's such a mess and the fact we've got the former chairman and the CEO apparently both are under investigation and both when well, one particularly wants to resign isn't it maybe is is it time for the post office to go well is the base right that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question and, and what I said in January again it didn't find favor with the uh, uh, UKGI I the only route through this uh, for me is, is, is demutualization of the post office. The answer is where I think the postmasters have a stake in the business. And that, uh, I haven't got my mind right quite ha how we would have done it, but uh, the, the action, we cannot have the postmasters. This got nothing, this, this should all, the discussion should all be about the postmasters and justice yes. for those who have been convicted. And we mustn't forget a reasonable living for those that work within the post office business now, which is actually not a sufficiently remunerated business. That, that's what this, this whole thing uh, should, should be about. And, and so it shouldn't be about another, another TV program about Mr. Reeves. It's, it's, it's a pointless uh, waste of time. That doesn't actually further the cause of the postmasters one bit. So Mr. Bates is, 
is right. I'm not sure that Amazon is right. I think actually I think it would be more powerful if we had a demutualization. That's why I wanted at least one more post office director on the board. My preference would be to have two and then we'd have four postmaster directors on the board which would be the start of that journey and, uh, and I would have you've seen in the file note I would have two of them actually managing a committee that was all about the culture with, within this department <coughs> I would have one of them chairing the, the remuneration committee because I think you know, that would actually sort out some of the issues you raise about bonuses backdating pay deals putting uh, multipliers on all the bonuses when they should only go to, uh, to objectives which I think you covered all because I think on the governance on REM is a really big point which you raised because actually when we came to see you last time, we just talked about that TIS scheme. All the other issues about backdating, backdating of postmasters, uh, applying the wrong multipliers to the wrong bonuses, all of those stuff w was not covered at, at that meeting. So I think... Um, uh, but you no, understand I, clearly, Mr. Thornton, I promise you, sorry, sorry, you, you, you appreciate that with the former chairman, who was then the current chairman, and the CEO, now apparently both under investigation, sub postmasters and postmistresses are going to think they are literally bottom of the pile when it comes to them being focused on when the two most senior people in the, in the organisation are at war with his, with his war with his employer. Well, I, I, I wouldn't classify it as war. I mean, the, this was a complaint. It's not harmony. Of course it's not. Of course. And actually, it doesn't fall the further the cause of the postmaster. That is the, that is the key point about all of this is that uh, we need to get back to talking uh, and, and I think the committee covered it but all, lots, all sorts of other issues came to be involved and I think we'll talk about the SID process etc which I'm very happy to do yeah, sorry, but, sorry, but, it's, but it is mainly about the postmasters that, that is why I went public in the Sunday Times article and one of the problems of course if you go to the Sunday Times is of course you lose control of the narrative to a certain extent and the focus of the article became much more about government and not about the yes. postmasters and, and I think it's that, that fair was the, to say that we've not that, that was the heading the and it was also the thrust of the article and the, but, but you, you, do, you lose you lose you, but you've you helped us fill out the picture today Mr Higginbottom thank you chair I actually want to stick on that theme about I don't feel we've currently got the answers to, to I'm, everything I'm terribly sorry, sorry I don't think we've got the answers that we need as a committee yet about what happened um, so I'm going to ask you some quite direct questions I appreciate short fit the answer if possible we've currently got the secretary of state the minister the senior civil servant the chief executive board members other officials in the department for business and trade all saying that they wanted to expedite compensation claims and mr staunton with due respect you are the only person sat there saying anything to the contrary could it not be that you misinterpreted the conversation? And if you didn't, why with all those conversations that must have taken place over the course of your tenure as chair, would you not confirm and clarify with anyone? Yeah, well I think that uh, your committee it's itself, to talk about expediting compensation, that was not the view expressed by postmasters that this process would be expedited. It was lamentably slow until Mr. Bates. It was lamentably slow, the 4% you've quoted. You know, this was uh, not being ex expedited one bit. But some of that included a period where HSS was the post office's responsibility. Sorry? Some of that was when HSS was under the post office as a responsibility, and you were the chairman. Yes, well, I think... That so did you fail in getting compensation well, as chairman? No, because I think we need to distinguish between the various schemes. Uh, my main gripe is with the overturned convictions and the lamentably slow pro process we've had there. I think I went well, back to... To be fair, Mr Staunton, that feels like a smoke and mirrors answer. Of, Don't look over here. I only want you to look at here. Yeah. No, I'm not how very happy. How many I'm, I'm quite happy with the, the, the progress on HSS uh, and the other schemes. Uh, I don't think... Uh, it, it could have been faster, but it's not my, it's not my biggest gripe. I, as chairman, I mean, the, the executives run compensation, and I thought it was the, pro, the progress was adequate, as, as you had given back to you from, by Simon Ricardo. And so I, I, I don't have a gripe with that, but I have a huge gripe with the fact that overturned convictions was so slow, and we were getting nowhere on exoneration. We were told it's not possible, 
and suddenly we had Mr Bates and all of a sudden exoneration was possible. Which includes the period you were responsible for. Sorry? Which includes the period you were responsible for Post Office Limited, but yep. you don't seem to want to accept that your organisation, when you were chair, was part of the problem. Well, I, I think that... Uh, I, 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 do, I do think the Post Office was part of the problem, but I don't think the compensation for HSS, etc., could be considered slow. I mean, I think the postmasters made a point that it could have been faster, and I think that's a not unfair categorization, but it wasn't uh, slow. Uh, so, I, so I think as a, as, okay. as a chairman, when, when, if, if something is going wrong, the first person to deal with it should be the chief executive. If it's going terribly wrong, the chairman has to have a word with the chief executive and say, this is terribly wrong, we need to sort it. I didn't feel that the progress on HSS was terribly slow and therefore needed okay. a chairman intervention. In your introductory meeting with Miss Mumbe, you described it earlier on as so unusual as to warrant sending a note to yourself. At what point did you then raise what had been spoken to you about by Miss Mumbe with the Secretary of State or the Minister or another senior official? Well, I raised it, I raised it with Nick to say, actually, my assessment is uh, he asked me, what do you want me to do with it? And I said, we should carry on uh, full steam ahead with the inquiry and compensation. If uh, we get feed feedback that we've uh, either misspent public money or we were being too quick, I would take take the consequences. So it was, a, it was actually quite a brave decision on, on, on my part to take that decision. But you made a decision not to raise it with Secretary of State, Minister or indeed the official that you'd had the conversation with? No, I think that uh, I have to take action on, on the facts as I find them, and I took the action which was that we would, we'd, we would not slow in those two areas. So that, that meeting with Miss Mumble was in January. On Thursday the 23rd of March in 2023, the Post Office Minister, Minister Hollingrake, made a statement to the House of Commons, I assume as Chairman of the Post Office, you would watch proceedings in Parliament, and he said, we certainly, certainly intend and expect to make payments much, much faster than that, referencing the August 2024 deadline. So you then heard, despite in January thinking things were confused, maybe the government was slow, and you heard the minister make clear at the dispatch box that he wanted to do things quickly. Did you have a conversation with either the minister or the Secretary of State or a DBT official after that point? Because, because I'd said we should still go ahead, in terms of our spend on the inquiry and compensation, other than legal fees on, on, on the inquiry, uh, I was not uncomfortable with uh, the decision we take. So no, no is the answer, Mr. Staunton. No is the answer to what? That you didn't have a conversation with ministers. Oh no, I didn't. No, I didn't have a Despite the fact that at the dispatch box of the House of Commons, ministers made very clear they wanted to accelerate payments. Yes. Uh, so um, even though you could see a discrepancy uh, uh, between anything what that you, accelerates well, payments, on, is with good due respect, me. Mr. Stoughton, yeah, sure. even though you'd seen a discrepancy between what you thought you'd been told and what ministers were saying at the dispatch box, you still decided not to say anything to the only shareholder. The, the, I was all for anything that accelerates payments to to, to postmasters on and any scheme, and particularly we now need it on uh, overturned convictions. I'm supportive of. So when the minister said we're going to further accelerate payments, I was uh, all in favour of it. Yes, but the point is, Mr. Sullivan, you went on record and said the direct opposite, that you'd been told to delay payments. In July, at an urgent question, I think from the uh, right honourable member who sat behind you, there was an urgent question about the high tea rising scandal, and Minister Hollingrake said again, um, that they wanted to speed up compensation. So you had a conversation in January that you got one interpretation of. In March in the House of Commons it was made very clear that we wanted to proceed faster. In July it was made clear we wanted to proceed faster. Did you in July speak to the Secretary of State no, I was or Minister Hollingrake no, as the Postal Affairs Minister quite, or I'm, UK Government I'm, Investments I'm, 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 I'm or any senior official? I was quite happy with speeding up. That that was just, just fine by me. You, I'm not asking don't, if don't you were happy I didn't, with it, Mr. Storm. I didn't. I'm not asking if you were happy with it. Yeah. I'm asking whether you raised your concerns that you thought there was a view that compensation should be delayed. 
the point I'm making is that having uh, heard what Ms. Bumby said, I decided that we should continue as they were. So I didn't have any concerns that we were not paying uh, postmasters quickly enough. Uh, this, uh, you know, I, did, I didn't take my file and, 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 and wave it around all to the press. I just put it, put it in my file uh, and, uh, and basically that, forgotten so, about it. I mean, that's an interesting take, Mr. Lawrence. So would you say as chairman of any board, if your primary shareholder gives you a steer on something, you would take the view that I should ignore it entirely? Done that on many occasions. Uh, I mean, the fact is that uh, your job as chairman is to do the right thing by the company. I was constantly, as a chairman, being told by shareholders, "We want you to do this and that." But in the end, I've always found that if you do what shareholders tell you in the corporate sense, and if it goes wrong, they never say, "Oh, we told you to do it." They say, "Why did you do something as silly as that?" So I always think, as chairman, you should do what the right uh, thing is, uh, rather than just taking what a shareholder says and just. But the right thing never came close to you tendering your resignation. No, I didn't think it was no, I don't think it was a resignation issue. We were going to proceed in the morally right way to uh, pay Is that because you were just in this for personal Sorry? financial benefit? Sorry? Were you just in this for personal financial benefit? Were you my, well my, my, will, were personal you well financial remunerated? benefit. My um, my uh, pension is uh, a considerable factor of what my post office salary is. I'm very fortunate to have that position. So I'm not, I'm not in this for the Monday one, one jot. What was your I, remuneration, Mr. Sonton? Uh, my remuneration was 150,000, which is half of what I got on the other companies that I do for about three times the work. I mean, this is not a... Um, but you've heard how significant that is compared to the postmasters uh, no and question. the sub-postmasters. No that Did you ever ask to see that increased? No, no, no. I've never asked for an increase in salary. I'm not. I wasn't in it for, for, the, for the money. I got. I got a salary, and I just left it at that. Okay. It's very disappointing, Mr. Sorry. I'm still not convinced we've got a clear answer as to why you decided not to take your concerns to either the Secretary of State or the Minister responsible for the Post Office, or Department for Business and Trade Officials, or UK Government Investments. And perhaps if you'd spoken to just one of them to raise some concerns, we could have a little bit more faith that, it w that you're not now conjecting this for some kind of political expediency. There's no political expediency in this for me. I'm just a, I'm just a businessman. I'm just a, but I had no concerns that we were going down the wrong track in terms of paying postmasters uh, at, at a reasonable rate. If, if it came back to me and said, you're, you're proceeding too fast when they saw the checks, that would have been different. But I was perfectly comfortable with the position we were taking, which was we were going to carry on paying postmasters uh, at a decent rate. So we're about to move into our fifth hour of hearings. Um, but Mr. Lavery, do you want to. Mr. McDonald? Um, Chair, this has been another unedifying process in Parliament, and Mr. Staunton lifted the lid on what we already knew was a dysfunctional organisation. It's, it's been taken to new heights today. Um, and all the while, the people that we really care about, the postmasters and postmistresses, are still no further forward. And I don't suppose their confidence has been um, increased one jot by what they've heard today from any anybody. Um, but just as a final parting question from me, um, in all these circumstances, do you think it's incumbent now upon everybody else who's involved in this process to give some certainty to those postmasters and postmistresses to come up with legally binding dates by which they should be compensated? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think uh, not only that, we actually need to review the cases that have been agreed because there's no question from what I've read that, that postmasters have signed agreements where they've only taken a fraction of what they thought it was due just to get it out of the way. So it's, so it's a far bigger issue than you've raised in terms of dates. But we need to go back and uh, get justice even for those that have agreed uh, amounts. So it's, 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 it's way, way bigger than even you suggested, sir. Mr. Higginbottom. I just wanted to ask as a chairman of the board, I assume you do evaluations of the executive team. How would you rate Mr. Reid's performance as chief executive? Well, we do do 
evaluations of the board. Uh, and uh, uh, in respect of Mr. Reid, I would uh, say that it's a, it's, a, it's a very tough job, as I've mentioned before, a tougher job than any of the companies that uh, 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 I've talked about, because there's just so many strands to this to this deal. So I think he was he was doing fine. Uh, huge huge pressures on him, and therefore, as I say, I, I must have had four conversations when he said he was going to chuck it in, and my job was just to be uh, uh, someone that would understand the pressures that he was on, and because I think it would be very difficult to find a replacement uh, at this stage with the business in the states that, that it's in. So um, I, you know, I think I, I, if I didn't think he was doing satisfactory, I've, I'd have asked to to change things. Did you ever look to increase or decrease his remuneration package? based on his performance on dealing with these legacy issues? Uh, I'm not the chairman of the, the REMCO, but uh, the answer is I got a st strong message from uh, Mr. Shapps when he was Secretary of State. Don't even think about coming for any salary increase. I got a strong message. I got a strong message from Minister Hollingrake. Is that because you asked? Uh, I, I said to him, and I said to him uh, Nick is unhappy with the salary. He said, it, don't don't waste a postage stamp coming to talk to me about it. So uh, there's no. So you, but you did try to to secure a pay rise for Mr. Yeah, Reed. I did. I went to see him and said, look. Despite some of the things we've heard about normal postmasters and subpostmasters who were on twenty thousand pounds and below. Yeah, I, did you not know that as chairman of the board? Of course, there's I did. Discrepancy between of, the is, person at the top and the person there, at the bottom. Did you not care? There's, of course, I care. There's an enormous discrepancy, as of course there is in any other commercial organisation between the person on the shop floor and, and, the, and, the, and the chief executive. So, so of course I care. It's a bit of a, I don't think we're uh, that different from, from, from anywhere else. So uh, and don't forget, I, when I went to see Mr. Shapps, I'd only been in the organisation uh, a month or two, so if that. So this wasn't one where you know, I was a, had detailed issues about knowing that we had all these REM issues uh, in I mean, terms I'm of I'm not sure that's the get out you're hoping for, Mr. Stone, because if, if after a month, given all the problems we know about the post office, you decided to go and ask and lobby for a pay rise for the chief executive at the time, it does indicate you weren't sufficiently over the detail. I was tremendously over the detail. Uh, as a chairman, I'm more involved in the detail than probably most of my colleagues who are chairman, because, because I'm an accountant. I just... Uh, do that, but this was very early on uh, in, in my discussions. There was a, it was a letter drafted by the HR director, which she'd agreed with Nick, but they said, look, will you go along and talk to the Secretary of State? Uh, and I went with her, and the truth is, of course, uh, I saw very quickly that um, it, was a, it was a complete waste of time, just, just as when Minister Hollingrate wrote to us in April saying, I'm just fed up with all these errors that are happening in the in the governance of, of, of REM, and I thought it was a very fair, okay. very thing to write. Well, look, that draws this panel to a conclusion. Thank you very much, Mr. Staunton, for your evidence this afternoon. You have stood by the assertions that you've made in the media that you came away from a meeting with a senior civil servant under the impression that an option was to slow down the pace of redress. <laughs> Um, you've told us that there isn't a hard ring fence around the money for compensation. That's certainly your understanding. I understand that. You've also given us some pretty bombshell revelations about a boardroom that is in some disarray, a chief executive who is under investigation, and a chief executive who has sought to resign, even though he has just told us on oath um, that he is not. So thank you very much indeed for the evidence to the committee. Can People I just say one thing, Mr. On Chairman? Can I say one thing? There's some, some insinuations were raised about the SID process, with which I strongly dis disagree. I've, I've been, uh, I've appointed more SIDs than uh, probably anyone that has been interviewed today by, by some margin, uh, and uh, I've acted absolutely scrupulously and. Uh, Fairly, so I didn't want that to pass. No, nope, well, thank uh, you. If you asked me, I could have given you chapter and verse. But, but that concludes our panel. Order, thank order. You. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.